Today we're going to talk about Alex Murdoch. And Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? Yeah, so these videos are from right after the police showed up to the murder of his wife and son. So, um, just start the top, take your time. Um, like when I came back here, mm -hmm. I mean, I pulled up and I could see him and, you know, I knew something was bad. I ran out. I knew it was really bad. My, my boy over there, I could see it was. And I could see it. <laughs> and I ran over to Maggie and uh, actually I think I tried to turn Paul over first um uh you know I tried to turn him over and uh I don't know I figured it out um uh, his cell phone popped out of his pocket. I started to try to do something with it, thinking maybe, but then I put it back down really quickly. Um, then I went to my wife, and I, uh, I mean, I could see. Mm -hmm. mm. Did you touch Maggie at all? I did. I touched them both. Okay. I tried to take. I mean, I try to do it as limited as possible, mm -hmm. but I, I try to take their pulse on both of them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, Chase, what do you got? Immediately as this clip starts, he's apparently just found his family who'd been killed. Instead of grief or sadness or even confusion, we're seeing full body fear. And all I'm going to do is break down the first 18 seconds of this video. It's a, it's, I think it's a minute and a half, two minutes long. That's all I'm going to do here. So let's go over what the fear does to the body just really quick. The first thing is these muscles right here, the sternocleidomastoid muscles, they jump out in front of the carotid artery. And you'll see it when somebody has that expression. You go watch a compilation on YouTube of people getting the crap scared out of them. You'll see that. Then the shoulders come up. Then the humerus bones come in toward the body. And there's a natural tendency to protect the wrists and other joints by bringing them either closer together or closer towards the, the body, facing away as much as possible from a potential predator. Many times, the lower limbs will move toward the groin, so like the arms in men, and covering the uterus area in women. Although I think there's some difference here in the genital protection, it's more likely to be during three key moments when you see genital protection in your future. It's when someone is feeling vulnerable, threatened, or insecure. Those are the typical three times that you'll see genital protection. The rib cage lowers down slightly. So you see his posture go down. We don't have bones protecting the soft organs in our belly. So this forward crunch is almost a way to bring those bones in front of those soft organs. Then the muscles in the body during fear become more rigid. It makes the overall human being more hard to attack. And keep in mind, this is an analysis of the first 1.5 seconds of the video. Right after this, he says, my boy over there, I could see, I could see, I saw. Keep in mind, as you go through all these clips, the difference in someone telling you versus selling you. So what's the difference between I could see my ball on the ground and my boy was on the ground? One of them is an experience and one of them, someone is telling you a story. So as you watch these, keep in mind that someone who has done something potentially like this will often just show feelings of regret or shame or loss or sadness. So being the killer does not make you immune to sadness or crying or anything like that. And finally, when a dramatic 
event happens and somebody asks what happened, people who are innocent almost never default to chronologically telling you step by step the details of precisely what happens. And their internal motivation to make decisions is never explained. I did this because of this and because of that. This is the most red flags I've seen in one video in a long time. And I promise I won't go this long on the rest of them. Scott, what do you got? All right. Well, go as long as you want, dude. That's, that's good stuff. Uh, I want to pay attention to three things as we're going through these videos. Number one, let's pay attention to like what uh, Chase was talking about, the growing protection. Number two, his blink rate. And number three, that Kleenex he's got. Because, he, well, we'll get into that in a few minutes, but let's pay attention to those things. The first time we see his, his cry face kick in, it disappears instantly. And the second time, time it kicks in, it lasts a little bit longer, but it, 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 it goes away not really fast, but fairly fast. And there are no tears. Now, when something like this has happened, when somebody's just seen their wife and one of their children dead, they're going to be crying. There's going to be a whole lot going on. But he, fa he wipes his face like he's wiping tears. We don't see the head shakes. No, as quite often when someone has seen something like that, or they've been even told something like that, that horrible, that horrible has happened. They'll sit there and they'll rock back and forth a little bit and they'll be doing this. They'll, they'll be shaking their head. No, because they don't understand why this happened. We see no grief in the grief muscle up here. We see no knitting of the brow. So many things are, are, are missing from that. His voice after this initial engagement where it looks like he's laughing, but he's crying, goes back to normal. His cadence goes back to normal. His voice tone and volume go back to normal. His diction is spot on. Everything goes back to just like, just like you would if, if everything was just fine. Then he straightens out his Kleenex, but he doesn't use it. And that's this is going to be part of his show as he goes through part of the one that uses it as an adapter a couple of times but he just goofs around with it so he gets a little bit loud as that with that performance of, of the with the kleenex and then it starts going away it starts getting quieter and quite often when a person has experienced something like this uh, that's so horrible their eyes will be fairly wide his aren't really wide his mouth their mouths will be open their eyes are going to be red and their hands are going to be together and they're going to be like rubbing them or clasping them, wringing their hands because they, they don't understand why something horrible is happening and, and their brain is just like, hey man, let's not freak out here. So they'll, they'll be rubbing their hands together. We don't see any of that, nothing. And um, I'll, I'll leave it there. there. There's so much there I could go on for two years. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we could talk for an hour on just this one alone. It, it, it's bonkers. Um, I mean, so I'm just going to tell you one thing, a, a, a gesture that really stood out to me, which I don't, I rarely see anywhere else than in uh, a Michelin starred kitchen. Uh, and, and that is the, the gesture of finishing salt. When you, when you put finishing salt over something, when he, cr when he cries, here's something I've never seen anybody crying do. To put their hands up here, and then rub their fingers together to see if they've got tears or not, to see if there's any wet. Go back, take a look, his hand goes up, and then you see him do this. It's bizarre. That alone, that alone, because it's an outlier in anything that I've ever seen anywhere in the world. So that alone causes me, well, other than, you know, at a really nice restaurant, you know? Um, and sometimes they'll do it from a height as well if they want to be really fancy about it yeah exactly yeah. like so um yeah so that alone for me causes me to go okay there's something going on here because i've never seen that gesture anywhere before and certainly why do you need to check if you've got tears or not somebody who's re somebody who's you know loved ones have died are not checking to see if they have tears or not greg what do you got on this one yeah, so this is a rare one for me because right out of the gate, my BS meter is just wide open. I could just stop right here and we could be done with this video. I, if you stole my bicycle, I would probably be more upset than this guy appears to be at the beginning of this video. And I haven't ridden a bicycle since 2003. So just to give you an idea, this guy doesn't show any animation, no sense of urgency. Can we get to the facts? Can you help me? None of that. He's just waiting to tell his story. That That's an odd start. The other one is... Think about the last time you went to a funeral where people know the person is dead. They see the body and you see them an hour later. Their eyes are bloodshot. Their nose is caked. Nothing. Nothing. That's a red flag for me as well. This is right after, right after he 
found his wife and son. That's a big deal. There's also in the beginning, Chase, you're talking about his anger but or his fear, but I also see him rocking. Is he listening to Ozzy Osbourne in his head or doing something as he's getting ready for what's to come? What you don't know because you didn't clip this video is just before this, there's just who are you getting names and all that straight. Then the rocking starts and that's preparation for what's about to come. And then he goes, um, as it leads into it, why, why, um, why, um, don't have to have an answer. We just have to know there's something going on. You know, look, I, with a sword thing, when I fight, I ramp up by doing something too. I might rock my body and do that kind of thing. A lot of people who fight do that. Martial arts folks do it, but we don't usually associate it with telling a story. It's not usually how we go. I also said remorse doesn't mean you didn't do it. And look, if you killed your child and didn't expect to do horrific things to that child, the things he describes, you might still show it. Now, there's also a study from 2012 at the University of British Columbia that shows that the best way to tell when somebody is truthful or not about things like this is that that grief muscle we all talk about that we say Darwin and Duchesne originally called it that for ease of discussion. It's that little arch that we see up here. That isn't ever present in folks who are lying. It rare, it rare in folks who aren't lying, who are lying. What you see instead is this whole frontalis, this whole set of muscles here draw down. Does that look familiar? And uh, if I remember the muscles here, the zygomatic major, I think they're referred to as the ones that tie off from your cheeks to make you smile, a containment of that so that it can almost look like a smile. Hmm. That sounds awfully familiar to what he's doing. Go look at that study. What they don't see is all this engagement in the forehead. They see that down and this engagement of these muscles at the side. He goes down the well. You guys know I always say when a person's trying to cry, they go down the well. They find a reason. They make it <laughs> as horrible as they can, and they can find a reason to cry. But no tears come up, Mark. To your point, he tries to find it. The interesting piece is the people sitting behind him feel it and feel bad for him and go to it. Interesting. Then he says... I figured out that he was dead. Well, I, look, it, we're going to bleep a few words in this thing, but go listen to the real words. There's no doubt the guy's dead. You wouldn't even have to figure it out. And then he's got a damn straight face all the time for what he's talking about. And there's that side. It looks like he's almost choking back a smile. He goes, I tried to take there and he pauses a few beats and then says pulse. There's so much in here. Forget the fear. Forget all the stuff that we're seeing. Forget the wind up Ozzy Osbourne. Everything else here is just not compatible with a person who just found. And I'll leave it at this. People react differently, but not all these different ways and clusters that we're all seeing. So you, you might be interested enough that this might be all you want to watch, but there's a lot more. Hang on. The eyewitness is you. So, um, just start the top, take your time. Um, like when I came back here, mm -hmm. I mean, I pulled up and I could see him and, you know, I knew something was bad. I ran out. I knew it was really bad. <laughs> my, my boy over there, I could see it was. And I could see <laughs> and I ran over to Maggie and uh, actually I think I tried to turn Paul over first. Um uh you know, I tried to turn him over, and uh, I don't know. I figured it out. Um, uh, his cell phone popped out of his pocket. I started to try to do something with it, thinking maybe, but then I put it back down really quickly. Um, then I went to my wife, and I, uh, I mean, I could see. Mm -hmm. mm, Did you touch Maggie at all? I did. I touched them both. Okay. I tried to take, I mean, I tried to do it as limited as possible, mm -hmm. but I, I tried to take their pulse on both of them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I called 911. 
um, pretty much right away and she was very good um, <clears throat> I talked to her um, I told her I was going to get off the phone to call some family members <coughs> I did that um, and um, what family members did you call anybody? I called my brother Randy and I called my brother John And I tried to call a little boy, real good friend that's right around the corner from here, but I didn't get him. Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, I called 911 pretty much right away. Uh, yeah, I don't think that happened at all. I don't think he called 911 straight away at all. Simply from, you know, then, then uh, pretty much. Uh, don't like those around around I called 911 just I called 911 immediately that's a, that's a good way to say it uh, he praises them the law enforcement there's there's no need. his his son and you know wife are dead like who cares how good the law enforcement were at that point you don't care how good how good they were you're not that out to, you're not giving out medals at that point and and look and he's totally taken control of his breathing you know what what you what you saw at the start where he's where i think you're right chase there's there's fear there and i think there's probably a little bit of panic as well but quickly taking control of it i think maybe those officers in the back give him a bit of you know bolster his confidence a little bit about this is working we can keep see his eyes kind of you know heading off to the side to check out is this is this working is it working and uh oh god it's 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 a fun, it's it's fun stuff. I'm gonna keep it at that because there's there's plenty more, plenty more to come. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? All right, in in this clip, there's a continuation of what you saw in the first one. The groin protection has become more pronounced. The emotion is gone. The chronology, the exact precise chronology of detail continues here, and the emotional impact of these phone calls is missed. There's no emotional impact when talking about these phone calls because A, they're potentially fake. The story's fake. And B, the stress from having to fake this is causing that emotion not to be there. I think it's unusual that he felt the need to provide a customer review for the 911 operator. Uh, this might be something in his behavior profile, though, that's starting to reveal itself. But let's see if there's any other evidence that pops up before my hunch on this uh, dies. And I'll dive into that. And Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I, again, we call that a fig leaf for obvious reasons. When a person crosses their groin, when a male crosses their groin to protect their testicles, primary sex organs. This guy's doing what I would call a modified fig leaf. He puts his hand in his lap and you'll see him moving his hand fairly often. But here again, look. If I have the opportunity to tell you a story or say, hey, somebody killed my family and they're still lying right there. They're probably close by. Can we do something to help find them? Not and um, uh, yeah. And after that, and he's storytelling now and we see it because he says haltingly pretty much right away. Mark, to your point, exactly. Pretty much right away. Not right away. Not right after that. Pretty much. And then he mouth grooms, which we only see a couple of times in this entire thing. And we say mouth grooms, our mouths get dry when we're feeling stress. And lying creates stress in most of us, except for those who are talented at it. And if I'm trying to hide something, I don't want you to find it. I'm going to go and have that opportunity to groom my mouth. You'll see it happen a couple of times in this one. And he does a long vowel and... And then he goes into, Chase, you were calling it something earlier. I'll call it clearing, not steering. He's going to give you reasons why he was busy and why you didn't, you know, all that kind of thing. There's still no sense of urgency. It, I, I wrote in my notes, I hung up the phone, I scratched my backside, and um, and he's just giving you useless details that I would not give a cop if I were trying to find somebody. He's navigating out of what to, his way through what to say as he goes, she was a good 911 operator. The only good thing in this entire thing is he is not feeling stress, Mark, to your point. It's a great thing because it gives us some matter-of-fact stuff I call my brother. So we can look at what matter-of-fact stuff is because this guy's not stupid. He's not going to say, I call my brother, and then you pull his phone records, and he didn't. 
guarantee you he called his brother, did all those pieces. So this gives us a way to pay attention to him as he moves forward. We're going to see it in a couple of other places. Scott, what do you got? I agree with you. We're not seeing those things that let us know that there's stress there. We're not seeing very many adapters. That should theoretically be there from the stress he's supposed to be feeling or going through it, uh, at, during this. We don't see any of that. Still, no, no valid signs of grief whatsoever. Uh, from a body language perspective, anyway. His blink rate's still really low. He's still covering his groin, like you were saying. And uh, he's still goofing around that Kleenex. Still hasn't used that yet. And he never asks why this happened. He doesn't try to connect with that with that police officer. And, you know, like you, like they'll do, they'll sit there, they'll look at you and go, what, you know, out of confusion, they'll look at you and go, what's, you know, why? What He never says why. He doesn't do any of that. This should be so horrific that it should blow his mind that, that, because he shouldn't be able to understand that. But he doesn't have a problem understanding that because I'm under the impression he's the one that did it. So it doesn't bother him at all. He doesn't need to do that. The most horrible thing that ever happened to him, he's not trying to connect with anybody, not trying to go, you know, dude, what's going on? What what the hell? Nothing like that at all. Um, his head is, is in the space it should be for what he's trying to do. So he's thinking about all the things. He's making sure his story is tight. So he's he's relaxing now because he thinks these people believe him. You hear that guy in the back coughing like he's got Zika or something, but that doesn't throw him either, you know, because he's like clearing his throat and doing all that stuff as well. But his head is right where it should be for someone who is who's who is is confident with having fooled everyone that they that their their story is being believed. I think so. That's what I got. The eyewitness is you. And um, uh, you know, I called nine one one. Um, pretty much right away, and she was very good. Um, <clears throat> I talked to her. Um, I told her I was going to get off the phone to call some family members. <coughs> I did that, um, and um, how many family members did you call? Anybody? I called my brother Randy. And I called my brother, John. And I tried to call a little boy, real good friend that's right around the corner from here, but I didn't get him. Okay. <clears throat> what all was around um, Paul when you walked up? Blood. Any, any other, anything else? I mean, there was some body Mm -hmm. Things, yes, sir. I mean, like any other evidence. I know you said the phone fell out the pocket, um, but did you see anything else that didn't belong or shouldn't belong or that wasn't part of Paul? Mm, no, sir. Not, no, not. The, no, sir. How about Maggie? No, sir. You didn't see anything around them? All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, everything we talk about in everything is about baseline. So we start from whatever is normal for the person in the situation. Again, it's not normal for you to sit around in your you know, on your couch eating Cheetos. That that baseline. We're talking about the baseline you're dealing with when you're asking non-pertinent questions. So we see some of that. We see him starting off with more of that same factual baseline. And he's fairly normal until, until he's asked about Maggie. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But there's no grimace or distaste or any negative emotion about blood or body stuff around his son. Anybody find that odd? I mean, all kinds of people deal with things different ways. If you found a dog who had been shot, you would probably have a grimace around that, not your child. And I will say this. We say sudden politeness matters, but this is low country, South Carolina. That sudden politeness is just politeness. In the part of Georgia I live in, there are people who refuse to call me by my first name because I'm older. And so it's just part of the culture, just to point that out. There could be a reason, but I, I don't think it is. Um, it's out of character that he retracts the side of his mouth and does some odd thing, odd thing with his mouth. He grimaces when he's asked, is there anything around Maggie? He does that. He absolutely does not answer the question, nods his head a little, shakes his head a little, and makes eye contact for the first time in the entire video. We talk about baseline. We talk about deviations from baseline. Ding, ding, ding. I would say, hold on, hold, hold on a minute. Why did you suddenly do something different? Or I'd make a mental note and come back and poke and prod it again and again and again. Uh, Chase, what do you got? 
This guy's a prosecutor who, which I learned from Greg as we were kind of ramping up yep. for this episode on zoom. And he's probably tried a bunch of cases. This is proof that no matter how many cases you do, you don't get inoculated to not displaying the perfect behaviors. All four of us, uh, you can go back and watch us through these videos. We get stressed out. Our blink rate goes up. We have the same human responses that anyone else does. It doesn't give you some hall pass to never display these behaviors again when you learn them. And that's what we're seeing here. A prosecutor who probably thought that he was inoculated against all of this stuff. He knew what to say. He didn't know how to say it. And that's the big difference. And Greg, I'm just going to say this. This politeness that we are seeing here is a spike, and it's not really present anywhere else here. And I'm, you know, I'm from Arkansas. My family's all from Arkansas. I see a lot of that, but the moment it's just, it spikes up higher than it ever does in the conversation. So I'm just going to look at it as a one data point, not some big thing that reveals anything. Right about the specifics concerning the crime scene. And he's gone from no emotion and minimal responsiveness to more responsive, more eye contact, and suddenly using the word, sir. I would just say this this is a little spike here that's concerning to me. But notice also when he's being asked to think back and go through the crime scene, there's no emotion and zero eye accessing. We move our eyes around in our, our head to access all kinds of details. There is none of that here. This is another huge red flag for me. Scott? All right. I want to talk about one thing. When, Like you were just saying, Chase, when somebody goes back through that and you ask them a question about what they saw or what happened, and they're reliving that because they're there in their brain seeing it, they go into this blank stare almost as they start telling you about it. We don't see that at all. This guy isn't doing anything that normal humans would do, or that in my experience so far, things that I've seen, where a person explaining what happened or describing a scene or what was going on there doesn't do anything they normally do or that I'm under the impression they normally do. There's, there's nothing. And you're right, Greg, when he, he, he connects with them, it's, but it's not that connection of what the hell there's no, there's nothing. I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. There's nothing happening here that, that, that says, um, I'm worried about this. I can't believe it. This has got me stressed. It's just, it's, it should just be freaking him out. And it isn't except for that. He tried to pull it off the top with that uh, that fake cry, which we all, during the thing, we got the giggles all of us because it looked like he was laughing. If you go back and watch that, you'll see what I'm talking about. But man, that, this doesn't show anything it should be showing for someone who's gone through something so horrific. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with hey, all can of I, Can I correct one thing, Mark, before you start? Yeah, go for it. I just double checked. He apparently did volunteer work in the solicitor's office. So he was a full-time prosecutor, just for your knowledge. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's just too calm, just too calm, just too still. And it's, and it's not the stillness of shock because the, the tension would be in his body. You'd see him stuck there. You'd see some kind of catatonic state. He's too soft. It's too cool. Uh, it's too much like he's on, you know, he's sitting on the couch eating Cheetos. It, it, it's just that kind of softness and, and rhythm. Uh, I totally agree. He's not seeing the scene in his head. We don't see any eye accessing. I don't care where his eyes go. I need his eyes to go somewhere, somewhere to search for information because he would know he's being asked information because there could be a clue. There could be a clue that could lead to the perpetrator right now. He doesn't even bother to go and look for that information. Why? Because he knows there's no information there. He knows there's nothing there that would help them find the perpetrator because they found the perpetrator. He's sitting in the car next to them. Uh, I mean, just no shock, no looking to the scene. Uh, so nonchalant. It's extraordinary and so different from what he, his tactic at the start. I think he stopped that tactic because, again, he got such a good response from the officers that, you know, he thinks it's it's done now and he doesn't need to go back to that tactic. There, that's all I got now. Greg, what were you telling us earlier? We talked, we, we were going through some things earlier about the backstory on this. What, el what else has this guy been into? What else has been going on? Yeah, hold on one second. Yeah, this family is really prominent. So his, I think it's his father was the last prosecutor, but from 1920 to 2006, they held the office of prosecutor for that county. So really big legacy of legal family. Um, 
He's got some ghosts in his past. If you go look, he's got some things around like a housekeeper who died that they had some life insurance policy on. He's got some other stuff. There's a ch- uh, kid who his son went to school with who ended up dying. And there was rumor that his son was involved. And there was the case was closed, but has been reopened by the district attorney as a result of evidence they found during this case. He was estranged from his wife at the time of the murder. And if you go read the headlines, they say she was lured out to there. Apparently, he asked her to visit his terminally ill father, and she said no. She wanted to be in public because he was acting fishy. I mean, there's a ton of stuff in here. Just go out and look for yourself. There's more than one weapon involved. There's a ton of stuff in this case. There's just a lot for you to go look at. We could spend an entire hour just refuting and figuring out what's on the list of rumors and checklists. As Chase often says, we're not the forensics panel. We're telling you what we see in this video. And there's plenty. So this is good enough. So, uh, Greg, note to self, always get life insurance for domestic help. It's not odd. Not yeah, odd for sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I've yeah. never heard of that before. Has I've heard never heard of, of it before. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. Why wouldn't you? I mean. <laughs> wow. I don't. Just in case, you know. I mean, I, I don't know how they make a bit of money so, out of your domestic help just in case they die. Yeah. There's so much information out here on these guys. I think there's even a lot more like he's got financial crimes that if he were to get off these charges, he's still got financial crimes to face. There's a ton of stuff that they've allowed into evidence. Just go watch. Look, I don't want to be the guy who misquotes something. I probably have misquoted some of that, but just go read. There's so much out there on this guy. You could spend all day trying to figure out all the craziness going on this case. So the eyewitness is you. What all was around, um, Paul, when you walked up? Blood. Any, any other, anything else? I mean, there was some body mm-hmm. things, yes, sir. I mean, like any other evidence. I know you said the phone fell out the pocket, um, but did you see anything else that didn't belong or shouldn't belong or that wasn't part of Paul? Mm, no, sir. Not, no, not. The- <laughs> No, sir. How about Maggie? No, sir. You didn't see anything around them? What made you come out here tonight? Um, I went to... My mom's a late-stage Alzheimer's patient. My mm-hmm. dad's in the hospital. Um, my mom gets anxious when she does. I went to check on them, and Maggie. Maggie's a dog lover. Okay. She fools with the dogs. And I knew she'd gone to the kennel. I was at the house. I left the house and went to my mom's <clears throat> for just a little while. Tried to call her when I left. <coughs> Texted her. No response. Um, when I got back to the house, the house was obviously nobody was in there. So I figured they're still up here fooling around. Paul was um, gonna be getting set up to plant. Our sunflower seeds got sprayed and died and he was refiguring to do, to plant the sunflower seeds. Okay. So I came back up here and I drove up and saw and called. <laughs> A, an id yeah it's, I, okay. I don't know i thought i, was, I, thought I read this, that was his friend hang on a second up to this point we're right now we're talking about how we thought the guy in the back seat was was a police officer but it was just odd and greg what do you say about i, I, that I think guy? it's his friend i think it's his friend i think All it's right. his friend I, I don't remember but i think it's his friend I'll he's got his shirt that. open like he's robert wagner only thing he's missing is those little scarves that go there or, or an ask <laughs> what do you call that thing an ascot was that what's uh, what's the yes. scarf they put cravat. on the mark cravat oh they call it right. cravat that's all he's yeah. missing. Plus, they need to get him some kind of COVID, you know, something on him. This guy, man, he's back there. <laughs> Sounds like something's up with him. Sounds like this may be some of his last days. Oof. Uh, okay. Sorry about that. I should cut all that Maybe out. it's code for shut up. You sound stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. And, it, and so I'm going to say this about him, too. In a little while, his knee comes out. Look how shiny his knee is. It's almost like a mirror. It looks It looks like it's so weird, man. It looks like a, looks like a polished piece of wood when it comes out. His, his knee. You'll see it in a few minutes. 
Okay, I thought he was a cop. I don't even say anything about it. Man, I hope he's not. But, geez, he's really got to get his thing together, man. All right, uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is the first time we see him touch his face, touches his nose. Look, we, you'll hear people say if a person touches their nose, they're lying. No, we, we're not those folks. What we're saying is look for a deviation in baseline and ask yourself why. It's a pertinent question and a hard question. Why did you come out here tonight? Well, that's a good question. And he uses his left hand, touches his face. Suddenly, he does one of the most powerful male adapters that exist. I call it butterfly thighs. And if you ever want to see, men will flip their legs, their thighs in and out that way. Younger men do it a lot. It also includes your genitals when you start moving your legs. And it has a lot of impact. So that's a big comforting move for a guy to do. You'll see it a lot in younger sports players when they're being interviewed, when you watch them on night shows and that kind of thing. All an adapter is is a way for you to release nervous energy. And if we do them enough, they become habitual. So if you don't know what yours are, the way you release nervous energy, ask someone next to you. Ask someone who knows you well, because they know what you do when you're releasing nervous energy. Maybe you pick your nails, flip your hair, do something like that. Then he starts to tell a long story that has no pertinence to anything we're talking about. And that is, I went to see my mama. My mama's sick. She's got dementia. And he goes on and 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 on. And he gives you the cookbook. We call that chaff and redirect because an aircraft drops chaff to hope a missile will follow it rather than the story. That's what he's doing. He's dropping lots of details, hoping you'll follow that. And that's odd usually. But again, my wife and son are lying 100 yards away, dead. Somebody murdered them. And I'm going to tell you about my mom's jello she had for lunch. Come on. And he's adapting like all hell with that issue, with his hands and with the other. He goes to that dog lover. She fools with a dog. Boom. One shoulder rises. We hadn't seen that yet. We see a single shoulder. We often associate that with discomfort or not comfortable in the information they're sharing. He does a pause. He does a down left, looks down left, which we associate with internal voice. And he does a head scratch. We associate all of those things with thinking, with giving yourself time to think. He doesn't say what he saw, what he saw over with her, either with words or with body language or with tone. None of that. And I think the female law enforcement officer in the back senses it because watch her cross her abdomen in discomfort as he's telling that story. I bet if you went and talked to them and say, this guy, day one, we thought he whacked her. We thought he killed his wife. That's exactly what I think you'd see. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, there's a cascade of negative statements, victim statements, really. The parents are ill and anxious. Uh, Maggie's a dog lover, doesn't love him, loves the dogs. Uh, she falls with the dogs. That's negative. Rather than going, she looks after those dogs so well. It's she falling with the dogs. Um, and he's texted her and there's no response. So she's not attentive to him. And then Paul uh, is associated with sunflowers dying. So again, not being able to, and that will, more of this story will come out and maybe he's laying down this story early, but essentially everybody is inept. <laughs> Ultimately, parents are non-functioning, uh, wife loves uh, animals and messes around and doesn't answer the phone and Paul can't look after sunflowers. So really casting uh, um, a bad light on the victims there and and him being around people who can't look after themselves or the things that are important or him. This is very different from um, uh, a video that we looked at earlier uh, this week around the um, the, the boyfriend of Nicola Bully, who uh, went missing, um, maybe is still missing, who knows at this point. Um, but in that particular film, he didn't create any negative attitude about this missing person. No negative attitude about the victim. No, you know, she goes for silly walks with the dog and probably messed up somewhere. And so it's so different here. Again, that alone uh, is a loud, <laughs> a loud flag. You can't have a loud flag, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's a loud flag. It's a loud, loud flag. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? No? Chase? Yep, I'll go. Thank you. <laughs> uh, this is detail overload. There's a few things I want you to notice as you go through the video again in just a second. Number one, the detail and the, the, just the chronology of everything is loaded and piled high. But 
None of the details are about finding out who did this. There is no request to investigate the scene or talk about the word murder. It's the last word in the world that he wants to come out of his mouth at a moment like this. And the confirmation glances back and forth where he's checking that detective with every detail in this clip, especially just to make sure it, he's buying it are just a classic hallmark of deception. It's one of the things we look for when we see a lot of other behaviors and they're outside of baseline, like we're seeing here. And when he says, obviously, nobody was in there, I think he's telling us, potentially, this is my opinion, as this entire video is just an opinion, I think he's telling us it was obvious to him that nobody was going to be in that house. Then finally, we have something called severity softening and lack of detail. There's tons of minute, perfect little details about the intricate process he's going through with these sunflower seeds. Then, what's the detail on the crime scene? Here's the detail on the crime scene in this video. Word for word, I came up and saw and called. That's the difference between sunflower seeds versus dead family members here. Scott? You know what, Greg, when you, when, when you, now that you've told us this guy in the back isn't a cop, this makes so much sense the way she's acting. And do you know what's making it? This is what I think. Here I go off in my rants. But you know what makes me think she knows something's up? Think about it for a minute. You guys think about this for a second. What's he wearing? A white t-shirt. Where's he come from? He's come from two people who have, who have been killed in a, it's a bloody crime scene that he's put his hands on, that he's been messing with. There's no blood on this guy. Nowhere. And he's not using that Kleenex. He's not looking at his hands to make sure there's no blood. He's washed his hands. That's what's happened. He's changed clothes. Yeah. Well, yep. He yeah, he'll tell clothes. you he went back to the house afterward. Yep. 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 That's what that's what's happened. I don't know if that if that's if he he doesn't talk about it in here anyway. That's what's bothering her. No. That's what I bet that because she can't see him. So it's something that happened beforehand. It's got her thinking something's up with this guy. That's what I think. That's what I think is, is happening there. I just thought about that a second ago that. Yeah. So anyway, that that's what I think is going on there. But back to the body language part of it. Um, after the question, you're right, Greg, he touches the middle part of his head there, the, the middle of his brow there. I haven't seen that yet, of this, other than, than rubbing his whole face. And then he does this really quick re request for approval. That's another one of Greg's things, where your eyebrows go up as you're look, looking to get something okayed, or you're asking a question, and you need some information. His, his eyebrows go up, and he starts adapting, I guess, what you call that butterfly thing, Greg. And then he starts using his Kleenex as an adapter, which we talked about what happened early, uh, earlier. We talked about that was going to happen. A whole lot of movement in comparison to the baseline we've seen up at this point, up to this point, because he's been fairly still up till now. This is where it makes me think something would be up with this. Then he starts going down this list of stuff, and his voice is, uh -huh, and then this, and uh -huh. it's just, oh, it's just, it's just a list. He's rehearsed this. He knew what he was going to say when he came into this. When this question came up, he's he's got his list of things that happened and things that he was going to talk about. We see a couple of those little shoulder shrugs, a single shoulder shrug here and a single one there, and then a full one there. But the thing is with shoulder shrugs, and you'll hear a lot of things about them, but here's what we are under the impression or, or understand that shoulder shrugs indicate, is when one shoulder goes up really quickly, that, that says, I don't, I'm not sure about this answer. I'm not sure what I'm saying. If it goes up and stays, like it will sometimes, it stays for about a second or second half. Same with a double shoulder shrug. It stays up for a second. If not, it just comes up and then down really quickly. That indicates a person isn't sure about their answer. Not that they're being deceptive, but it just says they're not sure about what that answer is. And I think he's afraid. He's, he's trying to make sure he's covering every basis. He's thinking about that. I guess he, in his brain, maybe he's thinking, okay, I've got that covered. Let me see what else. Yeah, I got that. I think as he goes down this list, that's why we're seeing those things. Um, but throughout this, he still hasn't used that Kleenex for what you use them for. And I think he's, I think, I think he changed clothes. I think he washed up and changed clothes. That's what, I, that's what I think on that one. Let's see what happens. All right, we good? Mm-hmm. The eyewitness is you. What made you come out here tonight? Um, I went to 
my mom's a late stage Alzheimer's patient. My dad's in the hospital. Um, my mom gets anxious when she does. I went to check on them and Maggie. Maggie's a dog lover and okay. she fools with the dogs. And I knew she'd gone to the kennel. I was at the house. I left the house and went to my mom's <clears throat> for just a little while. Tried to call her when I left. <coughs> Texted her, no response. Um, when I got back to the house, the house was obviously nobody was in there. So I figured they're still up here fooling around. Paul was um, gonna be getting set up to plant. Our sunflower seeds got sprayed and died and he was refiguring to do, to plant the sunflower seeds. Okay. So. I came back up here and I drove up and saw and called. Had Maggie and Paul been arguing over anything? No. What was their relationship like? Wonderful. Wonderful. How about yours and Maggie's? Wonderful. I mean, I'm sure we had little things here and there, but we had a wonderful marriage, wonderful mm -hmm. relationship. And yours and Paul's relationship? As good as it could be. How old was Paul? 22. Okay. You know his date of birth? I do. April 11th, 96 is his brother's. April 14th, 99 is Paul's. About, what's Maggie's full name? Margaret Branstetter Murdoch. And her date of birth, sir? September 15, 1968. <clears throat> Have y'all been having any problems out here? trespassers, none people that, breaking in? None that I know of. The only thing that what comes to my mind is my son Paul was in a boat wreck uh, a couple years ago mm -hmm. and there's been a, you know, he was charged with being uh, arrested for being the driver. There's been a lot of negative publicity about that and there's been a lot of people online, just really vile stuff, but when Paul's out and about, I mean, people routinely, I don't think I know the full story, um, so I don't think they give it to me, but I mean, he's been punched and hit and just attacked a lot, so, you know, but I mean, nothing like this. Yeah. <laughs> this is a mistake, John. I just, I tell you, there's blood out there. I think it might have been two guns. I don't know. Mm -hmm. He's going to trust me on that one. Mm -hmm. Cut that out. I shouldn't have said whack, but sorry. Yeah, what are you going to do? All right, Chase, late. what do you got? There's some strange head movement here. There's shaking and nodding mixed together, which you do not see in this culture. And I think this is confused on his part, of which behavior to display. And you can confirm this confusion by the fact that he starts doing what I call intent checking. He's glancing repeatedly at the detective here in this instance to determine what kind of intent the detective has and the angle that he's taking with some of these questions. And when he offers this, uh, the brother's birthday, this is a miniature resume statement here. And he's offering the details that suggest that he's a caring and good father. See, I know both of their birthdays. And I think he's doing that mostly unconsciously. And when there's a question about the trespassers, the response to the question is an insertion of ambiguity into the case. Think about it. If I asked you if strangers come into your house often, your answer would be, no, probably not. So I would say this is maybe uh, going on Mark's uh, scale, maybe a dark, medium, medium light or a uh, weight.
flag. Did you say heavy flag earlier? No, it was the sound of it, but I like oh, the yeah. of it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so I this like is that. maybe a volume nine or an eight point five on the ten scale flag. And I don't know how big this property is, which is one of the reasons here. We can call this maybe a a medium flag here. There's an inability to identify a perpetrator. There is no concern to find out who did this at all. He wants to keep the net cast as wide as possible for here for what might have happened. And he still won't say murder. He skips over the murder every single possible time that it comes up every time here. Mark. Uh, yeah, so I love this one where he, where his his leg starts getting excited. It starts going up and down. Bit of the in and out as well there, Greg as well. But it, it's it's even more joyous around this idea of introducing the boat story because I think you know he's now laying down some some ideas of of you know potential uh, trouble that may lead to a perpetrator. And I think he looks off to his side there, not only to check intent, but to work out how's my story landing on this one. Is this one, is this one I should go a little bit further down that my, you know, my son may well have an enemy uh, out there. Oh, we also, this is off baseline as well. We also start to see uh, his hand uh, nearest to the driver, to the, to the officer, um, just becomes more active. And I hadn't seen his hand that active and that descriptive. So I think he's becoming quite excited and buoyant around how this story might work out from, for him. This is off uh, baseline for me. Uh, Scott, what you got on this one? All right. Here's where he alludes to the, alludes to the murders being be, due to that boat accident. That's cold. When you're you're trying to blame something on something your son did, that's that that says a lot about this guy, his personality type. And when he asks about the when he's asked about the relationship with his son, his head shakes and it turns no, and then it starts turning like Chase was saying to like a little bobblehead doll. So there's a lot going on there at that point as well, and that's probably true. The the relationship is as is as good as it could be you know as it could possibly be and that's because i don't they probably didn't get along very well so it was as good as it could possibly be because maybe the the child didn't like him maybe the wife didn't like him because he says the same thing about her as well as good as it could possibly be and he's telling the truth i think there and it was as good as it could possibly be apparently she's moved out and lives where'd you say she was greg living in the what in their beach house i read she was estranged and living in their beach house yeah, doesn't bring that up at all. So there's a, no. th there's a lot going on there that he's not bringing up. So I, I'm sure it was as good as it could possibly be. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I couldn't pay a person to illustrate baseline better than this guy does. He's asked two questions about his relationship with his son and about his relationship with his wife. And in both instances, he says, wonderful. But go back, watch his body language when he says wonderful. When he says wonderful about his son, it's pretty straight body language. When he says wonderful about his wife, now we know that they're estranged. He breaks eye contact, moves away to the side. His face changes, and he Come. is entirely different when he's saying that. Then he he's drawing away as he says it. Then he qualifies it. I forget what he says exactly. Well, we had our moments, and, and, and. And then he gets back into those facts and deliberate language. And the minute he gets back into those facts and deliberate language, then he's okay. He's answering factual questions. His baseline comes back. When he gets down to the mechanics and he starts to tell that boat story, his thighs start moving. As Mark said, he starts to march in place with that one foot and his blink rate increases. He does a left shoulder shrug again when he says nothing like this. Well, of course, nothing like this. Yeah, they hit him. They said bad things to him and never came out and killed him. So all this we see a pattern. We see his baseline when he's comfortable. We see a deviation. And we get a chance to see two very different answers using the same English. If if you think that body language is hokum, watch that. And tell me it's hokum. Tell me you can't see something that's going on. Two different messages, same words. That's all I got. That's a tie. Beautiful. You're team both. Beautiful. <clears throat> Olympics. <laughs> You're taking it so serious. <laughs> the eyewitness is you. Had Maggie and Paul been arguing over anything? No. What was their relationship like? Wonderful. Wonderful. How about yours and Maggie's? Wonderful. I mean, I'm sure we had little things here and there, but we had a wonderful marriage, mm -hmm. wonderful relationship. And yours and Paul's relationship? 
as good as it could be. How old is Paul? 22. Okay. You know his date of birth? I do. April 11th, 96 is his brother's. April 14th, 99 is Paul's. How about, what's Maggie's full name? Margaret Brandstetter Murdoch. And her date of birth, sir? September 15th, 1968-Have <clears throat> y'all been having any problems out here? Trespassers, none people that, breaking in? None that I know of. The only thing that what comes to my mind is my son Paul was in a boat wreck uh, a couple years ago mm -hmm. and there's been a you know he was charged with being uh, arrested for being the driver there's been a lot of negative publicity about that and there's been a lot of people online just really vile stuff but when Paul's out and about I mean people routinely I don't think I know the full story um, so I don't think they give it to me but I mean He's been punched and hit and just attacked a lot. So, you know, but I mean, nothing like this. Yeah. <sighs> so is there anybody that you can think of that we need to talk to tonight? Is there a name that comes to mind? I mean, I can't tell you anybody that I'm overly suspicious of off the top of my head okay you know um i mean this is such a stupid thing i'm even embarrassed to say it but it just didn't make any sense i just hired a guy out here mm -hmm. and he really he wasn't cutting the mustard but i hadn't told him this yet paul's been working with him a lot he killed the sunflower seeds in our dove field just recently which is why paul was here doing this he told Paul a story the other day about how when he was in high school, he got in a fight with some black guys. And the FBI undercover team observed him fighting those guys and put him on an undercover team with three Navy SEALs. And that their job was to kill radical black panthers. And they did that from Myrtle Beach to Savannah. Now, I really don't think this guy you know, mm -hmm. is probably the person, but that's just so freaking. Yeah, that's kind of far fetched story. It's weird, but he was off today. Okay. He took his daddy to the doctor. What's his name? CB Rowe. All right, Chase, what do you got? Right at the beginning of this clip, you can see him try to adjust himself to look more comfortable and more relaxed. The moment he does this, you're going to see his body completely disagree with him. It's going to move his hand back, almost just without his consent, to protect the groin and the femoral artery here. And do you know what other emotion that would be coming up here that's missing is anger. Anger would be present here. And he's got a huge problem identifying a perpetrator here who did this. And he wants to keep the ambiguity as high as possible. And I don't think there's any desire whatsoever for them to find, for him to get them to find the person that did this. And just pay close attention to what is not being said here. And I think, in my opinion, you might hear a murderer talking if you just listen to what's not being said and what's being ignored. Greg? Yeah, there's no anger. There's no rush. There's no urgency. None of that. As a matter of fact, listen to the cadence of his storytelling slow down. Slow down. This is, what has it been, 30 minutes of him sitting in a car? I would be looking for help. He gives into you know, 
There's a new word, a new phrase he's injecting that indicates he's comfortable and thinking and talking. And that's his filler words starting to come out. He doesn't, it's not scram, it's not scrambled, it's not compressed. None of that's going on. There's more concern in the cop's brow and in the guy in the back seat than there is in his. This is his family. There's that zygomatic muscle again that we said makes your face want to smile. It sure looks like he's almost smiling when he's telling that story. Well, we know that earlier. What the study said was if your frontalis muscle was down in, in sadness and that, that was probably an indicator. He also starts to turtle, chase after he goes back and he gets forced into that position. Then he shrinks a bit. When we say turtling, your head and your torso shrink and make your target smaller. This cadence is unlike anything else we've heard. I think it's because he has already been rehearsing this story and he knows what he's going to say. This guy who told me this story and... Well, if, you, if you're trying to figure out who to point somebody to, then you'd have a lot of details. When I would just say, hey, there's a guy who works for me. He's a little shady. Maybe you want to go check him, if that were the case. I don't think that's the case. And this is the first time, the single first time, he's used his right hand to illustrate anything when he's talking about this guy. Uh, it's been at his groin, as I call it, protecting the precious this entire time. That's another red flag. Scott, what do you got? All right. Now he's trying to put the suspicion on somebody else. He brings in this other guy that, that worked for him, that he just hired, that isn't working out. And again, we're not seeing, like you were saying, Greg, we're not seeing things we should be seeing in here. We're not seeing the emotions someone goes through as they relive this experience of what just happened, the most horrible things ever happened to him. We don't see that uncontro uncontrollable sobbing, no wailing and crying, nothing. We don't even see one tear. And he has, and, and I've been looking nothing we don't see he doesn't tear up there's nothing in there there's no tears at all we don't see that detachment you'll see from when someone goes through something that bad why uh, no why did this happen going back to that and talking about how good they were he's not talking about the things oh oh he loved this or she loved he she talked about the dogs earlier but he didn't really focus on that he'd be talking about how the, the things that he thought of her and what they reminded what this reminded him of her she liked to do this and he loved to do that that's what he would talk about a lot especially with this amount of time going by in an interview like this right in here's where that usually happens especially when you're the first you got him in the car and you're the first ones talking to him that's what you see in here. There's none of that. None of that. None of that's happening. He should be distraught. <laughs> this guy's not distraught. He sounds like he's talking about some things that, you know, like when we tell stories, it sounds like he's talking about something happened last week. Guess what happened last week? This. And then going through it, he just gives this list of, of things and never tears up. Doesn't use his, his Kleenex either. Nothing's looking the way it should look. I keep going back to that, but that's I think that's the most important thing here. Nothing looks as it should look up to now. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, this is a beautiful scene. You can't even write this stuff. It's, it's, it's genius. The, uh, the officer says, look, is there anybody that we should be looking at? And while he says that, he covers his mouth because he knows, I think, that he's looking at the perpetrator right now. So he's even blocking himself to the to the lie of the question that he's asking there. This guy comes up with an amazing story. It's, it's a brilliant story. I, I don't know whether he's making it up completely on his on his own or this, this guy who had took the day off uh, today, um, had actually told him this story. But it's a brilliant idea for a story whereby you've got a kid high school kid, you know, gets in a fight, uh, FBI see him, they've got a whole bunch of Navy SEALs, and they go after the Black Panthers together all the way. And I love this line. They did that from Myrtle Beach to Savannah. It's just a great, I can, you know, I can just picture it in my head, the Navy SEALs and this high school kid, Myrtle Beach, <laughs> Myrtle Beach is fantastic. I just, all that rough stuff happening in Myrtle Beach. And then all the way down, to, I think they have to go through, through Charlotte or something like that, or Charleston or something. I don't know. I, I can't remember. Charleston. But yeah, yeah, but I'm I'm just picturing the scene there as well. The awful carnage. Hilton Head. <laughs> Hilton Head. <laughs> awful <laughs> carnage up and down the, the coast that's going on. So I mean what a what an amazing, amazing story. And and the cop again, like, does a double take on it. Do, just does it <laughs> what the hell's what the hell's going on here? Uh, and 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 he does say, look, I'm embarrassed to say this. I'm embarrassed to even put this idea forward. But then he goes. Um, yeah, I, I felt that story was a bit off, but he did take the day off today. 
Like, what a brilliant <laughs> equation. It's a nutty story. Obviously, it's utter nuts, but he did take the day off. So I think you should be looking at him. Just brilliant, brilliant, brilliant logic. Love it. Let's have another. You don't know about the FBI Navy SEAL High School recruiter killer teams? No. No, it's it's British. Really, no. It's club. It's everybody, it's everybody club. knows that story in the US. That's like a classic all the way yeah. from, uh, from oh, yeah. Myrtle Beach to uh, I, no, because last time I was in Myrtle Beach, nobody bought it up. So, uh, well, they, they have British. to sell cookies. I you think they have to talk about this or something. You know? <laughs> we don't talk about it. Oh, you're too British. Oh, that's, uh, I'm sorry. That was a Girl Scouts. Somebody sells <laughs> cookies. Right. I was in it, but they kicked me out for crying. The eyewitness is you. <laughs> So is there anybody that you can think of that we need to talk to tonight? Is there a name that comes to mind? I mean, I can't tell you anybody that I'm overly suspicious of <coughs> off the top of my head. Okay. You know, um, I mean, this is such a stupid thing. I'm even embarrassed to say it, but it just didn't make any sense i just hired a guy out here mm -hmm. and he really he wasn't cutting the mustard but i hadn't told him this yet paul's been working with him a lot he killed the sunflower seeds in our dove field just recently which is why paul was here doing this he told paul a story the other day about how when he was in high school he got in a fight with some black guys and the FBI undercover team observed him fighting those guys and put him on an undercover team with three Navy SEALs. And that their job was to kill radical Black Panthers. And they did that from Myrtle Beach to Savannah. Now, I really don't think this guy, you know, mm -hmm. is probably the person, but that's just so freaking yeah that's kind of far-fetched story that's weird but he was off today okay he took his daddy to the doctor what's his name cb row do y'all store any weapons out here um we don't store them but they're you know they're frequently out here mm -hmm. i need to find out if there were any out here because i know there was a shotgun there was a 12 gauge shotgun out here uh, I'll have to find out exactly when that was. I think it got put up, but I'm not positive. What did that shotgun look like? Uh, it was a camouflage. Um, I, I want to say it was a Benelli or maybe a Beretta. I can't remember which brand it is. But I don't think it was out here okay. recently, but I'm not positive. And the, the shotgun that you had when deputies pulled up, where did that come, come from? I went to the house and I got a gun, probably overreacting, but... And was that when you pulled up and saw them? Was, no, I, I mean, I came out and I mean, I called 911 first. Mm -hmm. Talked to them for a little while, and then I told her. You told her that I was that I was going to go to the house. Okay. And that I would let authorities know when they got here that I had a gun. Okay. <laughs> All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, uh, just one thing, which is which is he's really screwed himself now because now he's bringing up the murder weapon. How easy was that? How easy was that? Gunny guns out here? Yeah. And he's mentioned a shotgun. And I'm going to assume from what I heard before as to the condition of certainly one of the bodies that a shotgun was was used. And so, uh, yeah, he's already bringing up the murder weapon and what it might look at look like and could be, you know, certain brand. Um, you know, I can't believe that he's he's not been clever throughout any of this so i don't know why i'm getting why i was even going to say there that he's been so clever and now he's being so dumb because ultimately he's been so dumb throughout it yeah that's all i got on that one greg what you got 
Yeah. And for those of you who don't know weapons, a shotgun is harder to trace as a murder weapon because it doesn't rifle whatever you're using. You can have rifle slugs, but likely not what was used. And those rifles, on the other hand, like that blackout that they were using, does create patterning on the bullet. So if you have the weapon and the bullet, you can figure out which weapon was used. That's part of the reason why that might be an issue. This cop is even looking a little frustrated. Look at the at the brow. And suddenly this guy talks like a lawyer. Do you have weapons? Do you store weapons there? Well, not stored. Hmm. Well, you know the intent of the question, but you're answering it that way. His hands have moved now to where he's got kind of a little gentle hug going on. And he's chaffing when he talks about weapons. When he starts to talk about weapons, his blink rate rises and he starts to adapt as they're talking about this weapon specifically, this shotgun. You see his foot starting to tap and hop. His hand is adapting, meaning releasing nervous energy at his stomach. And after he's asked specifically about, did you have a shotgun? Watch that right leg. It is going crazy. His breathing becomes more rapid and pronounced, and he even loses fluency as he's running out of words at what he told her. His blink rate's higher. This is a hot spot. This, and back to why did you come here, and a couple of others are real hot spots at this point. You got to pay attention when something jumps off the plate. This is a loud red flag, Mark, to use yours. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I've got a couple of loud flags here, too. <laughs> There's more ambiguity being injected here about the shotgun. Ambiguity about the weapon, not certainty. So and a desire to help the case means that you would specifically state the facts without ambiguity. And then he's saying, I got a gun. It was probably overreacting. He's explaining motive again to perform an action. Innocent people don't feel the need to stop the story and explain motive to every action that they take. And grabbing a gun after finding family members that are murdered is not an overreaction in this culture that we're seeing here in this video. I think he went back to get a different gun uh, that was from the house so he could be holding one uh, when the police showed up, in my opinion. Definitely not a fact. Scott? All right, you guys covered everything I was going to cover. Keep it from being boring. Let's move on. <laughs> the eyewitness is you. Do y'all store any weapons out here? Um, We don't store them, but they're, you know, they're frequently out here. Mm -hmm. I need to find out if there were any out here because I know there was a shotgun. There was a 12-gauge shotgun out here. Uh, I'll have to find out exactly when that was. I think it got put up, but I'm not positive. What did that shotgun look like? Uh, it was a camouflage. Uh, I, I want to say it was a Benelli or maybe a Beretta. I can't remember which brand it is. But I don't think it was out here okay. recently. But I'm not positive. And the, the shotgun that you had when deputies pulled up, where did that come, come from? I went to the house and I got a gun, probably overreacting, but... And was that when you pulled up and saw them? Was, no, I, I mean, I came out and I, mean, I called 911 first. Mm -hmm. Talked to them for a little while, and then I told her. You told her that I was that I was going to go to the house. Okay. And that I would let authorities know when they got here that I had a gun. Okay. <laughs> what did you do today? Were you at the office or? No, nope, I was home. I came home. Paul and I messed around. I, I, uh, I was up at the house. I, Laid down, took a nap on the couch, probably, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes. I got up, I called Maggie, didn't get an answer, and I left to go to my mom's. She had said she might ride with me, but she normally doesn't when I go over there. Um, and I think I texted her. 
and she's very good about answering the phone so that was odd or calling me back mm -hmm. so that was odd but it wasn't that big a deal now what time was that what, what time was what <laughs> that you sent her a text message I checked, texted her at 9.08, going to check on M, be right back. And then I texted her at 9.47. That must be when I started to come back. I think I called her before that. But let me make sure. Uh, pretty sure that I called her 9.45. And then I tried Paul. And then, no, I think that was riding. I think that might have been riding over there. Ten oh three. I mean, my calls are right here. Yeah. So, um, obviously, this is when. This is when I, at Yes, sir. Ah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. Take go. Anybody else want some gum? No, sir. You don't have any water, do you, Danny? Sure. I'm sorry. I don't need it. <clears throat> if you, behind Danny's head, is a oh. case of water. It's not a big deal. Yeah, I got some. The trial's going on right now? Yes. Yep. It's live on that Law and Crime Network thing. Oh, really? Yeah, and Court TV cool. and just about everywhere. Yeah. Mm. That's cool. Law and Crime lets use their stuff. That's We should give them a shout yeah. out. In, yeah. Uh, our stuff below. So. Yep, for sure. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm going to keep this one pretty short. He's adapting all the way up until he gets to the point they give him a freebie. The minute he gets to where he gets to now go back to baseline, things that are matters of phone record this is a guy who's smart enough he's been in the business long enough he knows that's a matter of fact he's just going to run through it and chase i'll use one of your favorites you can tell when he relaxes because he goes to abdominal breathing it's pronounced and they've let him now off the hook his brain is relaxed there's no emotion whatsoever i, I still what is missing is a hey can we just hurry can we get back to this instead of talking about all my phone records they're a matter of record here boom that's it <clears throat> scott what do you got all right, I think we're seeing a very subtle change in his baseline up to, up to what we've seen so far. His cadence is sped up, his voice tone's a little bit higher. He's the most relaxed he's been so far. Still no use of that Kleenex. Still garden is growing, still doing the same things we talked about at the top. His blink rate is, is still low. Everything we talked about at the top is still going on at this point. And I think it's because, like you were saying, Greg, this is what he envisioned happening. He, he's done now. He's gone through his list of stuff that he's supposed to talk about, you know, and while he begins, starts answering, you see him lean back and that head goes back and rests up against the headrest back there. He, he's, he's relaxing, but I think at the same time, he's sort of bracing himself against the back of that headrest and his legs start moving back and forth. And I think this indicates the stress of this, of this specific situation because almost everything changes up to this point. And again, they're, they're very subtle. But those are the things we're looking for and listening for. And after that, he asked him for gum and water. You know, I think that's a, it's almost like a reward for himself. He's 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 crossed the finish line. He's reached his goal. He said everything he's supposed to that he's thought about saying on his list, the things he's rehearsed, his story. We've heard him walk through. And like you were saying, Chase, too many details, man. Way too many details for what for what had happened from as we look at, at this as a whole. 
So I think he feels like he's crossed the finish line. And he's like, yeah, instead of dunking water on himself, he's asking for water and he's chewing gum. Yeah. It, which makes sense because I'm sure his, his mouth got dry during all that, during the nervous parts of it. But I think he's relaxed now. So that's why he's, he's, his brain is letting him do things outside the situ- of that situation. No sobbing. No, uh, you know, what happened. No hand wringing. Nothing we should be seeing in here that, that is, we're seeing here, I guess you'd say. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so lots of upward inflection. Paul and I messed around, probably, and and odd. So I think he's unsure around the story he's trying to project at this point, not quite sure if it's going to stick. Then the female officer in the back says, asked him something about time. Then we get a down inflection. What time was what? So I think he now knows that he's now going to be nailed down to some times. I think some of those times, some of the phone information is working for him. And I think some of it can't be reconciled. If I remember rightly, I think he he turns and opens the door and kind of spits out the door or maybe even vomits a bit. I'm not not quite sure. But there's some kind of opening of the door, I think. And um, so I think there's a he can't reconcile some of the he sees some information that he can reconcile on there and there's some stuff that isn't going to work for him and there may be some panic there so either he has to lean out to block that and have a think about it then comes back looks off to reconcile like how am i gonna how am i gonna deal with this and then the phone goes away uh chase what do you got on this one i agree with you guys y'all covered a lot of it uh there's more ambiguity insertion here but the way that he points to the call log directly and then mentions it, that's interesting to me. I'm betting that we find out something is off about this call log. The trial's going on right now, so I don't think he's been on the stand yet. But I'm willing to bet that we find something is interesting about this call log. And he calls it out as if it's an offering, much like he did with the camouflage shotgun. It's an offering. Well, there's something here that you can look at. Those two things, call log and shotgun, were the two things that really stood out to where he kind of offered something up to assist the police. That is a heavy flag for me. Is that everybody? I think so. Yeah, Greg right. won that one. Stole it. <laughs> yeah, man. The hell is that? The eyewitness is you. What did you do today? Were you at the office or? No, nope, I was home. I came home. Paul and I had messed around. I, I, uh, I was up at the house. I laid down, took a nap on the couch, probably, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes. I got up. I called Maggie. Didn't get an answer. And I left to go to my mom's. She had said she might ride with me, but she normally doesn't when I go over there. Um, And I think I texted her. And she's very good about answering the phone, so that was odd, or calling me back. Mm -hmm. So that was odd, but it wasn't that big a deal. Now, what time was that? What time was what? That you sent her a text message. All right. Um, I checked, texted her at 908, going to check on M, be right back. And then I texted her at 947. That must be when I started to come back i think i called her before that but let me make sure Uh, pretty sure that i called her 9 45 and then i tried paul and then no i think that was riding I think that might have been riding over there. Ten o three. 
I mean, my calls are right here. Yeah. So, um, obviously, this is when, this is when I, at 10.06, Yes, sir. Ah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Take a Anybody else want some gum? I'm not sorry. You don't have any water, do you, Danny? Sure. I'm sorry. I don't need it. If you, behind Danny's head, is a case of water. It's not a big deal. Yeah, I got some. Um, this one's hard. But when you first saw Paul, you said you tried to flip him over. Was he laying on his back or on his stomach? Just like he, he is. Just like he is. So you weren't able to move him. Okay. No, ma'am. Okay. And did he help Maggie a lot out here with the animals? He helped everybody with everything. Okay. So it was kind of routine for him to be out here as well in this, the evening? This place is his absolute passion. Okay. I tried to turn him and then I tried and then I checked him and I I mean I, I, I think I already knew but I checked him and when you pulled first pulled into the property did you come from this direction where all our police cars are or which way did you come in I went to the house okay and then I came from the house this way straight here yes ma'am okay I mean where my vehicle was mm -hmm. parked is probably is, is where it was okay m well no maybe not mm -hmm. exactly but it was pretty close because okay. I came back the same route that's right because you went back to get your shotgun when I came okay. back all right Greg what do you got yeah, just a few things. Again, no grief, not in this forehead, not in the sides of the mouth. Look, there's lots of ways to show grief. You know, there's all kinds of ways that people show grief. We associate that with grief muscle. There's a ton of stuff you can do with your face to show you're sad, that you're disappointed. Something. I mean, we know he can because we've seen him use those parts of his face, so he's not Botoxed out of existence, although maybe that's part of it. But there's not even concern in his brow. None. None. When she's talking about rolling over your dead child, none, none. This is within moments. And I'll say you can be shocked. People behave differently, but very few people in life chase combat. A guy you don't know you find dead like that, that has an impact. It has an impact on people. There's no renewed emotion, no help me. He could be talking about a car accident, the way he's responding to this. And then I came out, my taillight was busted out. It's about what I hear. There's no shock at how horrific this is, because if I did it, I desensitize after I've seen it. I probably didn't expect it. Look, my opinion, this guy's just talked himself into a hole. And and he thinks he's at the end of it because he goes back into Aussie mode. He starts doing the yeah, yeah, yeah thing, the head banging thing again. I think he feels like he's at two post at the end of this thing. Just my opinion, just what I see. Chase, what do you got? So this this Aussie thing you're talking about, this head nodding at the end here is something I really want to talk about. So first, we're seeing a repetitive gesture. Second, we're seeing nodding. Third, we're seeing gum chewing, another repetitive gesture. If we go off of what the, the Godfather says, Joe Navarro, repetitive gestures are self-soothing. And... He's experiencing a lot of discomfort during this period of, of silence, and I think unconsciously he's nodding to both self-soothe and to reassure himself that his story is correct and that there's some form of agreement here in the call with him. But I had to call the big guns this morning 
And I wanted to get Joe Navarro's opinion on this. So I sent this video to Joe this morning. And this is from Joe. So, the head nodding is unusual. I suppose one could argue that he is going over in his mind what he just said, and it's almost as though he's in agreement or satisfied with what he just uttered. But that's pure conjecture. One of the things you can look at is the increase in the speed of chewing. If you speed it up, you'll see what I mean. Now, that's not indicative of deception, but it is indicative of trying to relieve the stress that follows what he just said. And I think it couldn't have been said better than uh, than Joe said it. And that's all I got. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, lovely. Um, okay, I, what I see is his hands leaving frame or almost leaving frame, which is a bigger gesture than we've norm normally seen him do. Uh, the cop next to him now, I think, is is literally <laughs> revolted by him. There's some uh, nausea going on uh, with him. When his hand comes over, he looks away, he shifts away. Um the shotgun comes up again. Uh, I think clearly that the journey to the house is important. The shotgun is important. The 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 nodding. I would I would agree. You know whether it means anything. I would agree with Joe <laughs> that, that there's uh, a self soothe and uh, a self soothe around. Is my story working? Is this good for me? Is this going to work out right yeah. for me? Because I think he's got an officer next to him who he can see is revolted. We see uh, the perpetrator here, or potential perpetrator, uh, um, uh, show disgust when they look over and see the, the officer revolted. So they know it's going badly for them uh, at this point. Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. Uh, when she asked him the way about his son, the way his son's uh, laying, again, like Greg was saying, no emotion. He still hasn't teared up and still not using that Kleenex. And then after the second questions, question, there's so much space before anybody says anything, that's when he starts talking and starts using or adding qualifiers and trying to tighten the story up, trying to, try, trying to make it sound more believable and make it sound stronger. And then when she asked him which way it came in, his illustrators get huge. This is the biggest he's used so far. The, the other ones were, were okay, but he hasn't used a lot of illustrators, but they get really big, maybe because he's thinking about her back there, and that's why he's doing that to, to illustrate for her. But they've been extremely limited up to this point. His, his voice volume is more relaxed, it gets quieter. He looks and sounds more relaxed, because I think he feels like everything's going well because he he's under the impression those officers believe him and that guy sitting next to him that police officer sitting next to him he starts pushing on his mouth he's goofing around with his lip he's uncomfortable so he knows this isn't right he knows something's not right about this but he's playing as cool as he can possibly do it but his body his body language tells on him like joe navarro says you can have a poker face but you can't have a poker body and that's what we're seeing there. He's doing all these little things that this guy, if he if he'd know what to look for, like you do now, then he would have said, "Whoops, I got to start adding some more qualifiers to my answer." So I I think they know pretty much. And and again, if you'll if you'll keep an eye on that that um, the the woman in the back, that pl that police officer in the back, watch her throughout this. Now that I know this other guy isn't a cop, or I'm under the impression that he isn't. Boy, she just really starts going against this guy. She starts scooching away. I want to look at her from the beginning and then to the end to see how far away she scooched away now that we know that. But I think she's uncomfortable uh, with him. Not horribly uncomfortable, but he keeps eyeing her notes and seeing what she's writing down. But he probably believes this guy. You know, he probably believes Alex. So, anyway, that's all I got. We good? Yeah. The eyewitness is you. Um, this one's hard. But when you first saw Paul, you said you tried to flip him over. Was he laying on his back or on his stomach? Just like he, he just, just like he is. So almost... you weren't able to move him. Okay. No, oh, ma'am. Okay. And did he help Maggie a lot out here with the animals? He helped everybody with everything. Okay, so it was kind of routine for him to be out here as well. In this the evening. this place is his absolute passion. Okay. I 
I try to turn him, and then I try to, then I checked him, and I, I mean, I, I, I think I already knew, but I checked him. <coughs> and when you pulled first pulled into the property, did you come from this direction where all our police cars are, or which way did you come in? I went to the house. Okay. And then I came from the house. This way. Straight here, yes, ma'am. Okay. I mean, where my vehicle was mm -hmm. parked is. Probably is, is where it was. Okay. M well, no, maybe not mm -hmm. exactly, but it was pretty close because okay. I came back the same route. That's right, because you went back to get your shotgun. When I came okay. back. So up to this point, Mark, what do you think we've been seeing? Yeah, I've never seen anybody so cool in this situation. I think, I don't know where we are in the in the case right now on this in court, but I ass I'm going to assume that something is going to come up around the journey to the house. Uh, the shotgun is clearly important within this. Uh, I'm, I'm going to research a little bit more on this extraordinary situation of the high school kid and the uh, Navy SEALs and the uh, Black Panthers. Uh, it's exciting, exciting story. Uh, Chase. <laughs> well, this so far is a video I know for a fact that I'm going to be using for training. And I'm no expert on the case or forensics or any of the facts of the case, but I'm a behavior expert. And I think that we're going to see this play out in court much like it did here in the car with the officers. It's going to be a very similar thing where the tells are going to be very similar. The baseline is going to be very similar. And I think the tells are going to repeat themselves in court. I don't think he's been on the stand yet. I'm not, I don't know much about the case. Greg has given me most of my education about this case, which is very little. Yeah, but it seems like maybe some stress in his life caused some sort of psychotic break of some sort that made this happen. But I don't know. Greg? Yeah, I don't know what's causing it. I don't know any of that. Let me tell you, when we talk about baseline, we're talking about normal at the moment. You need only to watch these videos to see great examples. The one, if you go back, where he says, wonderful, two different ways, is a great indicator of why body language matters. But more importantly, if you listen to everything he says throughout this, you'll hear him with a lot, a lot, a lot of detail about insignificant events and nothing when it matters. When you ask him what he did today, boom, he goes to the phone. He's trying to make a record and prove what he's done. However, if you ask him a question about what's on sale at the Dollar General, guarantee you he knows. He'll give you all the details about that. That is disturbing alone. So too much detail when it doesn't matter, not enough when it does. And massive loud flags, red flags, every flag you can imagine when it comes to why did you come out here today? Did you have a shotgun? Are there guns out here? All those pertinent areas, we see massive shifts in body language. We see that butterflying. We see tapping feet. We see touching face. We see shrinking. You name it. We This is almost like we have a glossary and we're saying, hey, would you do this for us? And he's a trained chimp. Scott, what do you got? What All did you see I so think far? This, is a, this is a great example so far of seeing – of not seeing things. We're trying to show you what to look for, but at the same time, this is a great example of the things that we're not seeing that you should be seeing. So she, in other words, you're looking for things you're not, you're not seeing. And so we're not seeing the emotion we should be seeing. We're not seeing the, the proper rocking we should be seeing with the hands ringing and the crying and things, those things are missing. All right, fellas, I think this is another good one and we'll see you next time. The behavior panel. I don't think so. <laughs> call, call first. Jason, what do you got? <laughs> Man, I'm beginning of the clip. You sound a little bit him. like him, Chase. <laughs> See, I started, started to look like him, too. Ah, oh, that's funny. It's all right, we can wait. Just take your time. I'll edit all of this out. Nobody will ever see this. <laughs> Man, those bars are really dense. It's like chewing a whole bag yeah. of gummy bears. Yeah.
We'll wait. Yeah, take time. For anyone watching, I just want you to make note of Scott's condescending eyebrow raise. <laughs> <laughs> it's baseline. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Go ahead. Everybody. You ready? Sure, if you're ready. All right. <laughs> right here in the beginning of the. <laughs> I'll take it out. <laughs> Today we're talking about Alex Murdaugh. Of course, we've been we've done a couple of videos on him so far. We're sort of going back a little bit, and we're actually looking at the interrogation. And in this thing, you're going to see a lot of things that they're tough to see unless they're pointed out to you. This is the small stuff we're always talking about. Nothing huge, but these are things that will that are almost mind blowing things that you you may not have seen before. So you may learn something. Greg, tell us about the videos we're going to watch. Yeah, so this is a first for us as well, because there's an attorney present here. He doesn't bring up his voice very often, but there is an attorney present during an interrogation, which is powerful because now it changes the way the investigator has to approach him. These videos are the first time he was asked to the police station, and this is a SLED agent talking to him, South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. And this is the first time he's confronted with evidence of that video about him being at the kennels. That's an important part of why he was convicted. We found out from a juror. And then we also find out that the guy he's calling or he was trying to get through to is the guy that that video was sent to, Roro. So it's an important part of this discussion. But I also want you to know there's an attorney there and he's interfering at least once. There's a lot of subtlety in this one and I think you'll enjoy it. Wait till the end. That's the cliffhanger. There is a video on Paul's phone of um, you and him on the farm that night, and you were in khaki pants and a dress shirt. You were playing with a tree. I don't remember playing with a tree. Yeah, I guess there was a tree sapling or something that was had fallen over or bending over, and you were trying to get it to stand back, stand up. Um, but I mean, the, the question in that is, when I met you that night, you were in shorts and a t-shirt. At what point in that evening did you change clothes? I'm not sure. I, you know, it would have been... Before dinner or after dinner? No, it would have been... What time of day was that? I would have thought I'd already changed. Uh, there's not a time. Is he asking you now what time that picture was? Yes, sir. Okay. Go ahead staff on it because there's so many posts um but i want to say it's, it looks to be about dusk so that would have been 7 30 8 o'clock i guess i changed when i got back to the house earlier when earlier when we spoke <clears throat> all right mark what do you got yeah, really simple, this one. But look at the strong difference between Murdo and the interviewer that's more visible there. The difference in how set the body language is. So Murdo really closed down. You're not going to see him move at all, pretty much, in this video. And the interviewer, way more movement happening. So just that contrast for me is exciting because I go, let's see if that changes. Let's see if the interviewer can get Murdo to open up his body language or close down even more. Can one affect the other? We're going to actually see that in the next video. So it's pretty quick. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so we'll go back to my analysis of just focusing on what's missing here in a few of these videos, what's missing, omitted, or concealed in every statement that you hear. And here he's skipping over the clothing the detective has very clearly illustrated in this question. And in an interrogation of innocent people, when they don't know something, there's something that you're going to hear from them. They're going to say, I don't know. And they're going to be comfortable with not knowing the information. And when you see guilty people in an interrogation, they're always more willing to negotiate details and nuance because of their need to appear helpful. But innocent people have no problem most of the time talking about remembering these details. So we're going to focus on this. And uh, in the coming videos, we're going to talk, we're going to actually teach you about interrogation and some of the secrets of how that stuff works. Looking forward to that, Scott. All right. From a body language perspective, 
uh, he's pretty much batting down the hatches. This is for the person who doesn't know much about body language. This is one of those few times when you see crossed arms and it means what you think it means. He's he's just completely locked down. He's got his arms crossed. He's got his legs crossed. Everything's tight. He's not moving much. He's trying to stay in control because he's being put on the spot. He doesn't know what these guys know yet. Doesn't know what the questions are going to be. So he's got to be very careful. careful. So he's paying attention to that. All right, uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, guys, you know, I'm kind of the priest of baselining. It's what matters most to me. What you're going to see is something we taught guys resisting interrogation to never do. And that's create an artificial posture you can't maintain. And what he's doing is coming in all locked down because he thinks he can control his body language. This guy who's questioning him and does a great job of soft pedaling some questions and hard pedaling others so that he feels the pressure at times. Now, if you, there's a couple other things to note here. This is a low pressure interrogation. One of the few you're going to see that's this calm and this contained and very little pressure. What we know is if I put high pressure on you and introduce facts, they can become memories. So he doesn't have that as a defense because nobody forced anything on him. That's not what's going on. He looks terribly frightened. He's doing this because he's fishing. And you watch him, you'll be able to tell when he's looking for information they have. And he's starting off. When he is locked down this whole way where he doesn't move at all, he's looking for a way to contain everything he's doing. But then he adapts and rocks as they ask him about that video. When we say adapting, we mean he's releasing nervous energy. For him, we saw this on the stand, but this is a very different him from on the stand because he is not yet discovered to be the guilty party or claimed. But when they bring up the video and ask him what time, he asked what time of the day was that, he's fishing to see if they have the video that was taken of him. We also know that he said, I was going to do something with Paul's phone at the site. Wonder what he was going to do with Paul's phone. Maybe he knew this was an incriminating video. And he was trying to get away from it. We can't tell that. What we can tell is he is fishing. He's locked. He almost looks like a photo through the entire thing. And when you see that baseline deviation, you're going to know something has changed. And by that, I, this is why I always say, you are sitting on the couch eating Cheetos baseline is not what we're looking for. We're looking for what you're advertising when you come in the door and how much deviation occurs. This is a great start. Did you guys hear me swallow earlier? How loud no, that yeah. was? It was like, nope. like a glow. The eyewitness is you. There is a video on Paul's phone of um, you and him on the phone that night. And you were in khaki pants and a dress shirt. You were playing with a tree. I don't remember playing with a tree. Yeah. I guess there was a tree sapling or something that was had fallen over or bending over and you were trying to get it to stand back, stand up. Um, but I mean, the, the question in that is, when I met you that night, you were in shorts and a t-shirt. At what point in that evening did you change clothes? I'm not sure. I, you know, it would have been... Before dinner or after dinner? No, it would have been... What time of day was that? I would have thought I'd already changed. Uh, there's not a time. Is he asking you now what time that picture was? Yes, sir. Okay. Go ahead. I was staff on it because there's so many posts. Um, but I want to say it's, it looks to be about dusk. So that would have been 7, 30, 8 o'clock. I guess I changed when I got back to the house. I 
ini you know when we were talking he'd asked me that and so you know, I mean he had told me that he thought I was up there. Did that surprise you? Yes, sir. So when you return back to the kilns, when you return home from your mom's, um, or All right, Greg, what do you got? This is why we tell you not to come in with a wonky baseline because you see he's been locked down. Now watch that thumb. He's got a, I think he has a tissue in that hand if you watch, and he's just wearing the hell out of that tissue. Scott, to your point, he never uses it for tears, but he sure is adapting on it. It's a tissue or something else. Kind of like a kid has a whoopee or something and they play with it all the time and they feel stressed. All of us do something. When he's asked the question about nine o'clock, he distances, gives himself a split second to answer by saying at nine o'clock. Then you see the rocking and his foot pressing on the floor. That's a lot when you came in locked down as tight as he was. That's why you don't do that and why you can't hide something. Chase, you always talk about politeness spikes. There's definitely a deferential sir at no, it's not just no sir, it's no sir at I cannot think of anyone else. There's no protest in this guy at all at being accused of being, and this is accusation by question. We all do it in the interrogation room. Is there any reason you call it bait questions and in regular intelligence interrogation, we'll call it put on notice by question. There's all kinds of things you may call it. But he is being accused by question, and he's not defiant. He's not indignant. His chin is not out, and there's no eye locked. That makes me go, hmm, why is this guy doing this? Scott, what do you got? All right. So we see he's changed his leg positions, and he's loosened up just a little bit. That's because he's he's eased up. That that first part, I think, is, is obviously at the beginning, so he's really, really tense at this point or up to that point. Now he's sort of relaxed, not relaxed, but he's letting go just a little bit. So he's gone from guarding his stomach and, and keeping that tight down to guarding his genitals, which we saw in the car as well. So I think he's realized uh, from a body language perspective, since the fight is on now and he knows it is, he's got to look and sound like he's being honest. So I think he's in a small way, I think he's taking into consideration what he looks like just a little bit, not much, but just a little bit more. So he's not as uh, as uh, squinched up as he was. As, and like you said, Greg, a lot going on with that thumb and forefinger, man. It looks like he's almost like playing a air banjo and his voice is quiet. And there are no big pops of, of uh, voice volume and his tone doesn't jack up or anything. He's focused. So he's, he's, he's going in fairly steady at this point. And then after the question comes about uh, the time of his whereabouts, his head goes into that that bobble thing where he's saying where his head is yes and no and spinning around. I think if we didn't understand what that was, we'd see that more as confusion because I think he's he's sorting out what he's going to say and being very careful to how he says it, which is important to him because now he's got to remember everything he's saying because as far as we know, Something may have changed in the story he prepared to this story now. That's what it looks like because there's a whole lot of thinking going on in there. Taking the stress he's he's experiencing from the interrogator in consideration. Yeah, but it looks like a little bit more than that to me. Um, I'll leave it there. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so we're all in agreement that, that he was choosing to do this behavior. I think we're probably right to say he's choosing to do that because he wants to lock it down, he wants to be in control. And this is now 10 minutes later and he's changed. And I think that is a result of the interview that's going on and the interviewer. The interviewer has managed to get some element of change out of him. I reckon I could do this all day if I really, really wanted to, unless there's something else occupying my mind that I then forget to do this and start to do behaviors which are more unconscious to me. And so to your point, Scott, I think this protection of the primary sexual characteristics, which we're now seeing, is more unconscious behavior of him. So if the interviewer has done anything here, yes, it's caused him to have to think about other elements that are going on, most likely the story story that he's telling and so we're getting more unconscious rather than conscious behavior out of him so another con uh, unconscious behavior we're seeing is that thumb move which yes is partly adaption on the uh on the 
on the tissue or handkerchief that's there, but also we're seeing it as a baton gesture as well, a gesture that moves along to the rhythm of his speech. Although it doesn't, it doesn't quite move along exactly to the rhythm of, of his speech. The baton gesture, the baton, the conducting is incongruent with the rhythm. So I'm going to suggest, you know, go back, take a look at how incongruent the rhythm of that thumb is, have a listen to what he's talking about, and then think to yourself, is it incongruent because there's extra stress and pressure around this particular element that he's talking about? Is what he's talking about right now, is this going to end up being absolutely consequential to the case? Is it important data? Is he unconsciously signaling how important this element of the story that he's most likely creating is? But look at that really subtle changes ultimately that we can start to think about and think what is the consequence of this further down the line chase what do you got on this one yeah you guys covered a lot i'll just cover one more thing here when he says no sir not if my times are right i want you to just pay attention to that the qualifier here is one of the biggest red flags you could possibly get as an interrogator and i'll tell you why here there is a known piece of information that any reasonable human being could answer from memory. Were you down there? Were you present during this video? So when he makes the denial, it's about time instead of memory. And this is where an interrogator would be asking something like, are you certain that your times are even correct or right? And then the temptation for most people to jump onto this deception is almost irresistible. And instead, I think it's best to accumulate these mistakes and red flags over a period of time, especially with people like this. If you read the average interrogation training, it's going to tell you that undetected lying is rewarding. But in cases like this, where there's lots of rehearsal and stuff, you want to get a mountain of this kind of stuff. So in interrogations like this, especially when you're interrogating an attorney, confessions are extremely unlikely. So your job here as the interrogator instead is to develop these red flags. And the moment you call someone out on one of those, a wall starts building. So you don't do that. You keep pouring water on these little red flag seeds so they become bigger red flags that the jury can watch during the replay. That's all I got. Same thing's true in intelligence, exactly. The eyewitness is you. And Maggie was heard in the background. And you were heard in the background. And that was prior to the uh, PM. I, I Rogan Gibson asked me if I was up there. He said he thought it was me. Was it you? At, at nine o'clock? Yes, sir. No, sir. Not if my times are right. Think it could have been. I have no idea. And Rogan's been around your family for pretty much all his life. Oh, absolutely. And he recognizes your voice, and you have a distinct voice. Do you think of anybody else that has a voice somewhere to yours that he may have um, misinterpreted? Mm, no. No, sir. I mean, he... You know, when we were talking, he had asked me that, so... And I mean, he had told me that he thought I was up there. Did that surprise him? Yes, sir. When you return back to the kennels, when you return home from your mom's, um, at one point in the 911 call, um, you say here, like you're talking to somebody else or something else. I say here? Here, yes sir.
so the dispatcher is asking you um, if they're breathing, and you said no. And she asked if you did you see anyone else in the area, and you said no. She asked about guns near them, and you said no. And then you kind of stutter and start moving around, and you say here. saying that I guess I have to listen to it to, uh, you know but I don't recall a dog being out I'm certain that there was not a dog out um, you know I mean there's other things people have told me about that 911 call that I don't remember um, I, I don't know here. Like I was calling a dog. Calling a dog, talking to somebody else. I don't know. That's why I'm asking. Yes, sir. And I mean, that obviously was nobody else out there. Okay. And I'm, I'm certain that there was not a dog loose. saying anything about Buster would know um, some about threats. Um, I was asked about that later if I had information about or that Buster had information about threats that I said he would know. Um, Chase, what do you got? So right here, I think the detective makes a mistake in searching for the papers about the word here, H-E-R-E. So in interrogations, it's it's really tempting to want to do this, like, oh, I have the evidence right here. But there's no need to illustrate that it's on paper somewhere. But you can see that Murdoch takes advantage of this to buy time. So he's trying to find that when the question is clear, concise, and perfect, he should not have to re-qualify himself. I think that takes away from his authority or his perceived authority in the interrogation room. And I think second, you're seeing another brilliant and giant red flag here. And this is what I call diving for details. And whether a dog is out or not of a cage or a, a kennel is beyond irrelevant. But Murdoch makes an effort to very carefully examine his memory to determine if a dog was out or not. So when you see this level of detail about relevant details, those are probably green flags. They're indicators you're talking to someone who's probably innocent or being honest. When you see the denial or the, sorry, you see this detail diving into nuance, minutia, irrelevant, hollow details like this, you're seeing something that should scare you pretty bad as an interrogator. So if we stick with the what's missing technique, we're seeing loads of detail about stuff, but the detail is missing around the victims, the timelines, the clothing. Everything relevant to the case has no detail and everything irrelevant and meaningless. He spends tons of time talking about and detailing the little answers around those. Scott, what do you got? All right, on the playback, let's pay really close attention. Mark brought it up earlier of that detective's body language compared to Murdoch's body language. The, the detective is really fluid. It's big. He's using big illustrators and, and talking fairly slow, and his tone stays even. Everything's good. And then Murdoch, whose brain is on fire with uh, trying to keep up with everything that's happening, watch watch him. Like Greg said earlier, he's it's almost like a, a picture or a mannequin. He's just sitting there. Nothing moves much at all. We still see a little bit of the, the thumb happening, but he's running scenarios in his head. And what if it goes this way? What if it goes that way? What if it goes this way? Then the, I, I thought the I saw the, the plays looking for the, for the, uh, the papers chase. I saw that more as, as it just trying to take up time between questions to help build that tension. That's where I went, but I see what you're saying. That makes sense. 
But I, I think in there, we saw a great example after he finished asking the question, how he would sit there and look at him, where he would pretend like he was doing something else and just let Murdoch talk and talk. Then he'd stop and he'd add more stuff and he'd stop and add more. And that's a technique you use. And you can use it at home on your kids. And you ask, where have you been? And they tell you, or did you go to so-and-so's place? And you, they say, yeah, I went to her house or his house. And you just keep doing this. Don't look like this, but look normal. And see what else they give you. See if they'll keep talking. See if they'll give you a little bit more information. They may, they may not. They may They may say, why are you acting so weird? Most likely they won't do that because they're going to be thinking, whoops, they don't believe me. Whoops, they don't believe me. Which goes back to the the when you when someone's talking to you and they break eye contact, most people are in the impression that person's lying to you. Whereas we know now that the person who doesn't break eye contact with you, that a huge percentage of that says that they are lying to you because their brain wants to keep an eye on you to make sure you believe them. And if they if you don't believe them, they'll start adding qualifiers. And this is a version of that, but it's it's a more advanced version of that, what the detective is doing. He's not looking for qualifiers. He's just looking for this guy to spill more information. That's how it looks to me. Greg, what do you think? What do you got? Yeah, so a couple of things. Chase, while I agree with you, that is from the mechanical side and the pure fact, the, an important part of how you go after that information. You also have to remember, I trained a lot of interrogators in my life, and it's all about this is an art form, and it has to fit the person. So that guy probably has got enough under his belt. He feels comfortable doing it a certain way. And I've had interrogators who had the, I called it the bungling Columbo method that would rifle through things and just clean house others who can't do that. And so I think it depends on the person. And I would say that all of this stuff, and we're all on the same page, all this stuff is an art form. Every one of us has our own art and style and the way we do it. It also is theater for one. So you have to be believable to that guy. If you know that guy, if you've had exposure to him, you may have a different approach. So, I, you know, I want to know what the guy's thinking when he's doing this. I'd love to talk to you if you're there. And you're listening to us. We'd love to talk to you about what you're thinking while you're interrogating Murdoch. Another couple of interesting things um, for me that when he's doing that dog thing, to me, that's a chaff and redirect. He's looking for every opportunity he can because this guy, and if you don't know what chaff and redirect is with us, it's when I spew useless information for you to pick up and follow. And we get people in the comments always saying this stuff doesn't work. Well, if you're talking about absolutes and you touch your nose, yeah, it doesn't work. We interrogate for a living. So it's one of many skill sets, all the body language we're talking about. The behavior is another layer. The questioning, all the theater stuff that he's doing, all those are layers of this approach. And what we prey on, this guy's been sitting in a vacuum, deconflicting his story since he killed these people. He has no idea what they know, and now he's starting to find out, and they're poking. He's got to deconflict on the fly. And Chase, Scott and Chase, you both brought it up. He's starting to feel a little stressed because now he knows something he didn't know when he came in. When they question him about this 911 call, I call this extra edit info. Because when a person is writing, an e if you have been around long enough that you used email all the time, you would edit your email, and you'd have junk at the end, you'd delete that. A lot of times when people are deconflicting their story before they go on 911, they're going to have words flowing through their head. They've practiced and practiced and practiced. And then that last word that dropped out there might make no sense whatsoever. None. And so anytime I hear that, I go, that's a push-pull word for me, something I want to grab and pull. Last I'll say, and there's a bunch in here, but the last one I'll point out, there's a poor camera angle. But I think he does a regulator. And we talk about a regulator being a way to control a conversation. Look at his head, fish for information as to whether the guy believes him or not. Pay really close attention. See if you agree with me. If you don't, if you think it's just some anomaly, put that in the notes too. If you think all this doesn't work, it, don't ever go into an interrogation without a lawyer because it does work. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, what I love about this is is both of the major players here are good enough, more than good enough, or experienced enough that we're able to look at the real subtleties that are going on here and kind of go, well, I wonder if the tactic here is this or it's this. I'm going to split the difference on the tactic here, and it's to do with the rhythm. I think the initial element there of looking for that piece of data is is real. Because, because I think he's actually searching for the piece of data and, and he doesn't quite know where it is. And I, and I picked that up from how fast that and indirect that rhythm is. Then he slows it down because I think he goes, you know what, as I'm looking for this, I may as well play it. 
<laughs> now, my bias would be I would play it even bigger and even longer, but, you know, that's my exhibitionism there. You know, how much can I turn up the heat even more by making this last a lot, lot longer on this? But, you know, everybody's got their own idea, their own style. They're, they're going to do what they're going to do in this situation, regardless of what the reality is. I think this interrogation, this questioning has him now locked in a new position. He's now locked in this new, what was an unconscious position. Uh, maybe he's locked unconsciously. Maybe he's locked himself now consciously and gone, okay, stay with this, stay covered up in this area. Because once again, he's, he's locked down and he's using, I don't know, I don't remember, and he's not moving and he's not responding in any big way. So isn't that wonderful? Started off locked down. Interrogator managed to open him up really by getting him to change position, get him on the back foot a little bit. And now he's locked himself down uh, again. So where's this going to go next? I'm interested to find out. There, that's all I got on that one. The eyewitness is you. At one point in the 911 call, um, you say here, like you're talking to somebody else or something else. I say here. Here. Yes, sir. So the dispatcher is asking you um, if they're breathing, and you said no. And she asked if you did you see anyone else in the area, and you said no. And she asked about guns near them, and you said no. And then you kind of stutter and start moving around, and you say, here. I don't have any memory of saying that. I guess I have to listen to it, to, uh, you know. But I don't recall a dog being out. I'm certain that there was not a dog out. Um, You know, I mean, there's other things people have told me about that 911 call that I don't remember. Um, I, I, I don't know here. Like I was calling a dog. Calling a dog, talking to somebody else. I don't know. That's why I'm asking. Yes, sir. And, I mean, that obviously was nobody else out there. Okay. And. certain that there was not a dog loose. But I don't remember saying anything about Buster would know. Um, some about threats. Um, I was asked about that later. If I had information about, or if Buster had information about threats that I said he would know. Um, I just want you to know what I'm talking about. The night I grabbed the shells that 
I could get my hands on. I, 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 don't, I don't, you know, I had no idea exactly what I had. Okay. Also, when we talked, um, I asked you if it was normal to keep guns down at the kennels. And you said you would have to check. Have you been able to check to see what was missing from your collection? I, I have. It, yes, I, I know what's missing from what I believe is missing from, from our guns. Okay, and what are those? There's, there's uh, three guns that I think are missing. Okay. And what kind of guns are those? It would be a Benelli shotgun, a Browning shotgun, and a pump shotgun. The Benelli and the Browning, are they pump or autos? The Benelli and the Browning are automatic. And the pump shotgun, what brand is that? I believe it's a Remington, but I'm not positive. Are they all, are they like standard brown and black, all black or camo? Um, the uh, the gray is is black. The browning is camo, and the pump is camo. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so let's start off, Chase, back to your point about what his style is, because he has a very specific style, and what he's doing is he's walking it very slowly and going at him. If you want to know, here's the one that I think he could have just torn him a new one right here, but he didn't. He chooses to hold off. The guy says, "I when that night when I picked up ammunition to load the shotgun, I don't have any idea what I picked up. Well, it, do you find it a random coincidence that this guy had an empty shotgun in his house? The rest of them weren't, clearly. But he went and got exactly the same ammo and loaded it that these people were killed with. Hold on. Now, you could that could right there be enough of a rift if there's not an attorney there for us to have our feet squarely under us and go at him hard. And interrogation often, to Chase's point, will go, they'll wait until they get this big blunder, they'll let one pass, they'll get this big blunder, and then they'll tear the scab off. In his case, he doesn't. He's a little bit more meticulous, which makes me think his style and we'd love to talk to you again. I forget his, I think it's Davis is his last name. But if you know and I'm wrong and you know this guy, please ask him to come talk to us. We'd love to talk to him. Listen to his style. Now, I, Mark, you started off by talking about the difference in the two of them. Everybody in the room's moving along normally, scratching, milling. He's locked down tight again. Now he's back to his you know, resistance to interrogation idea it, that's not how it really works by any any means guys the two of us who were resistance trained would tell you there's no way i would ever go in lockdown it's a dumb way to move this i love the way the agent goes in with a slow delivery at the reason i am asking is and he's moving look when you get a guy close to confession you always slow that language down because you bring them down a notch you lower your voice and it brings them down and he does something masterful here masterful whether he did it intentionally or not i love it he asked a question that is non-pertinent and non-pertinent questions are the most lethal questions in interrogation the reason is because the guy has no reason to lie so what is he going to do he's going to do what's normal and he does he raises that hand to illustrate now we know how he normally responds to an easy question he's happy to answer that because he feels like he's being helpful which is what most bad guys do but his feet and thumb are moving, and he here he goes again. That night when he's talking about grabbing shells. You could say this is a missed opportunity. I think it's a great opportunity for him to go at the guy. Then he squeezes that arm as he slowly answers the description of the shotgun. Why not? It was a camouflage shotgun. 12-gauge, Remington. Hmm, because something's up. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah. Uh, so one thing in interrogations, and we're going to talk about some of the good, some of the bad here, and any of the criticisms that we offer about the interrogation or the techniques are not on the officer. Uh, the training is lacking in a lot of departments. So we're not making any judgments about the officer there uh, in particular. But one Great thing job. that's that's true about interrogations, the more people that are in the room, the less likely you are to get a confession, period. And that's proven time and time again. But when he's talking about the missing guns, there's a complete loss of fluency where he's having trouble putting sentences together. There's hedging and qualifying. Um, 
is saying it between it's missing or I believe was missing. And then he says our guns, the big emphasis on our guns. Wondering what that means. It, the emphasis is extremely unusual. And his characteristic nodding as a hint, if you see this, he is lying. So that is his personal tell. Uh, like I showed you or all of us showed you in the squad car video before the trial even started so that you could look for it in the trial uh, as the footage came out. And I think finally in this clip, he is locked on. So when he's asked these detailed questions, he doesn't look away. When you ask a normal person to recall some details, their eyes will move to recall what gun it was, what it looked like, and their head sometimes will move with their eyes. So they'll they'll do this normally. And this is this head and eye lock is indicative of deception, especially when it's piled up with this giant cluster of all these other indicators, which Greg, you've covered so many of. And liars are more likely to do this when they lie because they're subconsciously trying to look more factual and believable. So honest people need to move their eyes and head to recall details. And one more thing he does here, and you'll hear this in his voice. He transitions into what sounds like a fifth grader reading a paper in front of a class. And this is two factored. One, he's unknowingly doing this to sound more clear and believable, but he's not doing it consciously. His brain's doing this behind the scenes. Two, he's doing this because he's trying to look honest by speaking in a slowed pace. And in my interrogation courses, we call this a shift to clinical language. It's actually the sister, or very closely related to uh, another thing we talk about called pronoun absence, or when the pronouns disappear from a person's language or answers. Mark? Yeah, so now I believe we have some self-soothing on the elbow here. Now, why is that important? Because, you know, why might, might it be more important than, say, some self-soothing on the arm or on the forearm? Was I say, you know, as much as I possibly can, this is a vulnerable area on the body. The knuckles are vulnerable. The wrist is vulnerable. This uh, elbow area is vulnerable. If those areas get damaged, you lose the use of way more of your of your arm. If this gets damaged here, well, you still got your shoulder, you still got the elbow, you still got the wrist. So, you know, the more Mark, vulnerable a joint is, yeah, Chase. When you you came down to Virginia, you and I were having a glass of wine and you taught me about this and you were telling me about it and I was internally processing going, well, oh, yeah, I guess that makes sense. And while I was like trying to see, oh, is that true or not? You grabbed my elbow and I had a visceral response to it. And it yeah. was so different. So it is a I have told this to so many people since you taught me this. So, sorry, I just wanted to put no, that in there. Right. It's so true. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, you thought, you, really I wanted... thought you were getting the, the shits and giggles, and I was getting ready to go, man. That's when you had that smile on your face. I thought, <laughs> what about this? Must be good. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. If you really want to annoy somebody, grab their elbow, take control of their elbow, take, take control of their wrist, just take their finger and just take a joint of it and mess around with the joint. It'll super, super annoy them. So look, that's why this is of interest more than this or this, because it's way more protectionist, I would say. Now, here's one last thing that's interesting me. We've got this kind of almost rocking back and forth, but certainly the head moving back and forth. Now, what is that about? Here's what I'm gonna tell you. I don't know for sure what that's about, but I'm gonna give you all the options I can come up with very quickly in my mind, and it won't be all the options out there. And what you need to do as somebody who's interested in nonverbal communication and looking at situations and going, what is the truth of this? Is you've got to go, well, what if it's this? Or what if it's that? Or maybe it's this, or maybe it's that, and get those clusters together. Could be compliance, could be a, a yes. And he's just, not, he's not saying yes to everything. He's just trying to show compliance. It could be self-soothing could be soothing himself. It could be a barrier gesture. It could be him trying to, you know, take away everything out there and just moving his body in order that no other information can come in, almost a kind of a trance-like state. In fact, Greg, um, uh, Scott, you probably, I think that's probably what you call the trancer state. Because look, uh, if you go, um, if you go and see dervishes, for example, or you go to the Wailing Wall, go to the Wailing Wall and see the movement in front of the Wailing Wall. It's a trance state movement. So you literally can, can change the way your mind is 
is functioning by simply moving your head up and down. It's like twirling round and round and round and round and round will change the state of your mind. The whirling dervishes do that. Try it out. Try it out, but um, but make sure that all the furniture is moved apart because you'll probably fall over. Greg, what's your thought? Mark, one last thing to add to that. This guy had a serious opiate addiction and neural pathways, 10,000 strikes. They get to be a habit. Who knows Absolutely. how many times he rocked as Absolutely. he was off that. So, so for sure, I've got, I've got down here, drug use. It can yep. come with drug use. I used to work, work with uh, a lot of heroin addicts myself, and you would see it. You would see it a lot, depending on, on what state they were in. Had they used recently? Had they not used recently enough? Um, it could be stimming. So could be neurodivergent or diverse or neuroatypical or a whole bunch of other things. Do I know which one it is? Well, I can make my guess and then I can test my guess as we go along. But the important thing is, is it's a guess. You're making your best guess now on all the information you have to be intelligent. And then you're testing that guess to get closer to the truth. And you might well get there, but you don't do it with this always equals that. It's all possibility. It's all a state of, of maybe. And you might go, well, Mark, that just means you, you know nothing. You have no absolutes. And it's not having the absolutes that makes you way more intelligent and gets you to the truth quicker, I would say. Uh, who we got left on this? Uh, Scott? Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm left with nothing. So I, I'll, do, I'll go with the, an overview. He's still locked down. That, I think the constant bobbing back and forth, obviously, that's indicative of stress. And I think he's tr he's trying to agree with everything at the same time while he's trying to stay locked down. At the same time, he's blown off that built up stress and tension. So I think that's several things at the same time, Mark. I agree with you. Yeah. And he's getting these little bits and pieces of of information from the detective because he's he's slowed down. He's talking slow. He's not giving him very much. It looks like he's getting ready to paint this big picture of here's what's going on, but he doesn't give him much at all. And that's driving him nuts because he's usually the guy in charge. He's the guy that tells you what to do. He's the boss of everything apparently so far. So this is driving him bonkers as he's trying to get through this. Um, and that's why he's locked down so hard as well, because he, he I'm sure he wants to scream because this guy's not giving him information quick enough. And, and then again, and the only movement outside that again is that thumb. And uh, obviously we, we talked about being an adapter because of the, the timing he's using and all that. All right. So I'll leave it there since most everything's gone already. The eyewitness is you. The reason I'm asking about that, <clears throat> the shot shells that we recovered that night, one was a turkey load, one was a buckshot. I understood that. The shotgun that you had with you that night, there was a bird shot and a buckshot. Um, when Jeff went back the next day, um, I'm not sure which attorney it was, pointed out that there had been a shotgun laying on the pool table that he had put away and pointed out that ammunition that was with that, and it was a buckshot and a bird shot. And then the shotgun that we took um, for potential comparison, it was also loaded with a bird shot and a buckshot. So I have all of these consistent loads along with what's that? in the feed room. I call it the feed room. And the kennels, is that what you call it? That's, that's okay. fucking good enough. Okay. I just want, if I say feed room, I just want you to know what I'm talking about. The night I grabbed the shells that I could get my hands on, I, 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 I don't, you know, I had no idea exactly what I had. Okay. Also, when we talked, um, I asked you if it was normal to keep guns down at the, at the kennels. And you said you have to check. Have you been able to check to see what was missing from your collection? I, I have. It, yes, I, I know what's missing from, what I believe is missing from, from our guns. Okay, and what are those? There's, there's you know, three guns that I think are missing. Okay. And what kind of guns are those? It would be a Benelli, 
a shotgun, a browning shotgun, and a pump shotgun. The Benelli and the Browning, are they pump or autos? The Benelli and the Browning are automatic. And the pump shotgun, what brand is that? I believe it's a Remington, but I'm not positive. Are they, all, are they like standard brown and black, all black or camo? Um, the uh, the Benelli is, is black, the Browning is camo, and the pump is camo. Okay. And, and that's, you know, we, we've talked about the shot shells. So the cartridge casings were 300 blackout cartridge casings that were found by Mac. There were also cartridge casings found by your house, by the side door to the gun room, and at the shoot, shooting range. We're now asking about shell casings that were found by Maggie. That's Maggie's body, correct? The, show, the, the cartridge casings cartridge found by Maggie, yes. Had he ever been confronted with this information prior to right now that you know of? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Okay. Cool. I believe he was, but um, not by me, I don't think. There were also cartridge casings found by your house, by the side door to the gun room, and at the shoot, shooting range. Okay. And the ones by the house, and some of the ones found at the shoot range are confirmed matches to the ones found by Maggie. Okay. So, which gives another concern. I've got the same load as the shot shells and multiple guns and 300 blackout that match ones found on your property. So you now believe that those guns, that Paul's guns were used? Yes. Okay. And missing. And I understand that somebody had seen that gun recently, but, you know, and I'd ask Buster about it. Um, I, I believe that that gun has been gone since back before Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, no one, two. no one recalls Paul's first 300 going missing around Halloween at a party at Hampton. Halloween of 2020. When, when did y'all? No, that because that no, was no, 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 it, it years. Yeah, it, it, it was whatever. All right, Chase, what do you got? I like the level of composure here in the interrogator. So it's not this confrontational thing. I have done training in police departments. I will not say which ones, but I've done training in police departments where they just, they didn't have any training. So they just did what they saw on TV. And I'm not joking. That's they don't have training for the department, so they just copy this aggressive behavior. But let's talk about what's missing here. What's missing is a any denial, even remotely mentioning that these guns were involved in the crime. And I'm talking about Murdaugh here, a single mention of the guns that were used in the crime, or an acknowledgement that it looks bad, or the biggest one of all, some kind or some hint of confidence. So his, his body is in full blocking. He's turtling protecting the brachial arteries under the arm, protecting the groin and femoral arteries. There's abdominal protection there. And if there's one thing, if you go on YouTube and type in a compilation of people getting the crap scared out of them, like somebody pops out of a trash can and all that, you'll see the same reaction in every person. All the arteries start getting protected. The shoulders come up. And we're just kind of seeing that here in permanent form. And just for me, lastly, at the end of his statements, you'll hear a vocal noise that's not language at all. Just kind of a, uh, coming out of his mouth. And this is maybe a vocal exhaust. It's letting off stress. But secondary to this, it, I think it's a desire to build some confidence, to reassure himself that he is in charge or that he can speak up when he wants to. Not a lot of time to get into that. But too many people in the room, the less likely you are to get a confession. Pens and paper 
having a pen and paper open and on the table, taking notes while a person is talking reduces the likelihood of confession. Having a gun on your belt or having multiple people in the room with guns make confessions less likely. The arresting or involved officer conducting the interview makes it exponentially less likely for confession. Uh, but they did do well by not having on a uniform because the uniform also reduces likelihood of confession. So, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, two things. Number one indicator that he's not going to confess, though, to me, Chase, is he's got an attorney sitting there who'd say, shut up. You're done <laughs> yeah. with that, right? Yeah. That's exactly. But you're right. Look, I, I, Dr. Phil says it best. Nobody confesses in a crowd, and he's dead on. It's That's an it, intimate thing when you're talking to somebody. Let me tell you two things that in my all my years of interrogating, I, never, I, I realize the person who is guilty is capable of acting like they're innocent, but people who are innocent have a hard time acting like they're guilty. And by that, I mean, if I'm innocent and you accuse me, some, I'll come up in my chair and come at you. I may say something at least, but I'm going to be indignant. Often the guy who isn't is the most helpful little bastard you're ever going to meet in your life. And he's going to go to front of the mouth. How can y'all always hear me say that? And this guy does it. He goes, okay. And he does fading facts and does that kind of front of the mouth talk. And you hear it and all the time when people are trying to be uh, solicitous and try to get information out of you. I'll leave that part there. And I'm just going to run down a list of things I see here and let you decide what it means to you. His respiration is up. Watch his chest. His free hand is adapting, meaning this hand that's off to the side is adapting. The hand that's here is squeezing the hell out of the arm. He's doing his Ozzy Osbourne move, as we talked about before. <laughs> he starts to chaff and redirect. And when he does, you see his feet dance and his cadence slow. And then he hits a bunch of ums. We say no single indicator of deception. But a damn pile of deception like that, seeing a whole lot of indicators, means something to me. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. Well, actually, that front of the mouth talking, Greg, I'm worried that you're trying to steal my Penelope pit stop impression there. It's getting, hey it's getting hey awfully <laughs> close. Getting awfully close. I'm a little bit I'm a little bit worried and a, and a little bit <laughs> nervous about about my property uh, on that one. Uh, now look. Um, uh, what I really love about this, because I agree with you, Chase, that that the interviewer here um, is is doing a really subtle, calm interview compared to a, you know the classic TV idea of an interrogation. It's it's nothing like you'd expect if you've seen all those TV interviews. And at the same time, he has got bigger with his gestures. So that points to me, Scott, to what you were saying. I think he's getting a little impatient and maybe a little excited about this. I think he can see somebody who's locked themselves down and is giving a few indicators of the stress that he's under. And he's seeing the, the impression that his questions have. And so there's gonna be an edge of excitement there that I think we're seeing in the gestures. And at the same time, all of us want things to move along a lot quicker. Like all of us want a result. And I think even though he's got to know that he's there with a lawyer and he's not going to get any confession and there's other people in there and, and you know, it's it's unlikely, he's got, you know, you'd want it all the same, wouldn't you? You'd want that moment. And I think that's what we're seeing in those big gestures is a level of wanting to move this along and the excitement of it. So, so uh, you know, impatience and excitement I see there in the interview. Now, the subject here, we see some foot stamps. We see it because we see the, the, the knee move and, and very directly down, down, down. I want you to go back and have a listen to what he was talking about when, when he's doing those suppressive gestures with his foot. And then think at, around the case and think, was that information, was what's being talked about around there, did it become pertinent to the case? Did it was, it, was it information that anybody who has perpetrated a crime would want suppressed, but they're not able to say, shut up, be quiet, don't talk about that. I'm, I don't want to answer questions on that. I don't want that information, but I'm Consciously, he's stamping down on that. I think, I think that might be the case. Uh, who have we got left? Scott? Me. Yeah. You guys dang covered everything. But I agree with you, Chase. I, I, when, you, when you go train and then you run into somebody, let's say you go to a different town and then you get pulled over and the off police officer says, where do I know you yeah. from? And you say, well, I do this, this. And oh, wait, no, you trained, you trained us in interrogation. And then you say, well, how's everybody doing? And they always have that one guy that didn't 
listen, <laughs> you know, he only went through things one time, you know, or he's using his read technique the wrong way. And they'll say, this was, you know, and those guys get on my nerves. The ones that don't pay attention and really mess things up for somebody that, so I, I know where you're coming from that, that really gets on my last nerve. I won't get, I get worked up if I get into that. And before we get finished with this, let me just add this in here. And this is about Greg. Greg, would you mind doing that frontal mouth voice and just say the ABCs in it? Yes, please. Sure. Yeah, later. <laughs> let's, hear it. Let's, let's hear it now. Let's go ahead and do it now. I don't know if I can. A, B, C, let's hear it. Let's take a shot. D, E, F, G. There you go. That's good enough. <laughs> can, let's, see, let's hear it, man. Do the alphabet. I'm done. I did it. <laughs> oh, dude. I know where you live. Good. Remember, you got two times still. That would have been so good. <laughs> anyway, but now he's got that Kleenex out and, and he's goofing around with that the whole time. And it's and his his adapting thing is really, really working up a little bit here. And I'm sure he's been using it to wipe his fake tears and his, you know, his r fake runny nose and all that stuff. Like we saw in that initial car video. As you do, I think Mark's the one that brought that up. Um, and then there, there's such little head movement. That, again, he looks almost like a mannequin. And it's very odd to see something like that out in the wild or see something normal. So you automatically, like Greg always goes back to, this is just, it's weird because he's just frozen and talking. You don't see that very often from someone who is a, uh, is a normal as far as um, the brain goes. You don't see that very often. Um, but he, but he looks almost like a mannequin. And so that, that's, I think you guys have covered everything. I'm going for it here. I'm trying to find something to go over, but I got <laughs> nothing. So I, I could do it, but it'd be boring as hell. The eyewitness is you. And, and that's, you know, we, we've talked about the shot shells. So the cartridge casings were 300 blackout cartridge casings that were found by Mac. There were also cartridge casings found by your house, by the side door to the gun room, and at the shoot, shooting range. We're now asking about shell casings that were found by Mac. That's Maggie's body, correct? The, show, the, the cartridge case was found by Megan, yes. Had he ever been confronted with this information prior to right now that you know of? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. okay cool. I believe he was, but um, not by me, I don't think. Okay. There were also cartridge casings found by your house, by the side door to the gun room, and at the shoot, shooting range. Okay. And the ones by the house and some of the ones found at the shoot range are confirmed matches to the ones found by Maggie. Okay. So, which gives another concern. I've got the same load as the shot shells and multiple guns and 300 blackout that match the ones found on your property. So you now believe that those guns, that Paul's guns were used? Yes. Okay. And missing. And I understand that somebody had seen that gun recently, but, you know, and I'd ask Buster about it. Um, I, I believe that that gun has been gone since back before Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, no one, no one recalls Paul's first 300 going missing around Halloween at a party at Hampton. Halloween of 2020. When, when did y'all? No, that because that no, was no, 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 it, it years. Yeah, it, 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 it was whatever. Another part in the 911 call. You made the comment, I should have known. And the questioning that surrounded, um, you know, dispatchers asking, is anybody else supposed to be at the house? Um, and you said, no, ma'am, please hurry. Um, and she says, we're getting somebody out there to you. And your next comment was, I should have known. What are you referencing in that statement? I don't remember saying that, but I guess, you know, all the threats and, you know, and I had been convinced that this was something to do with the boat wreck and, you know, all of that. <clears throat> to call her, if 
physical with you? Did you ever get into a heated argument and get physical? One time, I mean, a, a little bit where he wouldn't listen to me. Did you ever get physical with him? No, sir. Some of Maggie and Paul get physical with Maggie? No. Yeah. Sure, she probably wanted to at times. I mean, oh, yeah, she wanted to at all of us. Yeah. And the one time Paul did that, he had had too much to drink mm -hmm. um, in a very isolated incident. Where was that? Was that at Moselle or at a stove? That was at uh, Moselle. So that was pretty recent? No, sir. It had been a while. When you turned Paul over and his cell phone popped out and you picked it up and your statement was something like, um, I thought about doing something, but then I put it back down. And that was the interview, our first interview. What, what were your intentions with the phone? I don't know. I mean, it, when I, when I uh, went up to him and phone came out. I, I don't remember having intentions of doing anything with the phone. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so um, what's interesting now is this interview, we're seeing a, a, a lot of uh, adapting there, a lot of trying to manage, I believe, you know, his own stress around this. And this is tricky for anybody, anybody. I mean, just put yourself in a position where you are interviewing somebody else for a job. So it's not even, it's not even an interrogation like this. You're interviewing somebody for a job and you want to do a really good job because you want to make sure that you get the right person for it. You're going to be under stress. And the interviewer here is under stress as well. And here's where we're seeing this person manage their own stress at this time i think managing it very very well but but it's more marked at this point than a lot of the body language from the subject uh, though there is some good stuff from the subject in just in just one moment uh now also we see him go and adapt at the papers as well he moves around the papers for no real reason i don't think he's doing it for dramatic effect he's just trying to find something to do to deal with his stress around this um so you know the question is is like you know how do you manage your stress in these situations because everybody feels it and everybody needs not only training in how to get information out of people but training in how to manage yourself in that interview so that you don't you know corrupt it with your own problems in there okay here's what's happening in the subject when i went up to him there's then a change in that baseline that he's now established he's locked into and he goes to protect his knee and barriers again the knee really important joint on the body if the knee gets damaged you're in big trouble i, I dislocated my knee uh, about six seven eight months ago or something like that and it's hard to walk like it's hard to walk when you so you don't want that lit that that joint you know, damaged in any way. So under stress and pressure, the knee is an area. We also see people will go down and touch the ankle. Prince Harry does that. He'll go down and touch his ankle. Zero reason to do it. There's nothing wrong with his foot. He's not, the foot's not going to disappear anywhere, but he kind of thinks you can't, it's a habit that he's got into. You won't be able to see me adapting on my ankle. Again, tricky joint. He then goes on to say, I didn't have any intention of doing anything with the phone. So here's what I'd say, because he protects the knee. He did have some intention of doing something with that phone. Yeah, I'm going to gamble that that is probably inaccurate as to what he's saying there. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? I, I, I think the stress with the detective is from, it's not from, it's not stress. It's more of a thing where he's thinking about all the thing he's, things he's got, all the, he's 
He's looking at all the information he's got. He's putting everything in order. That's what it looks like to me. When I'm thinking, I always do this, or I put my hands up around my mouth and people complain about it and all that when they when I do it on here. But I think that's what this guy's doing. He's thinking about all the stuff he's got. He's like, and, and it's more of a positive thing than than a stress reliever from being something negative built up, bad stress. That's yeah, what cognitive like load. Yeah, cognitive yeah. load. When yeah. I say stress, I'm not saying negative or positive. Just okay, you know, okay, gotcha. load that you gotcha. didn't gotcha. that you don't necessarily need. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because that that's I've been in that spot before, and so we all have. So that's the way I, that's the way it looks like to me anyway. But again, the bobbin's going strong here, and he's <clears throat> laser focused on that interrogator because he he didn't put much thought into the nine one one call. He didn't think it would be dissected. He didn't think it would be brought out phrase by phrase, word by word. He he remembers pretty much the story he's talking about, but he doesn't remember all the little tiny details. And those that he does remember, he be, he's sure to lean into them. Like when he talks about it and he throws his kid under the bus again and blames this whole thing on his child that he killed. You know, that this is a dirty guy here. This is this is this is not this is a low. I uh, have you know, that's using language we can use on here. When he's asked if he's been been <clears throat> excuse me, violent with Paul, that's when we see uh, the most moving in that right hand. That's when it starts going the most. He's remembering that violent uh, situation, and that's that's the way he that's the way he's trying to because I'm sure it was pretty violent. That kid came at him, you know what? It wasn't good for the kid uh, by the time it was over because that Bernard was a big boy, and uh, this is. Um, I think this is good because we see him trying to stay composed. He's trying to stay under control. And he tries hard to look natural so it doesn't look odd. But it does look odd because it's not natural. We see him trying to hold hold those things back with all of his adapters and, and everything he's doing, trying to stay straight and and all bunched up like that. Um, and it's, so his confidence that he's trying to show really doesn't come through that way. It just looks and sounds odd. Um, all right, Chase, what do you got? So let's just examine a little bit here. There's no mention of detail about the crime that occurred, like ever. There's not mention of murder or being shot or someone killing someone or guns. Not one uh, desire to find out who did this. Not one ounce of anger. Not one ounce of guilt, which normal people tend to have just under the under the assumption they could have maybe prevented something from happening. If I would have only done X, then Y wouldn't have happened. And there's no mention of how the bodies looked, but the detail and the very specific, carefully executed phone description uh, is just astonishing here to me. And this is an example of a detail valley and a detail spike. And it suggests extreme deception to me. And, that there's something with this phone that is key to the case. So if this has not gone to trial yet, I would say that phone holds something there. And when he says you ever get physical with him, when he's talking about Paul, he's saying, no, sir. There's a quick head shake. And then he goes back to nodding. And Maggie mm -hmm. is just, no, it's more direct, more confident. And there's a more firm head shake. So these are two kind of a, just apart from each other. And I'll let you determine whatever that means. And in interrogations, it is your job to help somebody soften the severity of the case, to help them carefully just come to the conclusion that they can confess. And I would say no matter what, your job is to go, whether there's an attorney in there or not, it doesn't change the desired outcome. So there's a quote from Sun Tzu that I have on the first page of all my interrogation manuals that when I train students and police, and this is build your opponent a golden bridge on which to retreat. So when your suspect is as bad a liar as this, you'll have actually more work to do. But they'll. the cool thing is they're definitely going to show you the blueprint of what that bridge is supposed to look like. What do they need to hear? And interrogators essentially have seven core jobs. And this is me just going through the interrogation training here for you. We have to minimize, socialize, project, justify, rationalize, emphasize the truth, and increase anxiety associated with deception. Those are the main jobs of an interrogator. And we're not seeing a whole lot of that here. Maybe we will uh, later on, but I wish we had seen a little bit more. Uh, Greg, what do you got? 
Yeah, in the course of interrogation, there is a golden tool that you use, and it's called futility. And only good interrogators are any good with it. Everything we do, everything Chase just said, all of that is about one thing. It's about getting that person to the point they have a realization they can't resist you. And the hardest thing for a person to get is that. I mean, in my days of teaching interrogation, they would stand up and sound like Picard from uh, Star Trek saying, resistance is futile and you'd fire them. You'd put them right out of the interrogation room and say, no, come back. It's about subtlety of message. It's about getting the person to realize that you have more ammunition than they do and they're going to lose the war. That's really at the end of the day, what we do. There are lots of ways. Some are, some are coercive in some parts of the world. Some are non-coercive. My style is non-coercive. Some like Reed has another set of tools. All of these work on that one thing that a person gets to a point, they realize there's no re reason to resist, to resist because they're not going to win. What we see here, Mark, I love that you're talking about the investigator because I think what we're seeing here is some masterful interrogation that you only have to be able to know what he's doing to figure out why the stress is there. He has a job, and that job is to hide the key crux of the matter. And he brings up a crux question in here. What were you going to do with that phone? That's why he's here. He wants to know because this is – they already know now that he was down at the kennel, and he's trying to find out. Is that guy trying to get rid of it? So all that stuff he's doing is kind of a redirect. If you watch magicians, you guys are big fans of magicians more than I am. They're redirecting while they're doing something with the other hand. That's what he's doing. And I always say an interrogator is like a swan. They look elegant and floating along the top of the water, but they're paddling like hell underneath. And you can see it. He's paddling like hell right here. He's trying to keep his head above water. Mark, you're picking up on that and seeing that stress. We see this is. I'm going to go a little bit long in this one because this is probably one of the most powerful ones we're going to see. But we start off by watching Murda do a rapid short stroke of the thing he always does. Watch how short stroked he is as he's doing. And he's asked about the 911 call because that's what he thinks this is about. Now you see that tissue in his right hand starting to take the crux of all these things that are going on. Something else changes. Have you heard him say, you know, ever until now? He starts now to have filler words, you know, you know, you know. He also goes to partial sentences and phrases. Okay, that's a fairly common Southern speech pattern around where I live and around where he lives, but he doesn't use it. This is the first time I've heard it. As soon as this guy looks away, watch when the investigator takes a second and looks away and watch that explosion of movement. Just crazy, only to lock right back down. Right there enough is enough for me to say, why the hell are you doing this? Then we see really big rocking when he's asked about his son. And he says he wouldn't listen to me. The one missed question here is how physical did you get? I would have asked that just to fire across the bow and say, I think you're violent and, but I think he does a great job of containing it. And then Paul or, or Murdoch gives out useless information. When he talks about alcohol, but watch him. When you see that thing where he covers his knee mark, that's in response to the crux question. When he asked that crux question, his hands go out to block that knee. And you could say it's because he's been so balled up. He needed to move out to get to there. Or it could be the knee, or it could be both. But something caused him to do that. And then he gets back to keen on locking everything down. If you're being interrogated, dropping your hands in your lap while you're fig leafing, if nothing ever changes, it's just fig leafing. And so what? It's just your baseline. Now the only problem with putting your hand on your knee is we can see everything. You're like a little meter there. This is a big deviation from baseline. And powerful, powerful interrogation step. The eyewitness is you. Another part in the 911 call, um, you made the comment, I should have known. And the question that surrounded, um, you know, dispatchers asking, is anybody else supposed to be at the house? Um, and you said, no, ma'am, please hurry. Um, and she says, we're getting somebody out there to you. And your next comment was, I should have known. What are you referencing in that statement? I don't remember saying that, but I guess, you know, all the threats and, you know, and I had been convinced that this was something to do with the boat wreck and, you know, all of that. physical with you? Did they ever get into a heated argument and get physical? One time, I mean, a, a little bit where he wouldn't listen to me. Did you ever get physical with him? No, sir. Some help Maggie and Paul get physical with Maggie? No. 
I'm sure she probably wanted to at times. I'm yeah, sure she, she wanted to at all of us. Yeah. And the one time Paul did that, he had had too much to drink mm -hmm. um, in a very isolated incident. Where was that? Was that at Moselle or at a store? That was at uh, Moselle. So that was pretty recent? No, sir. It had been a while. When you turned Paul over and his cell phone popped out and you picked it up and your statement was something like, um, I thought about doing something, but then I put it back down. And that was the interview, our first interview. What, what were your intentions with the phone? I don't know. I mean, it. When I when I uh, went up to him, and the phone came out, I, I don't remember having intentions of doing anything with the phone. Dispatcher, hour two hours ago. Hour and a half to two hours. Hour ago. and a half two hours. What time was the 911 call? 10:06 p.m. Hour and a half two hours prior to that. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Thank you. And you having trouble coming up with a specific time? Oh, yes, there. I don't. I, I, tell me again what I said to the. Um, Dispatcher. You said an hour and a half ago, probably two hours. And what time was that? That was when you were on the phone um, and the 911 call was made at 10 06. So given two hours back, that would have been eight. I mean, I think that's probably about, I think that's probably about right. And so, you, what, you believe I'm giving you an inconsistent answer? No, I'm just trying to wrap my mind around it when I'm asking you what time you went to the office that day, what time you got home. At this point in the investigation, did you have the video back from Paul's phone showing the dog at the kennels? No, sir, I had not. Um, you're, you know, you said 5 or 5.30. I've gotten a card readout from the law firm, and it shows you going in at 5 or 5.30. Going in the door? Yes, sir. Randy says when he left about six o'clock, you were still there. So the times aren't matching up, and I'm just trying to get I, under, I'm, I'm just trying to get an understanding of why. I believe I left. So the, the, that's not the first time I was at my office that day. There were several readings, but your card wouldn't work. Somebody had to actually had to let you in. Okay, but, I, but I've got your card opening the door at the law firm at 5.30. Okay. Okay. And then Randy saying...
All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So uh, what interests me now is this yellow shirted interviewer, the one that we can't really see uh, too much of. You can see uh, his breathing rate because you can see his stomach, his diaphragm moving. So you can have a look at where his breathing rate is. And and to all the points that have been made so far, look, the, you're, you're in this situation, let's assume probably rightly that they are looking, whether it's unreasonable or not, looking to move somebody to a confession. You know, it could be unreasonable in this situation, but that's where they're going. And there's an element of nonverbal, which is about time. Like how quickly does so- or slowly does something happen? And, and how quickly or slowly something happens has effect on human beings, and it often shows up in their nonverbal behavior. I think we're seeing from the yellow shirted interviewer that he would like this to be happening a whole lot quicker than it is. And so it, it, it takes me back to the other interviewer and, and what again, what I would call the, the stress that's happening there, which is, you know, the cognitive load that not that he's out of control with things, but he would like probably a, a, a better pace on it. I mean, who wouldn't like to get something done faster rather than slower? So n- not only when you're thinking about how you might do interviews, whether it's in this kind of situation or something, you know, with with a little less risk in it, maybe, but, you know, even interviewing somebody for a job, there's a lot of risk involved with that. You've got to understand the pressures of time and what you're liable to do under these pressures of time. And I think in this situation, we've got somebody here going, you know what, I'd like this to be happening a lot quicker than it is. So interesting uh, to to see that. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? I almost did that. That didn't go on as long as I would have liked it to. Luckily, <laughs> Zoom has an <laughs> alert that comes up now when you're on mute. Oh, with, <laughs> that's, that's just, been gone forever then, isn't it? <laughs> so I believe he told his attorney he was innocent. I believe that that's what he said to his attorney. And you can I think you can tell here because he's not looking back at him very often. Uh, for advice or anything. And I'm going to say something that's critical of interrogation training, but I'm not talking about this particular officer. This is a unique case where he's literally interrogating a former prosecutor. This whole series of clips still does illustrate why it's important not to follow just some blind step-by-step checklist for interrogations. And one of the biggest damaging mistakes that I've seen in every police department, every one that I've given training to, including the military, is they have zero training on how to understand the person that they're speaking to. And so many departments get kind of a washed down version of interrogation training, and none of them teach interrogators to understand the phrases, the approaches, the techniques, and specific words that are going to influence certain types of people, and then how to tell which type I'm talking to right now. So essentially, most interrogation training is kind of this basic lockpick where they're taught to just jiggle this lockpick in the lock for hours in hopes that a confession is going to come out or information is going to come out when all they needed was the key, which is kind of the right words that the person, their psychology, the suspect's psychology will respond to. And as the key lesson from this video, take a look at Murdoch's behavior. It is restrained. Now, lots of people get nervous in the interrogation room. Lots of people get stressed out, innocent and guilty. But only some conceal and restrain those behaviors of stress. And we're definitely seeing that here. Scott, what do you got? All right. I agree. I think this is from this point on, uh, this is where he's beginning to realize that things aren't going to go his way. That's why it's starting to get a little bit more odd looking and and things start ramping up a little bit. He knows he, he messed up and his brain is scrambling to fix all that stuff. Scrambling, is scrambling to keep his story straight, scrambling to, to remember what he said and what he's done up to this point. That's I'm just giving the overall body language uh, view, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is a good one because it, we see a new adapter. We see he starts off by doing his normal foot moving, rocking, doing all that, but then he twists in his chair. That's something new. Why do you do that? Don't know. Don't know. We always say doesn't matter why, it makes me want to know why. So then we go there. Then he uses a delaying technique, tell me again. That gives him time to think. And as soon as he gets done with that, he does two-handed adapting, pulling it close and squeezing his arm. There's a lot going on here. Then there's a negotiated answer with a lilt at the end. That's probably about right. Well, Chase, I think you usually say, 
innocent people are comfortable introducing ambiguity. Let me give you a great example of that. If this happened to me, I would say, hell, I don't know what time it was. I came home, my wife and child were dead. It could have been 20 hours. Hell, I don't know. My brain was not working. But we don't hear that. We hear that overly helpful. And people who don't know how to resist interrogation always think that if I'm just helpful, they'll leave me alone. That's why it works that way. The eyewitness is you. One thing that I'm trying to understand is your timeline. You said you probably went to the office at 30, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, and you left early around 5 or 5.30. Um, and there's been some other timelines or times that we've talked about, and you can't quite remember um, what the times are or what time of day it was. When the dispatcher asked you, when was the last time you saw Maggie or told Maggie? He said an hour and a half, two hours ago. To me, that's, you know, a set, without thinking about it, you should rattle off that time. Um, we're sitting here trying to figure out a timeline. Your question was, you told the dispatcher hour, two hours ago? Hour and a half to two hours Hour ago. and a half to two hours. What time was the 911 call? 10.06 p.m. I don't have two hours prior to that. Yes, sir. Go ahead. And you're having trouble coming up with a specific time. Oh, yes, yeah, there. Uh, I don't. Uh, I, t tell me again what I said to the um, dispatcher. You said an hour and a half ago, probably two hours. And what time was that? That was when you were on the phone um, and the 911 call was made at 10.06. Okay. So given two hours back, that would have been eight. I, I mean, I think that's probably about, I think that's probably about right. So you, what do you believe I'm giving you an inconsistent answer? No, I'm just trying to wrap my mind around it. When I'm asking you what time you went to the office that day, what time you got home. Can I, can I ask you a question? Yes. At this point in the investigation, did you have the video back from Paul's phone showing the dog at the kennels? No, sir, I had not. You know, you're saying 5 or 5.30. I've got the car readout from the law firm, and it shows you going in at 5 or 5.30. You're going in the door? Yes, sir. And Randy says when he left about 6 o'clock, you were still there. So the times aren't matching up. And I'm just trying to get, I, under, I'm, I'm just trying to get an understanding of why. I believe I left so that the... That's not the first time I was at my office that day. There were several readings, but your card wouldn't work. Somebody had to actually had to let you in. Okay. But, I, but I've got your card opening the door at the law firm at 5.30. Okay. And then Randy saying, and then Randy saying when he left at 6, you were still there. I'm just, I'm trying to understand. You know, I, I left the office earlier than I normally do. What's, you your, know? what's your normal time to leave? I mean, it's not unusual for me to be there till dark. You know, I try to get home when Maggie's home, you know, before dark. She don't like staying out there by herself in dark. That's right. So, you know. If it was 5.30 or 6, I, you know, I don't think I was still there at 6 o'clock. Okay. But, um, you know, if I was, it wasn't long after that. Okay. So, you know, I went, I believe that I went straight home. So, you know, 
my car. Have y'all been able to get Chevrolet to download my? We're still working on that. Okay. That's a long process. Well, I mean. I got home early enough for Paul and I to ride the property for a substantial length of time. You know, more than an hour, I thought probably a couple of hours okay. that we were together, but somewhere. You took her down the river. We rode down um, all the roads, I believe. I believe that we I mean, we rode all over. Okay. We rode all over. <coughs> all right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this starts off with non-pertinent information, but the heat is really up still. So he's he's adapting still. He's doing all of his usual stuff, squeezing and rubbing and swirling in the chair. But now he starts to talk about conditions. He starts to condition everything he says with, I believe. And that's a cutout word because I can always say, well, I said I believe. I don't know. No, maybe I was wrong. That's not the way people typically do it. This is, leads him to say, I believe I was, that's not a lie and all that kind of stuff we've heard from him. But he really rocks. He really rocks when they ask him about Chevrolet and talking to OnStar. Because if you don't know what your car is tracking, it's tracking everything, just so you know that. If you're not aware of that, unless you're driving something really old, your car's tracking everything. We've, I've had a friend who had an accident and they were able to tell exactly what happened before the accident. He goes back to his normal speech patterns. No more, no more phrases, long sentences on non-pertinent information about riding the property. But when he's asked about the river, or I think it's the river he asks the questions for, he loses his ability to construct a sentence. What happened down there? What caused all this? Might have started there, don't know, but something changed. And then he changed. And then he goes back and he interrupts himself with, I believe that we. That believe is part of his defense later. That's my opinion. Scott, what do you got? All right, he's locked down. He does move a little bit more than he has been, a, a lot more actually. But, and those are just signs of stress. That's all I'm going to add to that because I'm trying to stay on the body language thing. I really didn't get into the what he's saying back and forth. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, let me just dig into the central theme of, of all of this and, and why it confuses me as to the theme that you'd choose if you were innocent. He spent, I don't know how long this interview has been going on now, but he spent all the time defending his position, answering in some way, and by often not answering or I don't remember, but, but you know, committing to the interview that's going on rather than saying, stop these ridiculous questions. I, I'm nothing to do with this. Find the people who did this or person who did this to my son and my wife. And if they continued asking these questions, then going, you two are a bunch of idiots. And I want you out of here right now. I want a senior, I want the most senior person at this station in the room with me right now. And I want this dealt with. That's where I'd be at this point, because I wouldn't have killed my my wife and my son. I don't know. Well, I do know why he's not there, because he's done it. I mean, that's why. That's why he's only and 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 so you know, as as a fundamental rule, if he's spending all of this time defending himself when he could just go, shut up the both of you, I'm nothing to do with this. Get me somebody who's an investigator in the room. If he's not going down that route, I gotta wonder why. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I think uh Mark, you stole my notes on this oh. one. <laughs> <laughs> this I'm sneaky. <laughs> this is a pronounced focus. I'm just going to like summarize what you're saying just so people can get this. There's a pronounced focus on innocence and the, a disappearance of a person who might have done this or a desire to find out what really happened. There's no desire there. And this is plain and simple to diagnose. This is where all attention of law enforcement should be placed. And it's so rare to see this in innocent people. This kind of behavior is so incredibly rare that I'm going to make an unprecedented statement here that if you see this, 
This alone has the potential to serve as the guidepost for where law enforcement should be paying all of their attention. If you see behavior like this in this clip. The eyewitness is you. And then Randy saying when you left at six, you were still there. I'm just, I'm trying to understand. You know, I, I left the office earlier than I normally did. What's, you your, know? what's your normal time to leave? I mean, it's not unusual for me to be there till dark. You know, I try to get home when Maggie's home, you know, before dark. She's not like staying out there by herself in dark. That's right. So, you know, if it was 5.30 or 6, I, you know, I don't think I was still there at 6 o'clock. Okay. But, um, you know, if I was, it wasn't long after that. Okay. So, you know, I went... I believe that I went straight home. So, you know, my car, have y'all been able to get Chevrolet to download my? We're still working on that. Okay. That's a long process. Well, I mean, I got home early enough for Paul and I to ride the property for a substantial length of time you know more than an hour i thought probably a couple of hours okay. that we were together but somewhere took her down the river we rode down um all the roads i believe i believe that we i mean we rode all over we rode all over. <coughs> you know, we've already established family guns were used. And if they came from Paul's truck, Paul's truck was at the house. So where where were they? And how did they get down there? Yeah, how did they get down there? I mean, it, it's normal for y'all to leave your keys in the cars. However, if somebody showed up and did this, you're not going to take Paul's truck back to the house and leave the key in it. I mean, do you know that the, the guns were in the truck? I mean, could they have been somewhere else? They could have been somewhere else. I mean, he wasn't taking, he didn't have his normal truck. And I understand that Nolan Tootin believes he saw the, uh, the gun um, three weeks beforehand. Mm -hmm. And I haven't talked to him, but is, is it, is he believes it was the one that, not the one that was at the house. seen a 300 since March after turkey season. Okay, well, somebody... 
All right, Greg, what do you got? So he's heated up here pretty good because he does a couple of things I've never seen in the interrogation room. One of them is he tries a fig leaf while crossing his legs. And I said, he's doing a Sharon Stone leg cross moment. If you're not old enough to remember the Sharon Stone movie, Basic Instinct, he does a big move like that. And it's just not something you see every day. That's over the top. What we see often in people prior to confession, I don't mean right as they confess, but as they're headed toward the confession, is they get this locked down as he is here, their chin drops to protect their throat. Look at him, compare his chin now back to one and see are we seeing any of that deviation. But what we see then often is their feet hunt the door and that's a predecessor. And then we put the pressure, pressure, pressure. Then we give them silence, let them simmer a little bit. And then we go for the close. I'll bet if you could see his feet, they're pointing for the door already at this point, just to tell us what's going on in his head. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, it's nothing but an agreement with what you've said. The the only note that I had here, because for me it seemed the only thing of, of big consequence, is his hand is now tucked right in at his groin area, protecting those primary sexual characteristics. I think that's a deviation from everything that we've seen so far. Yes, he's been locked down. Yes, he's been protective. But he's now shielding these knuckle joints in his legs and his primary sexual characteristics at the same time, you know, something is is up. Something is a little more extreme. Scott, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I think this one's really interesting because this is the fastest uh, bobbing back and forth we've seen so far. And his breath rate is up. His, he's breathing. He's breathing faster and deeper. And that's and that, I think that's a dramatic change at this point. His voice tone and his Diction, they're the clearest they've been so far, clearest and cleanest. And I think this is because he got a little adrenaline pop during this. And he's realizing there are even more things he didn't work out properly. So he's having to slow down and think about what's happening and what's happened so far. He's still got all these parts of the story swirling around his head, trying to get that stuff worked out. And again, he doesn't have the answer for these questions. So his stress level is is through the roof on this compared to what we've seen so far. And his lawyer can't even help him. And his lawyer's got his, his legs crossed as well, which I thought was interesting. But the, it's opposite of of uh, Murdoch's. So I thought that was, that was, anyway, pretty interesting. Greg, what do you got? Oh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree completely. And if if somebody if you see somebody having trouble completing a sentence the moment a murder weapon is introduced to the conversation there's something happening there's something maybe significant going on and if the person also then corrects you on the caliber of the weapon so that it's not involved with the crime that might also be a big deal and that's all i got the eyewitness is you you know, we've already established family guns were used. And if they came from Paul Strug, Paul Strug was at the house. So where where were they? And how did he get down there? How did they get down there? I mean, it, it's normal for y'all to leave your keys in the cars. However, if somebody showed up and did this, you're not going to take Paul's truck back to the house and leave the key in it. I mean, do you know that the, the guns were in the truck? I mean, could they have been somewhere else? They could have been somewhere else. I mean, he wasn't taking, he didn't have his normal truck. And I understand that Nolan Tootin believes he saw the, uh, the gun um, three weeks beforehand. Mm -hmm. And I haven't talked to him, but is, is it, is he believes it was the one that, not the one that was at the house. Some type of seven millimeter rifle. Yes, sir. 
Do you have that one at home? Yes, sir. That's what he saw? That's what he saw. Because I was, I was told by somebody that no one saw a um, 300. He's, he told me he had not seen a 300 since March after turkey season. I have to go where the evidence and the fact that I understand that. And you think I killed Paul? I have to go where the evidence and the facts take me. And I don't have anything that points to anybody else at this time. So does that mean that I am a suspect? You were still in, like I told Corey earlier, you were still in this. With everything that we've talked about, with the family guns, the ammunition, nobody else's DNA. I have to put my beliefs aside and go with the facts. Talking with Mr. Griffin, there's one sentence after. That. I'll go first on this one. Uh, this is the classic uh, non-contraction of the denial. And so when he asked if he killed his wife, he said, no, I did not kill my wife. And he doesn't say, no, I didn't. Instead of saying, no, I didn't, he says, no, I did not. Now, I've I've come to the point in my life where, where I see that sometimes as that person may be making sure they get everything about that that statement correct, and they're trying to ram that home. So that's why they don't contract. So I think maybe in in this situation, I'm kind of on the fence about this one. It's non it's non contracted, but it didn't. The flow of it isn't the one isn't the the flow you usually see when somebody says no, I did not. It was very slow. It was very da da da. So I think he's he was ready for that, and I think he was um, he's trying to make sure that point gets across. I don't I don't think it's um, a, a subconscious or you know a non conscious situation there. Um, so these days I'm, I'm, I'm on the fence about all that. And this is one of the things that puts me on the fence about it. Um, yeah. Cause I thought about that for a long time. Um, I think this is, I think that answer is probably rehearsed. I think at some point he said to himself, cause he hasn't been able to discuss it with his lawyer. Cause like, I think you were saying, were, Greg, were you the one that said, do you think he's, uh, chase chase? Okay. Yeah. I think you might be right. I think he, he told the guy he was innocent. Yeah, I guess you you have to say that you didn't do it so they can, you know, in some cases, depending on your relationship with them. But I would think knowing this guy's personality and the people he hangs out with, I think he may have told the guy the truth, you know. So, I, you know, dirty hangs out with dirty, man, birds of a feather. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think this was beautifully executed by the, the, the detective. At the end, he says, I have to put my beliefs aside and go with the facts. There's this little tether of trust you must keep between you and the person you're talking to. Because as soon as they're under the impression you're not there to help them, then everything changes. I know in this room, it's it's like a, you know, a party in there. There's so many people in there. But you must keep that thing, you must, you've got to keep that trust thing happening there so they'll be able to, to confide, you know, feel like they're confiding you. He's not going to confide in three other people, you know, in three people. He would have done it with one. But and I think you're you're right in this case. There there's three people in there. It's 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 not going to happen. And you can see that I think from the beginning that that it's not going to happen. But it, but the but the detective detective I really think he does a great job in keeping that little tether man keeping that still strong by saying uh, what he said. And if if somebody out there knows this guy the the detective or you or you know how to get a hold of him, yeah. please 
have them get a hold of us and, and get a hold of us at the behavior panel at gmail.com. The behavior panel at gmail.com. And if there's no you in behavior, that one's already gone. Well, we guess we had to get the one with no no you in it. So it's the behavior panel uh at gmail.com. Have them email us here if you would. And or if you see this, go ahead and email us there. Chase, what do you got? So we're seeing this classic nodding uh, again throughout this. And look at the spots when the nod, I just want you to, I'm not going to tell you where it is. Look at the spots where the nodding spikes, where it gets to its, its peak point. And there's question repetition with psychological distancing. So he's not saying the name. He says, my wife this time. And he uses the officer's name this time during a denial which is way, way out of baseline as for this entire long video. It's out of baseline. His body is freezing, which means that he's not really adapting or doing anything. He's completely locked. So we're not seeing a whole lot of movement. Then there's the non-contracted denial there, but we're seeing that non-contracted denial also added with partial repetition or what, what we call in my training repetition of a question fragment which is repeated with the denial. No, I did not kill my wife. And then he's still nodding. And with every other denial that was truthful, he had a very positive head shake like this, but he's still nodding in here, which this is a rare case where those are out of baseline. It's uncharacteristic. So this head nodding means something during the denials it or potentially does. And this is not necessarily he's doing a great job here uh but this is not how a classic trained confrontation is supposed to go granted the attorneys in the room so it's a little bit different and there's actually a six-step protocol to make a direct confrontation to another person and let them know they're a suspect or you don't believe them and not uh i don't think any of those six steps are in this clip but one huge one from that protocol is using the suspect's name especially during this time when you want to develop that little line of trust that Scott was talking about, that's when you want to lean out there and use that person's name. And that's when, you know, Scott is a big fan of kind of reaching out, touching their knee and saying, listen, I think you're a good person. And I just want to figure out, you know, why this happened. And, you know, maybe you were out of your mind or whatever, but I'm not blaming the officer or the detective here at all. The interrogation uh, that a lot of people receive is pretty minimal, but I know he's doing his best, and it's a damn good job. And I'm not uh, discounting that he's extremely good at what he does as a detective there. Uh, Greg? Yeah, so let's talk for a minute about that thin line of trust or whatever you want to call it. Everything we do, I contend, is based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And for me to get you to give me something or to want to do something for me, I have to create a new sense of belonging. And the magic of what we do, whether it's elicitation or it's interrogation, any of that is based on me creating a new normal where you belong to a tribe I belong to. And that's exactly what you have to do. If I am screaming and yelling and throwing stuff at you, you're not going to do anything for me. You might do it for someone to get away from me. So all those tools, even if you are calling a person a liar, even if you're going at them, it's about keeping that thin line of trust, as you called it, Scott. So I'll, I'll call it the same thing. That thin line of trust creates a new normal where I can then approach you and make you feel guilty for lying to me or make you feel guilty for not being coming forward with some piece of information. So let's talk about what's clear here. The very first thing he says is, no, he just does a fading facts. He reminds me of our friend Candace Bly on Dr. Phil. No, just disappears. But then he restates after he repeats the question, did I kill my wife? He does that non-contracted denial. We've been hearing him use phrases a lot. And now this non-contracted denial. I mean, you Scott, it doesn't always mean something except when it does. His chin is down. We usually associate with shame, not up and defiant. We usually associate with indignant or that kind of thing. That non-contracted denial on his son. He There's a politeness spike. No, sir, I did not. When he does, did you kill Paul? It's interesting that all this works. Scott, we were at Dr. Phil and they gave me the disclaimer. And Scott said, oh, you can tell who's in the military because they asked me a question. I repeated the question as I affirmed it because that's the way my brain works. That's not the way his brain works. But listen to him do it here. He's doing it here very specifically. Sounds like me disclaiming. And then after he's told he's a suspect, his eyes drop down to his left, which we associate with internal conversation, and then down into the right. 
which we associate with emotion and then lip compression. What we know is pre-confession body language is locked up, locked up, locked up, go down into this kinesthetic, down left, down right, down left, down right, and then they open. Well, he's not going to open with somebody sitting beside him who is part of his Maslow as long as there's a, a room full of people and especially one of them, somebody he's associated with, he's not going to confess in a crowd. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so look, I think the key to critical thinking is to be agnostic about absolutely everything. And so you're right. Anybody is right to be on the fence about any one signal. And all we're doing is going, look, we're on the fence about everything until the enough mounts up that if you went to the casino, what would you gamble on the accuracy of your judgment based on being on the fence about everything until the information piles up? And that's just being intelligent, which is ma not making snap judgments because your instinct does that on its own. It, like it doesn't even need to eat to do that. Your instinct takes microwatts of energy, whereas your intelligent brain that does critical thinking, it's like a, it's, 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 a 40 watt light bulb of energy to get that going. So you do have to be comfortable. You got to eat enough in order to get that working. You don't do critical thinking by accident. You do it on purpose. And we're getting so much information here mounting up that puts us in the direction of, of he's been up to something. It's not good news for him. I want to put on top of that. We then get his lawyer doing lint picking, which is, you know, where you, take some piece of dust. Uh, he's not doing it from his lapel, by the way, but he's doing it on his knee. I'm just showing you that so you can see it. And, and it is often a show of indifference, a show of there isn't enough power out there. I've got time to make sure there are no flies on me. There are no, there's no dirt on me. I don't, I'm not feeling the stress and pressure uh, outside in this environment. Well, interesting that this lawyer who is attached to, to their client, they have a relationship with their client that the others in the room don't have. It's meant to be a supportive relationship. And you've got this person with the supportive relationship doing lint picking at this point. Now, do we know what that means? Like we, we know it tends to show indifference. Is it him going, oh, now would be the time to get rid of this client? Uh, you know, I'm going to be indifferent to my relationship with this client. It could be that. That's quite a nice idea. Or is he signaling to the others in the room? I don't think you've got anything, you know, or is he signaling? You've got something there. You're onto something, but I want to show you that you have nothing. I don't know which, which one it is. I'd have to turn to the person and go, Hey, what's going on for you right now? What's going on there? Look, let's couple with that. Um, we now get the subject leaning forward <clears throat> and saying, do you think I did it? Well, this is compounding what's happening. And this is a question I believe that would have been, if somebody was innocent, they'd have asked right at the start, right at the start, they'd have gone, do you think I, what, what's this about? Do you think I did it? If they said yes, then the person would have gone, okay, what evidence you have? Because I didn't do it. Like, let's get through this for, because we need to go and find the person who killed my wife and my kid fast. Cause I want justice. And none of that has happened clearly. Uh, not a good, not a good show going on here. I think that's all. The eyewitness is you. Thank you, man. Yeah. I just saw uh, a few more questions. Okay. Did you kill Maggie? No. Did I kill my wife? Yes, sir. No, David. Do you know who did? No, I do not know who did. Did you kill Paul? No, I did not kill Paul. Do you know who did? No, sir, I do not know who did. Do you think I killed Maggie? I have to go where the evidence and the facts take me. I understand that. And you think I killed Paul? I have to go where the evidence and the facts take me. And I don't have anything that points to anybody else at this time. So does that yes. mean that I am yeah. a suspect? You were still in, like I told Corey earlier, you were still in this. With, with, with everything that we've talked about, with the family guns, 
the ammunition. Nobody else's DNA. I have to put my beliefs aside and go with the facts. So, Mark, so far, what have you seen up to this point? So far, I believe what we've seen is some of the most interesting and subtlest indicators in an any interrogation that we've looked at as to what's going on, the battle that's going on. Both these parties uh, are doing a great job to attack and defend under a lot of pressure for both parties. And I think what we've picked up on here is some real subtleties of what's going on, indicating that continued battle. Chase, what are you seeing so far? So, so far, I think this is one of the first, if not the first interrogation videos that we've analyzed where every single video contains massive red flags. It's normal for us to get some, but in this one, it is incredible, like every video here. And I, this, all these videos are a testament to how important psychology is in interrogations. And I think the interrogator did do a great job. It is, I cannot imagine the insurmountable uh, task of interrogating a former prosecutor with his attorney sitting next to him. There's somebody else, maybe one of my senior people, what it took, from what it looked like, sitting next to me. Uh, so that would be really tough. And he brought up all the key elements of the scene, and I'm no detective by any means, so I know that's its own entire area of expertise, but I will certainly be using these for training uh, in in my classes. Greg? Yeah, so far what I see is this is a guy on a fishing expedition. He's in to figure out what they know. Now we know that he has done a lot of heinous stuff by now. We know all the facts that came out in, in the court case. But without that, without the ability to see what's going on in the interrogation, you might miss all of this because the subtlety of body language, the mistake of coming in locked down and trying to resist interrogation like you think people do, and then watching it unfold as an interrogator does his job is powerful. I think what we're seeing here is some places that gave them a place to drill down when they went on the stand. I know that I would go after that crux question for sure. You also saw some stress up to now working on the pro on the person who is asking the questions. Interrogation is a complex thing. It's an art form and it's designed for the person sitting across from you. I think he did a good job, all things considered with a person sitting. And again, we've said this many times, we'll say it again, love to have you on the show, love to talk to you, love to know more about what you were thinking when you're doing this. Scott, what are you seeing? Yeah, I agree. I, I hope he does. Hope somebody gets a hold of him or he he hears about this and and comes and talks to us. That'd be awesome. Uh, I think so, I think this is a great example of of seeing someone go through the process of not sure if they're going to get in trouble or not to being pretty dang sure they've had it uh, or th that everyone's on to them. I think they that's a great a great example of that. And I think the uh, detective did a wonderful job of that because he kept his cool and he never really, he never changed from that little plane he was riding down that little, just flat and right there. I think, I think he did a great job uh, doing that, but we did see a lot of little things that you, that we usually just blow right by because there's so many big things happening in an interrogation that we can point out and the little things become boring. But in this case, it was all the little things that were huge that made such a big difference for this one, I think. All right, fellas, I think this is another good one, and uh, we'll see you next time. The Behavior Panel. What would you guys say if he asked you, do you think I did it? What would be your response? I'm curious. You know I got my note here says, I'll do all the question around here, Bubba Louie. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say I'm not sure yet. That's, that's, the, that's the one... This, you think I did this? Oh, I'm not sure yet. That's, why I'm, that's what I'm here to find out. We're going to find out what happened. Yeah. You know? no, I, I would do exactly what this guy did. Look, if you cross that line in this investigation, you don't get the chance again. And in my opinion, when you do that, you have to do what he did. He said, I'll let the facts speak. I'm just here to collect information. That way you're not turning into the bad guy and you're not adversarial because there may be another opportunity and you can't do it if you – determinations in interrogation are about maintaining the relationship and you have yeah. to be really careful. That's what I would do. I think I'd, I'd say, I'd you know, the, the, go ahead, Chase. I think I'd say, you know, Rob, uh, 
I, I'm not here to to make that determination, but I've been doing this a long time, and it certainly doesn't. You don't seem like the person to do this kind of premeditated thing. And if if that is the case, or if something did happen, I definitely don't think you meant to do that. Well, if he said, "Why you call me Rob?" <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Isn't his name Rob? Didn't, didn't he go no. by Rob? Alec. Why did I say Rob. No, Alec is what he calls himself. Alec. Oh, Alec. Isn't there an X on the end of his name? Yeah, yeah but they yeah. say that Alec. That's right. Doesn't matter. Oh, my God. Can he call himself Murdoch? Too. We heard him call himself Murdoch once, and then he goes to Murdoch. Then I hear him say Murdoch. Yeah. Hell. It's a Scottish name. Pronunciation can go all over the place. Hmm. Mark's called him Murdo. <laughs> at the top. Murder. <laughs> Murderer. <laughs> there's a there's a, a joke me and my uh buddy jason rosalie talk about he was the he, he was uh head of, hom of homicide over at west precinct in nashville and when i first moved to nashville i was walking by this mini mart me and a buddy of mine and there was a lot going on there was there was a uh, uh they had it roped off and the cops were they were walking by and and there was a news guy there right and as we're walking by i go i go hey man what's going on he goes there's been a murder like that. Like there's been a murder. And that's been sort of our, we've gone that's back funny. and forth for years. Every time I see him, because what's going on, I always go, there's been a murder. And he was so when, when we were doing the, yeah, sorry. No, that's it. When we were doing the Dr. Phil thing, I realized how dark our sense of humor is because the juror was in our room and we were watching videos and I was like, Hey man, sorry. Our sense of humor is a little dark. <laughs> oh, anyway. yeah. Uh, yeah, it is. So here's what I do, yeah. Chase. I'd uh, to that question. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd throw my friend under the bus. I'd go. I'd go. He, he, thinks, he thinks you definitely do. Yes, which is a, that's a great way to do it. That's a yeah. great way to do it. But like he's like, and I can't convince him otherwise. He's definitely yeah. like he Good wants. Cop, he, bad cop. he wants you hung. Yeah, and that's he's DOD do it himself straight away. Department of Defense uh, top interrogator qualities number seven. Uh, interrogator distances themselves from authority figures. Yeah, that's yeah, threat and rescue. Is the, I, yeah, so the sorry for, I felt so sorry for that little guy, uh, Greg. <laughs> Mary, we, we were in there and he was in makeup yeah. and he was he was welled up. He's about to cry. We were like, what's wrong with this cat, man? And then uh, Tina, she just was, nervous. my makeup person, yeah. she said, he's really, really nervous. I had to tell what, tell what he said, Greg. He said, what's going on, man? Yeah, he said, is he going to grill me? And I was like, no, man. You're like <laughs> you're like the star of the show today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're an he innocent so member of the public. All right, check it out. So we're in Dr. Phil's dressing room. Okay. This place is something. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Let's go in here. We'll see that. Look at the rest of the room. Make sure we get it all. Oh, that's a gratitude sign. Yeah. Come here. Yeah. Look. Stay nice in place. there. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> You're selling it, Craig. Yeah. Look around. Look that's at this place. Real nice place. Oh, wait. Now, let's take a look at his cars. Look at that. You can oh, see that's, that's his car. And that's that's her Robin's car. car. That's Robin's car and his car. Same thing out this window here. And then come around this way. Yeah. Come back this way. You can see his. Look at the uh, office. There's here. that. Here's the office. Yeah, it's you a great, see. great office. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> so he loves it in here. Hey, call security, will you? I got some riffraff in the office. What do you got? Today we're going to talk about Alex Murdoch. He is on, or Murdoch, however you pronounce it. He's on the stand, and Greg wants to tell us about the videos we're going to watch. So he took the stand as a defense witness, and this is a very finite set of the questions that he responded to in Cross. You're telling this jury that that's what happened, and you were back at the house at 849, and you lay down on the couch and dozed for a second, and then you were up with more steps in a shorter time period than you had done all day. Well, I mean, your number is 849. What I'm telling this jury is that I went down there, and when I took that chicken from Bubba, I would have said something to Mags. I got back on that golf cart, and I drove back to my house. After getting back to my house, I went inside, and in short order, I went to the couch. That's what... I'm telling this jury. Did you go anywhere, anywhere else in the house? Mr. Waters, I can't tell you specifically about that. I, I don't think so, but I may have. 
Did you have that tan blackout and a 12 gauge shotgun on that golf cart when you drove down there? No. You didn't? No. Did you see them when you were down there? No. No. So we got you back around 849 and you're leaving at 902, correct? And you didn't see any weapons down there. You just happened to be back there. You didn't hear anything at all. Did you hear anything at all, Mr. Murdoch, during that time period? No, I did not. You didn't? Didn't you tell law enforcement that you thought you heard them pull up? Didn't you tell law enforcement that? I did think they had okay. pulled up. All right, so that was that you did think that? Yes. All right. So now you're saying there was a car pulling up? No. You didn't testify to that yesterday, did you, in your new version of events that no, I, you I don't construct? Mr. Waters, I don't believe there was a car pulling up. Okay. But that's what you told law enforcement, didn't you? No, I told law enforcement that I thought they had pulled up. Okay. All right. But you're saying you couldn't hear blackout shots, supposedly, but you could hear that, correct? I didn't say I couldn't hear blackout shots, but I'm saying that I thought when, when I got up from taking a nap, if I took a nap, but when I got up from laying down, as I was getting ready to go to my mom's, there was a point in time where I thought Maggie and Paul had come back. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so my understanding is he is part of an established family there in that area, established in the law. I don't know whether he or any of his members of the family have ever been mayor of the area. Scott, I can tell you this, he's definitely the mayor of Qualifier Town. In the, get your T-shirts, <laughs> get your T-shirts in the store. Uh, he says, I'm what I'm telling this jury, that's... That's not, that's a qualifier. What I'm telling this jury doesn't mean it's necessarily the truth or a fact. What I'm saying, uh, I would have, um, if I, um, I can't tell you specifically, and I don't believe. Lots and lots of qualifiers. I'm just giving you a, a few there. That is a signal there that there's not necessarily some accuracy or truth going on. What's the other signal left in there for me? Uh, when when he's cornered about the idea of he couldn't hear anything, but surely he heard the police car, we see him reel back and he starts adapting on the microphone there. That is moving the microphone. He doesn't need to do that. And so I think that's a true adapter to the stress of being cornered. And also, I believe we're going to see this time and time and time again throughout this when he's put in a corner or under some stress and pressure. Uh, that's all I got on that one. Scott, what do you got? All right. I think this is answers as, as prepared as it can be. He, of course, being a former prosecutor and, and being in that world, we're seeing two, uh, form, a, a real prosecutor and a former prosecutor go head to head. So we're seeing a lot going on here. We're not seeing um, any huge cues of stress right now. His blink rate's pretty low. And there's not a lot of illustrating from the extremities. You know, not, a lot, not a lot of of moving around with his hands and arms. And some are going to say those nods when he was saying uh, uh, of yes, when it should be no, are accused of deception. They aren't. Those are what I call confirmation nods when he's saying no, but his head's going yes. Now, had they been small, if he said uh, no and his head had gone like this and kept going, that's a different story. We see a little bit of that, but that's not – it doesn't mean he's lying or telling the truth. But if someone in another situation – similar to this, is saying no, and their head goes like that. <clears throat> According to Paul Ekman, that is one of the things you want to look for to make sure you're, you're dealing with someone not being deceptive. We see a couple of short shoulder shrugs as he goes through this. Obviously, he's not going to be as confident with what he's saying because he's on the spot. A lot of people are watching now. He's aware that everybody in the world is probably watching this, or so many people are. But I still think there's a questionable step going on here. Um, all right, that's, that's all I get. Chase, what do you got? So I'm going to approach this by what's missing in a lot of these videos. So we'll, we'll just follow. I'll use this uh, behavioral profiling template for the rest of the videos that are coming up as well as this one. And there's something missing here. And it's a denial of circumstances is what we're seeing here. He's not denying anything else but circumstances. So his story is not about what happened. And he says it himself. It's not about what happened. His story is about what he's telling the jury. And one thing, Mark, you you nailed it. He says, I would have said something to Mags. He didn't say that he did. And if this did happen, I would have said something to Mags. I don't think that's there. 
And when he's asked about the shotgun and the rifle being on the golf cart, this is strange and unusual head nodding may very well be a confirmation nod. Let's keep taking a look and see what, you know, where his nods are, where his head shakes are, because somebody to just say one thing means one thing. We may be uh, looking at something else. We'll take a look at the next one, though. But this is unusual for him uh, based on his behavior in the police vehicle and a few other videos. But it doesn't, I don't think we're seeing that meaning deception by itself at all. So, Scott, I do agree with you. And people do it all the time. He doesn't very often. Greg? Yeah, <clears throat> so a couple of things. One is he's clearing up details for a reason because he admitted that he had lied about not being at the house at the time of the murder. He was supposedly away. Now he's coming back and his ploy, as in his testimony, was to tell you how pathetic he's been in the past for stealing from clients, including quadriplegic underage people and all that. And to say, yes, and I lied and, and, and. Now, let's see how that works out for him in the long term. I'm also going to tell you there are two examples of the organism doing what the organism has made the organism successful in this video. One of them is him doing over and over. And one of them is me because I didn't prepare for this. I'm watching these videos and telling you what I see. And so this will be you getting as close to cold as I can get. There is a place where his blink rate does increase when they say, where else did you go in the house? Well, if he's running around and picking up weapons to go down and do something, he would probably get a little blink rate increase around that. There's also a couple of things that you listening to him may find interesting, dis and dat. This is an educated guy who talks that way. And you may say, well, that doesn't play well for him. Well, it may very well play well for him in low country. And Mark, to your point, he's part of a long legacy of prosecutors. Like 1920 to 2006, his family held the office of solicitor, which is prosecutor there. And he is an assistant prosecutor, which means he has a badge. Now, we said before he wasn't somebody who said he's not. He is. He's in, he has badges. He has been a volunteer in that program. You also, if you'll watch him, he, he says a hard no when they ask him about the blackout and the shotgun, because those are the murder weapons. So he's prepared that. Scotty does your loping. I can tell he's prepared because he's telling. Boom, 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 boom. Until, and Mark, that's you with the downward intonation. That's telling until they start asking questions. And then his pattern, his cadence, his everything shifts he came here to tell a story, and when he gets the chance, he does tell that story. What's interesting to me is when he was telling the police hours after the murder of his wife and son, who's had been blown out, and he found him on the side of the road, he or on the side of the building, he had no grief whatsoever. Now it's suddenly got a grief muscle when it's about him on the stand. Could be Botox, and he hasn't had any, but I don't think that's what it is. I think we're seeing something different, and I just think what you need to pay attention to is all that. Scott, you brought it up early, all that prosecutor, all that attorney language we're going to see here. But Mark, you're dead on. He's going to qualify. He's going to ask and parse facts and make the question what he wants to answer. That's all I see. And you're telling this jury that that's what happened. And you were back at the house at 849 and you lay down on the couch and doze for a second. And then you were up with more steps in a shorter time period than you had done all day. Well, I mean, your number is 849. What I'm telling this jury is that I went down there, and when I took that chicken from Bubba, I would have said something to Mags. I got back on that golf cart, and I drove back to my house. After getting back to my house, I went inside, and in short order, I went to the couch. That's what I'm telling this jury. Did you go anywhere, anywhere else in the house? Mr. Waters, I can't tell you specifically about that. I, I don't think so, but I may have. Did you have that tan blackout and a 12-gauge shotgun on that golf cart when you drove down there? No. You didn't? No. Did you see them when you were down there? No. No. So we got you back around 849, and you're leaving at 902, correct? And you didn't see any weapons down there? You just happened to be back there. You didn't hear anything at all. Did you hear anything at all, Mr. Murdoch, during that time period? No, I did not. You didn't? Didn't you tell law enforcement that you thought you heard them pull up? Didn't you tell law enforcement that? I did think they had okay. pulled up. All right, so that was that you did think that? Yes. All right, so now you're saying there was a car pulling up? No. You didn't testify to that yesterday, did you, in your new version of events? That no, I, I don't. Construct? Mr. Waters, I don't believe there was a car pulling up. Okay, but that's what you told law enforcement, didn't you? No, I told law enforcement that I thought they had pulled up. Okay, all right. 
But you're saying you couldn't hear blackout shots, supposedly, but you could hear that, correct? I didn't say I couldn't hear blackout shots, but I'm saying that I thought when, when I got up from taking a nap, if I took a nap, but when I got up from laying down, as I was getting ready to go to my mom's, there was a point in time where I thought Maggie and Paul had come back. But you never told them all this new story that you've constructed in light of this trial, is that correct? I did not tell them that I went to the kennel. I lied about that. And at the same time, you also looked at this jury and tried to tell them that you had been cooperative in this investigation. Uh, other than lying to them about going to the kennel, I was cooperative in every aspect of this investigation. Very cooperative, except for maybe the most important fact of all, that you were at the murder scene with the victims just minutes before they died. Right? I did not tell them that I went to the kennel. Chase, what do you got? So I'm going to leave body language out of this for right now. So I want you to consider something from a profiling only perspective. So if someone's family members are killed and they want to find out what happened, what reasonable or sane person would lie about their story? So what are the circumstances where immediately after a murder or an incident like this, a person decides to lie about their day? So in a lot of cases, guilty people are going to admit to one lie so they can appear to be coming clean. We might call this a micro or a mini confession. And this sometimes serves to alleviate this natural human desire to confess. And this admission about lying makes guilty people feel like they're admitting fault. And unconsciously, they believe that they're shaping how we see them. So if they're coming clean about this one thing, they must not be guilty. So that might be something that we're seeing here. And this is just a tremendous red flag that the, the lie is there existing in the first place. Mark? Uh, yeah, so he is very good at not answering with yes or no answers as the prosecutor is trying to rally him in, into simple yes or no. Uh, he'll tend to repeat the question back in the opposite of how it's been put forward. I did not tell them that I went to the kennel. Again, not contracted. So very clear and uncontracted in telling you the opposite of what he's being rallied into. And I think that's that's purposeful. He knows what the prosecutor is trying to do, get him to say yes or no answers. It's going to be simpler to, to put him in a corner if he'll do yes or no. Let me just pick up on one element of body language, which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, you're right, Greg, that we had we didn't in the um, in the first visit with the police see any forehead action. We got a lot of forehead action here. So we've got to think to ourselves, well, is he is he putting it on to show concern or is he actually concerned and under pressure? In order to work out which one it is, I would put alongside that that his his chest is very concave at the moment. Shoulders are in, chest is concave, protecting vital organs on the body, as we we often say. So I might bias towards the stress. The stress in the forehead is potentially real stress at this point, not a concern that he's putting on for the audience. Now, I, I could be wrong. It could be the opposite. But all I'm saying to you is, look, I'm trying to put information together to come to a best a best guess conclusion and then always test my guesses. Test my guesses about what else do I see? What else do I know? What do my friends around me think it is? What do other experts around me think it is? So at the moment, I would bias towards he's, th though he's used to this situation from not the, the side that he's on at the moment, but the other side, though he's used to that court, he's not used to being here. He could be under real stress and pressure here. Uh, Greg, what do you think? What do you got on this one? Yeah, let's start off by talking about the liar's loop, something Scott and I have in the, in the True Crime Workshop. But the liar's loop says you get a trigger and then you got to fabricate and then you get to, you deconflict inside your head, then you pitch, then you get challenged. Now, when you get challenged, you have to defend. And then what happens to you is you get in a spiral. If, they, if the questioner is doing a good job. 
Well, he had time between the time he actually executed, let's assume he killed her. He had time or his family. He had time after he killed to fabricate for information while he was waiting for the police and 911. Now we're going to hear a lot of really interesting details as we go. So he's deconflicted that stuff in his head and chase what you're talking about, I think is a pave, kind of a paving stone. If I flip this paving stone over, you won't check the rest. We'll say there's where the problem is. And what he's doing, I always call that trading guilt. He'll throw out some guilt that read, it's an ultimate redirect. Look, I lied. I lied. I'm sorry. I lied. And you redirect to there. We'll find out later when he said he lied. And interestingly for the four of us, we all saw it when he was in the car. We knew something changed. All this red flagged his baseline deviation. And he admits that's when he decided to lie. But interestingly, he's got all that grief muscle, the concern, all this stuff showing up in his head. And we say grief muscle is the arch, but these muscles actually are part of that. And that grief muscle is a combination of five muscles. I want you to listen to the difference in the way he responds to the first two questions. One is telling, boom, 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 and the other is halting and shifting as he goes through it. So something has changed in the way he is responding to the two questions. He's got something there that he did before. Um, that's good enough. I'll just leave it at that. And Scott, what do you got? I think right here, um, his story didn't work. So he's trying to come in, he's coming with something else and it's messed up his timeline. So he's having to go back and try to correct that. I think that's part of what's given the stress here as well. But at the same time, he's so focused on that prosecutor because his blink rate is low. His eyes are a little bit wise compared to what they've been in the, in what we've seen up to this point. And uh, when he has that direct eye contact, when they lock, it lasts even longer. I mean, it, between blinks. So I think that was really interesting. Uh, he doesn't use any illustrators at all. He's really still. And that's, that lets us know something's up here because he's really careful about what he's saying. He has to catch everything perfectly because this could be the question that sends him to the pokey for the rest of his life. That's what I got. But you never told them all this new story that you've constructed in light of this trial. Is that correct? I did not tell them that I went to the kennel. I lied about that. And at the same time, you also looked at this jury and tried to tell them that you had been cooperative in this investigation. Uh, other than lying to them about going to the kennel, I was cooperative in every aspect of this investigation. Very cooperative, except for maybe the most important fact of all, that you were at the murder scene with the victims just minutes before they died. Right? I did not tell them that I went to the kennel. And then you would agree with me that from 902 to 906, your phone finally comes to life and starts showing a lot of steps. I do agree with that. What were you doing? I was getting ready to go to my mom's house. Getting ready to go? I thought you took a shower already. You were just laying down on the couch. What, what all you need to do to get ready to go to your mom's house? Uh, I mean, there wasn't anything to get ready in, in that aspect, wasn't but anything to get ready, I was, was getting it? ready to go. I was preparing to leave. Do, doing what? I don't know if I got up, uh, went to the bathroom. I don't know. I can't tell you exactly what I was doing. And that's far more steps in a shorter time period than, than any time prior, as you've seen from the testimony in this case. So what, what were you so busy doing? That's Going to the bathroom? No, I don't, I don't think that I get on a treadmill? went to the bathroom. No, I didn't get on a treadmill. Jogging place? No, nope, I didn't jog you in jump place. Jacks? No, sir, I did not do jumping jacks. What were you doing, Mr. Murdoch, for those four months? Preparing to leave for my mom's house. What? What does that mean? I mean, you're in the front room on that couch where you say you laid down. The Suburban's just right outside. What all are you doing? I don't know if I got up and went to my room, went to the gun room, doing went back in that. Doing what? You've been so clear in your new story about everything. What, what were you doing during these four minutes? I, I disagree with your assertion about every detail. I don't recall. I know that I was getting up and I was leaving. I was going to check on my mom. But specifically what I was doing, I don't, I, I don't know. Okay. I know what I wasn't doing, Mr. Waters, and what I wasn't doing is doing anything uh, as I believe you've implied that I was cleaning off or washing off or washing off guns, or putting guns in a raincoat, and I can promise you that I wasn't doing any of that. Okay. All right, Greg, what do you got? 
Yeah, there's a couple of things in this one that are interesting. Scott, you always point out, you know, he's do it does a single shoulder shrug and he raises his shoulder. He points his chin toward it when he says, "Didn't go to the bathroom." Well, I go clean out the traps in that bathroom and find what I found there. I don't know if they did that or not, but that's usually where you'll find evidence because people are not smart enough to unscrew the J trap and flush it out. So you'll find evidence in there, and that whether that's DNA from whatever's going on or whether you find blood, uh, he has a grief muscle we see in the beginning of this, but he's got. Request for approval, his forehead up, and eye lock at all times. Very low blink, just really good eye lock. What we always refer to as a romancer. He's paying, well, there's nothing romantic about that stare. That's, I think you said, Mark, he looks like a predator following him around the room. When he talks about the treadmill, he has a lip compression. So there's some withheld information there. You got to wonder why. And then, um, he, you know, uh, let me, one last thing. Yeah, Mark, you pointed out he's hollow. This is in the South. If you look at old pictures, and this is a big man. He, I think he's 6'4". Mm. And if I would have described him before all of this as corn fed to use Southernism, he's a big old boy. And <laughs> he lost all that weight. And so his clothes are different and he sits different because he's accustomed to holding all that weight and holding it differently. I think it's part of why we see that posture shift. Uh, Scott, what do you got? I agree with you. He, he, he seems like one of those guys that would like sit around his house in a kimono, a kimono and his underwear all the time. It's, you know, answering the phone and cooking and stuff like that. But he came over, he put his clothes on real quick. Anyway, so now 283 steps doesn't sound like a whole lot, a whole lot of steps. But if you try to walk that off in your house in about four minutes, that's a whole lot of steps happening right there. I mean, that that actually is a lot. And what I think was happening there, I know we're not supposed to say, here's what I think happened. I think he's walking around going, oh, no, oh, no, now what do I do? I got to make sure everything's covered. Oh, oh, you know, no, you know, on the phone, calling people, all that stuff. Because he's got a couple of phone calls in there. So I think there's a lot going on there. I think he's uh, he's walking around in a panic because he's just done all this stuff. So he's, he's up and running around. Uh, he continues pretty much with the same body language, the verbal delivery, and just a little bit more illustrating, but not a whole lot more. And the prosecutor's trying to get him all worked up, and it's slowly but surely working because we see him start to get a little bit tense. We do see some stuff in, the, in his brow. But again, that's I got some theories about what's going on up there, but I'll, I'm going to save them for a little bit. And again, I think the great part is we're watching these two attorneys sort of uh, battle each other, and they've they both got their glasses on. They're looking down their noses at each other. So there's no reason for 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 Mur Did you say Murdoch or Murdoch? He says Murdoch. Is which one is it? Does it matter? I don't think it matters. I think it's a local pronunciation. Local pronunciation. Yeah. Local pronunciation. yeah. yeah. All right. Anyway, so he's got his his all the way down to the tip of his nose. He's not even using them. I haven't seen him use his glasses yet, but he's looking down his nose at, at this attorney. And I think that's part of that psychological thing they've got going on back and forth. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I, I agree, Greg. He um, He's really locked uh, his target there. Uh, there is a what you might call a predatory gaze. And Scott, you were you were bringing that up. I, I was just agreeing with that. Um, yeah, predatory gaze there. He knows where the the um, the target should be, and where the conflict uh, is going to come from. Uh, yeah, I, I looked up his height as well, uh, Greg, because in order to work out how much ground you can cover with that amount of steps, you need to know the height of the person because the human bodies are 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 um, you know that is how that's how tall I am. For example, if you hold your hands out like that, the distance from your fingertips is how tall you are. It doesn't work for you. Okay. No, I'm maybe about six foot six reach. Okay. Some people, some people are slightly shorter in their legs or longer in their legs. It, it, it depends, but it, it kind of roughly works. So with that amount of steps, you can cover, you can cover around about easily a quarter of a kilometer uh, in distance. Now, if you're going up and down steps or things like that, it won't quite work out, but you could cover a lot of ground as a six foot four uh, guy uh, in that amount of time you're going at quite a pace and you're going at quite a crack there anyway uh, all of that aside what interests me most is that he answers via the negative all the time this is what i wasn't doing that day i didn't do that i disagree i don't know i don't recall um i, I didn't go on the treadmill it's all via the the negative i can promise you what i wasn't doing that day rather than promising you what he was doing that day and that's important for trying to convict somebody of something because you can't convict people on what on the negative you can't prove and you can't prove what isn't there you can only prove what is there so he 
He really knows what he's doing, I think, in this situation. Now, whether it will pay off for him and whether people can see past that, it doesn't really matter whether jury can see past it. They need positive evidence of something, not the idea of, of something that wasn't happening, I, I would suggest. So no specifics at all, just themes, the themes of I was getting ready to visit my mum, uh, I was going to check on my mum, that's a theme. And he says no specifics and he rejects all implications that come. So all of that to say, he's tough to pin down. He's tough to pin down because he won't answer questions only in the negative. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I agree with you. One thing here, though, you listen to him talk in the beginning of this clip. First, he suggests he might have gone to the bathroom. Then when opposing counsel asks him about going to the bathroom, he says he probably didn't go. This is just weird. All the details here and the filling of gaps shows us something interesting. He's uncomfortable with uncertainty. People who are being honest about not remembering will often have no problem at all reasserting that they're unable to remember. And they'll most often just make a firm stand and a confident statement that they don't remember. I don't remember. So they're confident because they aren't hiding anything. So remember this head shake thing. In this clip, every single denial about the treadmill, jogging in place and all that, he knows for sure these things are not true. You see a perfect uh, horizontal head shake uh, each and every time. Then when he's making a denial at the end here about cleaning off guns, you see a definite nodding as he denies this. This might indicate two potential things. I'll let you decide. One, he's nodding for confirmation to the jury to confirm because he kind of looks that direction. Two, there's a gesture mismatch potentially of possible deception. And as a quick note, if you ever want to just kind of defeat an interrogator, the phrase, I don't remember, is the most difficult thing for people like us to overcome and deal with. Maybe I shouldn't say. No, one more one more thing. If, if he was in an interrogation and that bathroom thing came up, Chase, all they got to do is use the bait question there and say, hey, listen, because they've already been in search of this place. They could say, hey, listen, man. Is there any reason whatsoever that your DNA or their DNA would be in your bathroom? Any blood, anything like that? You know, any any reason whatsoever? Now, they could have been in the house and been in there earlier and stuff, but you can make up something like how fresh it was or how new it was, because he's not going to know the details on that with the way tech is these days. So that's that's one thing they could have gone down the road there. What are you going to say, Greg? Yeah, I believe he lives on a septic tank. There's a ton of opportunity to find stuff. Because yeah. anything that you wash down the drain goes straight in the septic tank. So yeah. don't know. Don't know if that's what they've searched. But I didn't hear any scientific evidence. Don't know. And then you would agree with me that from 902 to 906, your phone finally comes to life and starts showing a lot of steps. I do agree with that. What were you doing? I was getting ready to go to my mom's house. Getting ready to go? I thought you took a shower already. You were just laying down on the couch. What, what all you need to do to get ready to go to your mom's house? Uh, I mean, there wasn't anything to get ready in, in that aspect, wasn't but anything to get ready, I was wasn't. getting ready to go. I was preparing to leave. Do, doing what? I don't know if I got up, <laughs> went to the bathroom. I don't know. I can't tell you exactly what I was doing. And that's far more steps in a shorter time period than, than any time prior, as you've seen from the testimony in this case. So what, what were you so busy doing? That's Going to the bathroom? No, I don't. I don't think that I get on a treadmill. Went to the bathroom. No, I didn't get on a treadmill. Jogging place? No, nope, I didn't jog you in jump place. Jacks? No, sir, I did not do jumping jacks. What were you doing, Mr. Murdoch, for those four months? Preparing to leave for my mom's house. What? What does that mean? I mean, you're in the front room on that couch where you say you laid down. The Suburban's just right outside. What all are you doing? I don't know if I got up and went to my room, went to the gun room. Went doing back in that. Doing what? You've been so clear in your new story about everything. What What were you doing during these four minutes? I, I disagree with your assertion about every detail. I don't recall. I know that I was getting up and I was leaving. I was going to check on my mom. But specifically what I was doing, I don't, I, I don't know. I know what I wasn't doing, Mr. Waters, and what I wasn't doing is doing anything 
uh, as I believe you've implied, that I was cleaning off or washing off or washing off guns, or putting guns in a raincoat, and I can promise you that I wasn't doing any of that. Okay. Do you know why so many phone calls were missing from the log around this relevant time period when law enforcement downloaded your phone on June 10th? From my phone? Yeah. No, I don't. Did you delete them, Mr. Murdoch? Not intentionally. Just around the time of June 7th, all these calls are missing, but you had nothing to do with that between June 7th and June 10th. No, sir, I did not, mm -hmm. and I did not delete phone calls from my phone. <coughs> Mr. Waters, one of the most important things in this whole thing for me has been getting this data that I believe would exist. Phone calls and phone records um, would be part of that. I've been in enough civil cases and used phone records enough times to know that you delete a phone call from your phone, it doesn't disappear. So I can tell you, this jury, and everybody who's listening that I did not intentionally delete phone calls from my phone. Yeah, because you started talking about the, you're, you're a former prosecutor. Correct. And former lawyer doing civil cases. We went through that yesterday. And boy, you're busy bee on that phone and right out of the gate at 902, right? Objections overruled. Am I a busy bee? Yeah. I, I am using my telephone at, I think I call at 905, I start and call my dad and I agree that I made other phone calls. And one of the first things you start talking about with law enforcement is these calls that you made to Maggie. Correct? You remember, recall that from your first statement to law enforcement? One of the first things that I said to law enforcement? Yeah, that's one of the things you talk about. I'm talking about with your interview with Special Agent Dave Owen. I don't remember that being the first thing we talked about, but first things. if Mr. Owens asked me about it, then I... No, you brought sure. it up, didn't you? I did. You don't recall? No, I don't, I don't recall. Yep. All right, Chase, what do you got? It's just a sea of what, what we call non-contracted denials where I, I did not, I do not, instead of didn't or don't. And secondly, he's saying, I can tell you and I can tell this jury, I can tell you. It doesn't mean that he's saying that at all. So that when anything comes up, they're essentially, well, I didn't say that. I just said that I could say that. So this is a kind of a backing out. When he says not intentionally, the blink rate goes into a huge spike, what I call a context spike. So this is a key moment where I would be looking for it and we're seeing a big little, a uh, big mountain of, of blink rate there. And then he goes in right still at this spot. When he's saying not intentionally, there's shuffling in the chair, which is not a common behavior for him. There's immediate adapting and uh, adjusting this mic. And there's this discussion of the first things he's saying to the police here. And one thing we've seen since the beginning of this case is that every effort that's made is focused at his innocence, his story, his timeline, his suffering, and his personal tragedy. And the minuscule amount of time that he spends vaguely and softly suggesting that he'd like to find out who did this is washed out here by his fear of shrinking the pool of potential suspects. So either he's got no concern for who did this or why they did it, which in itself should be horrifying, or there's a chance he's very sure who did this, and his career in law in law has just convinced him that the facts win cases. As a lawyer, he got convinced that facts win cases, that if he could just inject enough facts, his emotions aren't relevant whatsoever. Scott? All right, he's so nervous that when he says not intentionally, he moves forward because he's trying to get that point across that the not intentionally part that his chin hits that mic. And that's how intense this is for him because he knows this is important. He's trying to stay calm, but as Joe Navarro says, you can have a poker face, but you can't have a poker body. So no matter how calm he's trying to stay, his body is telling us everything that's going on, most everything anyway, because he's doing a great job of, of um, trying to stay calm, but he's not doing very well because this is the most animated we've seen him yet up to this point. His stress level is really starting to rise up because that uh, attorney is poking at him, making him 
getting him mad, trying to make him angry. And it's working. It's working for him. He tries to get his old his old status as a prosecutor and attorney. He's trying to use that to say, yeah, I know that if you delete phone, you know, delete phone calls off your phone, you can see it. On. But when he was thinking about doing this, when he was planning this out, he didn't think it would go that far. He didn't think they'd say, oh, you, you know, you're going to be in trouble for, for, he didn't go that far. That's what he was doing. He's walking around his house, freaking out, deleting phone calls and things like that on his phone. That goes back to those 283 steps. I think that's what was going on there. And again, we see more head, torso, and arm, arm movements in this clip than anything up to this point. So his his stress level is rising, and he's getting a little bit angry at this point. I think that the uh, prosecutor is doing a pretty good job on, on firing him up. Greg, what do you got? And this is a really good one because he does some distancing techniques a couple of times. He repeats the question twice. He says, my phone? Well, no, that guy's phone. What the hell do you think I'm talking about? Number one. Then when he gets to the second one where he says the first thing, first thing we said, and he chaffs and redirects. And Scott, I think all of his talking, and for those of you who don't watch us all the time, chaff and redirect comes from an aircraft throwing flares to get missiles to follow the instead of the plane. Same idea. If I regurgitate enough stuff, I used to be a prosecutor and I know when I know, and then he redirects and he just hides in all that garbage that he's throwing out there. There's some social signaling here, and I'll talk about that in just a minute, because he is in his element still. Regardless of what you want to say, he's still in South Carolina. He's still in a place where people understand the way he speaks and all those things. While he says, my phone, and he starts to deny, look at that head shake, or that head shake is not like anything we've seen to now, where he usually does this, Chase, you pointed out earlier, there's a quick... Like if you ever see a dog when they're nervous, they move rapidly. You're seeing that with him. So we know he's under his skin. We can see that happening. He interrupts himself to start to throw out some guilt in there when he starts to talk about, well, I know, and I didn't do that. Maybe I mistakenly deleted it. There's a, Chase, you would call it a vanishing perpetrator. Somebody's had his phone and been deleting messages, I guess. So he's saying, no, 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 I was so confused or whatever. So he gets away from it. But he edits as he speaks there. He then repeats that question. And when he says the first thing, he doesn't even answer the question. He does a really slick redirect, say not the first thing we talked about, that's a redirect. So it gives him the chance to, for you to have to ask a second, third and fourth question to get there. He touches his chest at one point, and some of us are gonna say probably if you think culturally that could mean something. If you're from low country, South Carolina, and people do this when they say something and they're being genuine, he may do that to persuade people. In the Middle East, it's common for people to put their hand to their chest when they're being honest or when they're being sincere. Same thing could be true in low country. I would venture to say probably there. You know, we are all Southern boys are raised by Southern women, and a lot of Southern women will do that in that process. And finally, I'd say this. This guy has a legacy, a long legacy, where his family has been the prosecutors or solicitors in that area for 100 years. He's been involved with it. And everybody in that culture in that Maslow is going to recognize him as somebody, a big fish in that pond somehow. So whatever cultural signaling he's sending that we aren't even aware of is going to impact their decision-making ability and how they perceive this situation. Why would this powerful person do that is what he's trying to signal out. And that's a, that's a survival thing. Now they chose to put him on the stand and for him to go in and say, yes, I stole from people. And yes, I did this. And yes, I was a drug user. And no, I don't know where $12 million went, but that doesn't make me a murderer. If I'll concede these things, why wouldn't I concede that? Chase, we're back to what you were talking about earlier. And back to where I said, if you flip the stone over, they'll stop looking and say, oh, oh yeah, yeah, he's a liar. He's a thief. He's a drug user, but he probably didn't kill his family. I think that's what we're seeing. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so if you go back to our previous episode on this guy, you'll notice that we recognized in the car that the phone was going to be an issue, that there's something incongruent with some some kind of call in there. And here it is coming up. And here it is. We are seeing that extra pressure and stress come on him at this point. Chase, you're right. Facts will win the case. Well, when I was studying logic, here's what I understood to be a fact. For a fact, you need um, sensible data. By sensible data, that means it has to be sen sensed. You've got to be able to touch it, taste it, smell it, uh, see it, hear it. And for it to be a really good fact, you need at least three separate pieces of sensible data. And he, so the guy says, look, you know, these records just don't disappear. 
Yeah, but if you eliminate one of the pieces of sensible data, you may be only left with another piece or two more pieces, and it's harder to form a fact for a jury. So you well know if you can destroy some elements of sensible data, you diminish the idea of somebody having a fact in front of them. They can maybe still get a fact out of it, but does it really convince a jury? So I would say he's clever. He knows what he's doing here uh, with this missing log because he says, um, you know, he didn't, he didn't, well, did you delete them? Not intentionally. So probably you deleted them. Probably you did. They're certainly deleted, aren't they? They've certainly gone. And I don't know who else has access to the phone. And I'm not sure how you delete these things unintentionally. I mean, it's possible. It's possible. But now, look, look what's happened. We're into the realm of possibility. And possibility isn't fact. And we want facts in order to uh, convict somebody. Uh, around this, we get the microphone adaption, just has been said before, we get eye blocking, we get swinging from side to side. One more I'll add to that is we get a, a shoulder barge as well. The shoulder just moves forward and barges forward with that. So I think you're right, Scott, he's getting he's getting more aggressive as we go forward. We'll see that escalate going forward as well. There, that's all I got on that one. Do you know why so many phone calls were missing from the log around this relevant time period when law enforcement downloaded your phone on June 10th? From my phone? Yeah. No, I don't. Did you delete them, Mr. Murdoch? Not intentionally. Just around the time of June 7th, all these calls were missing, but you had nothing to do with that between June 7th and June 10th. No, sir, I did not. Mm -hmm. And I did not delete phone calls from my phone. Mr. Waters, one of the most important things in this whole thing for me has been getting this data that I believe would exist. Phone calls and phone records um, would be part of that. I've been in enough civil cases and used phone records enough times to know that you delete a phone call from your phone, it doesn't disappear. So I can tell you, this jury, and everybody who's listening that I did not intentionally delete phone calls from my phone. Yeah, because you started talking about the, you're, you're a former prosecutor, correct, and former lawyer doing civil cases. We went through that yesterday. And boy, you're busy bee on that phone and right out of the gate at 902, right? Get the comments. Objections overruled. Am I a busy bee? Yeah. I, I am using my telephone at I think I call at 9.05, I start and call my dad, and I agree that I made other phone calls. And one of the first things you start talking about with law enforcement is these calls that you made to Maggie, correct? You remember, recall that from your first statement to law enforcement? One of the first things that I said to law enforcement? Yeah, that's one of the things you talk about. I'm talking about with your interview with Special Agent Dave Owen. I don't remember that being the first thing we talked about, but first things. if Mr. Owens asked me about it, then I... No, you sure. brought it up, didn't you? I did. You don't recall? No, I don't, I don't recall. Would you dispute me if I said you brought it up? Did I brought up what? Brought your up phone, what? Mr. Murdoch, your phone. Phone calls to Maggie? Yes. That I brought up phone calls to Maggie to David Owens. I'm asking you, is that one of the things that you talked about in your first interview with Dave Owen? That you pulled out your phone and started looking at it, that you brought that up? Do you recall that? Well, but that's not what you asked, Mr. Owens. You, you asked me, was that the first thing that I talked to him about? And that was the discrepancy. I certainly don't dispute that Mr. Owens and I talked about phone calls. But that's not what you said, so just right. to be clear. Well, the real reason, Mr. Murdoch, is that you as a lawyer and prosecutor are up at 902, finally having your phone in your hand, moving around and making all these phone calls to manufacture an alibi. Is that not true? That's absolutely incorrect. So that's just another circumstance and coincidence in this particular case right around the time that you lied to law enforcement about maybe one of the most important facts in the case. 
comment before the question. It is an absolute fact that I am not manufacturing an alibi, as you say. How do you remember so much detail about everything else, but you don't remember what you were specifically doing to generate 283 steps while you're making these, all these phone calls in the same four minute period? I remember unequivocally, without any doubt, with as clear a mind as I could have mm -hmm. at any time that I never manufactured any alibi in any way, shape, or form because I did not and would not hurt my wife and my child. So why can't so you I know for a what fact you were doing? That I never, ever, ever created an alibi. Why don't you remember what you were doing when you were so busy for this four minute critical period? I do other remember what I was, I was doing. Other than I was getting ready to go. Well, that's because that's what I was doing. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so let me follow this logic idea just because it interests me and I hope it interests all of you uh, as well. What we've got here is, is, and I think why it's kind of confounding the prosecution as well, and there feels to me to be a bit of a stalemate on at the moment, um, is there's a bit of black box thinking here going on. Uh, and I get this from a, a client that I have who um, his, his, his industry, his job, is there are transactions that get done in the financial industry in what's called a black box. It means you can't see what happens in there. And the reason you can't see what happens is if you knew what was happening, you might be able to do it faster than the person doing the transaction. So what he does is, is he looks outside the box and predicts based on looking outside the box what's going to happen in the box and if he can do it faster he manages to do the transaction before the transaction happens and you make a lot of money doing that well what this guy is saying is saying look i'll tell you what isn't happening inside the box but i won't tell you what is happening inside the box and he says that by going um uh I can, it's an absolute fact that I was not, it's an absolute fact that I was not doing X. Well, number one, the, the, the founder, one of the founders of objectionism, uh, objectivism, Ayn Rand said, you cannot prove a negative. In fact, you cannot be brought into court to prove a negative. Here he is going, I'm gonna tell you as a fact what isn't in the side, the box that you can't see into well that's almost impossible to argue other than the way that i've just argued it with you right now and were you interested do you get it i mean could a jury get that could a jury go oh i see what's happening there i i mean it's just confounding and so at this point for me i think there's a real stalemate on i'm not saying that this guy is is the brightest person ever but he knows enough to cause a stalemate and cause a problem in this case. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so you guys know I'm, I'm not as sophisticated as Mark. I'm not gonna talk to you about the black box. I'm gonna talk to you about fencing in a pig because this guy's <laughs> got a pig to talk about here. And he's what he's gonna do is by the time you get to his pig or his ugly baby or his whatever, he's gonna have shown you enough beautiful things that you forget how ugly his pig is. And what he's doing with words like emphatics, all these words are about absolutely and no way. And I can tell you absolutely what I did not do. He, he gets to very few facts right there in the middle. I didn't kill my family. So he's got lots of room to talk, lots of space there to get to those words before he actually says anything. And then on the backside, he does more of those words. So that's wrapped in this beautiful wrapper, no matter how ugly what the thing he's talking about is. Interestingly, the way he goes about it, his guy asks him a question, and there's a lot of one-upmanship going on between two attorneys right here. You can't miss it. I often hear people say, this looks defensive. And I say, yeah, if that looks defensive, does that look defensive suddenly? No, because I'm looking down my nose at you. And if I'm standing over you, it's powerful. And that guy's doing it. He's looking over the thing and down his glasses at him. So there's a competition between the two of them. This guy forces the prosecutor to rephrase his question three times. Well, that's building the fence. What he's doing is building a wall around the question he's willing to answer. And when he gets down to the end, he is ready for it. And Mark, he's down now to where his shoulders are down. 
His hands are between his legs or somewhere down there. In Chase, we talk about it all the time from fight or flight. He's created an exoskeleton, but make no mistake, he's not in full-blown fight or flight. What he does, you can tell when he gets to the point he's in charge because his voice tone changes. Now I got you in my box. My pig is safe. Scott, what do you got? How do I follow that? All right. His, <laughs> ang his anger is coming into play here even more because his voice volume goes up. His, stones, his uh, tone is stronger. His cadence is sped up a little bit. And again, like you were saying, Greg, they're, it's two attorneys fighting, man. They've got those glasses down, looking at each other. And like I was saying earlier, Marduk doesn't even use his glasses. I mean, he's not reading anything. He's not, he's not holding them up and doing that and putting them back on. He's just got him on to do that, I think. Also, let's start paying more attention to his forehead. And let's see how that, that knitting of his brow, what's happening with that. Because we see anger there as those things come together and they push down like this. Now, if we'll pay attention to his eyes as well, what's happening is when someone gets mad or they pretend they're mad at you and they, they frown and their eyes all squint at you, that's fine. They're not that mad. Take it from me. When someone's sitting across from me and they're getting all mad, there's a, there's a way you can look at it and say, this is real or it's fake. And what you're looking for is when they start squinting their eyes, they want to, they'll start opening them a little bit as they're squinting. It'll look like they're opening them at the same time. Gives them that crazy look that you see in movies. That's what you're looking for. That's how you know if somebody's really mad. Then their face is going to get all red. Just to, to go over here just for a second. Their face will get all red and it's going to go pale. And when it goes pale, that's when they're coming at you. That's when their brain said, okay, we're going. Because all the blood is run from, from the face out to their muscles and their arms and legs because they're coming across the table at you. Or they're going to do whatever they're going to do. So that's what we're seeing here is the eyes are getting a little bit wide, but that's because they're squinting a little bit and we're seeing the inside, the inside part of that get wide. That's why he's got that, that nutty look on his face. And when he's, again, when he's talking about talking on the phone, when I, when I have to think about something, I get up and I'm one of those people that gets up and walks around in circles and talks and I got to cross my arms and I do this a lot when I'm thinking, I always touch my face and do all that. That's what I, I really think that's what he's doing in there. He's what I think the, the prosecutor nailed it. I think he's in there walking around, maybe not in a panic, but close to it because that's a lot of steps. Doesn't sound like a lot, 283, but in that short amount of time when you're on the phone doing that, that's what he's doing. He's walking around, deleting those phone calls, walking around in circles, I would imagine in circles. Uh, also, at the end, he's he uses severity softening when he says, I would never hurt my wife or child. That's severity softening. We see that quite often when someone's done something like this they shouldn't have, and it's horrible. They won't say, I didn't kill my wife and my child, or I wouldn't kill, I wouldn't kill anybody. I didn't kill them. No. They say, I would never hurt them. Well, would you ever shoot them? Would you ever shoot either one of them, both of them, out of the kennel? It's a, that, that's trying to make it sound not as bad, what he did. That's why they do that. It's a subconscious thing quite often. Sometimes it isn't. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. This morning when I was watching this, it was 5 a.m., sun hadn't come up yet, and I reset my step counter, and I did 288 steps Me in too. this hotel room here, and it's it's a lot. It, it took me a minute. So I, I just wanted to recreate it and see what that actually was like. And in this video where he says, absolutely incorrect, this is another perfect head nod with a confirmation glance. Uh, to the jury. And there's some severity softening. Scott, you talked about he uses hurt. And paired with that is psychological distancing. Without using the name of wife and child, he just uses wife and child, doesn't say their names. So this lessens the internal feeling of severity. So like instead of steal, somebody might say take. Instead of murder, they might say hurt, like Scott was saying there. So people who are innocent are more likely to use the more severe words to illustrate and show you the severity of what happened to their family or what happened to the victim. And also the severity of what they saw, the memory that they saw. If they're not the killer, they want you to understand how severe it is. So those words are more likely to come out in one area, way less likely, which is why, in my opinion, they're more reliable than a lot of things. And also in this sentence, no use of the victim's names here, so we'll call that psychological di distancing. And this is common for guilty people, and I believe it might help to lessen uh, the stress of the denial. Both of these, when compounded with the other behavior we've seen, just turn black. Good As God. we're seeing this, it's we're seeing a career attorney, career attorney who's lived his life using facts to win forgetting that emotions play way more of a role in court than lots of other stuff.
Would you dispute me if I said you brought it up? Did I brought up what brought your up phone, what? Mr. Murdoch, your phone. Phone calls to Maggie? Yes. That I brought up phone calls to Maggie to David Owens. I'm asking you, is that one of the things that you talked about in your first interview with Dave Owen? That you pulled out your phone and started looking at it, that you brought that up. Do you recall that? Well, but that's not what you asked, Mr. Owens. You, you, you asked me, was that the first thing that I talked to him about? And that was the discrepancy. I certainly don't dispute that Mr. Owens and I talked about phone calls. But that's not what you said, so just right. to be clear. Well, the real reason, Mr. Murdoch, is that you as a lawyer and prosecutor are up at 902, finally having your phone in your hand, moving around and making all these phone calls to manufacture an alibi. Is that not true? That's absolutely incorrect. So that's just another circumstance and coincidence in this particular case right around the time that you lied to law enforcement about maybe one of the most important facts in the case. Comment before the question. It is an absolute fact that I am not manufacturing an alibi, as you say. How do you remember so much detail about everything else, but you don't remember what you were specifically doing to generate 283 steps while you're making these, all these phone calls in the same four minute period? I remember unequivocally, without any doubt, with as clear a mind as I could have mm -hmm. at any time, that I never manufactured any alibi in any way, shape, or form because I did not and would not hurt my wife and my child. So, why can't so you I know for a fact that I never, ever, ever created an alibi. Why don't you remember what you were doing when you were so busy for this four minute critical period? I do other remember what I was, I was doing. Other than I was getting ready to go. Well, that's because that's what I was doing. Well, let's keep going. You made those calls to Maggie in that four minute period. You had just seen them a few minutes ago when you say you went down there and came right back. Why didn't you just take that quick little left 1100 yards away and stop by? See why they didn't answer the call. You're obviously wanting to get in touch with them. Why didn't you go down to the kennels that were so close by? There was no reason to. I mean, Mag You're making multiple missed calls to Maggie, and she's so close. And there's a driveway right there. Why do you not just go down there and say, hey, guys, I'm heading over there? It, it wasn't important to do that. Me, me making those phone calls is simply me letting, I believe I called Maggie, and I believe call, I called Paul. But that, that, that's simply me just letting them know that I'm leaving for a minute, I'll be back. The fact that, that they don't answer is not unusual at all. Now, it is odd, it is unusual that they never call me back. Um, and, but, but at that moment, the fact that there's a missed call, when, when I know they're on the property, I mean, that doesn't even register at all. That's perfectly normal to try to call somebody who's on the property and not be able to get them. And, and as far as not going down there, uh, there, there was no sense of urgency. Maggie was with Paul. You know, she should be as safe as she could be. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this in the beginning of this, we see this attorney or this prosecutor lean in doing that thing again. That's your parent berating you. That's not a questioner. That's your parent saying, where were you tonight? I know where you were and going in at you. And this guy sees it. He's got a grief muscle and a blink rate at no need. We see that grief muscle come in when he says there was no need to go in. And we say that's that little horseshoe arch there. And his blink rate increases as he says that, but only when he's not making eye contact. 
And we say that a person when they're concentrating or when they're focused on something that I, that blink rate decreases, when he goes back to that romancer kind of personality where he only has eyes for the prosecutor and he gets eye lock, the blink rate disappears. Really interesting. We could say that would be a pro that could be processor speed. I don't think so in this case. I think it's stress. I think he is going back to pay attention. And then his brow does a really weird thing that they didn't answer. It isn't a request for approval. It isn't a quick flex up and hold for a second and drop. It just, there's something fleeting that crosses his brow. Look, does it mean anything? Don't know. But it's different than what we've seen up to now. And being a baseliner, when something is that different, I really want to poke in. And I would have said, hold, hold on. Let's talk about that for a minute. I don't know what's going on in his head there, but it doesn't matter. He is adapting with one hand. As he says, not abnormal. He adapts. And we say that's you touch, you groom, you may do any kind of repetitive behavior to release nervous energy, but it's also relaxing. And he's doing a one-handed batter on deck. He's rubbing his thigh, it appears, from what I can see. That's a way to release, release nervous energy. And then he gets to this, she should be as safe as possible, or some words to that effect. You know, some mouth grooming thing. Well, she should be, but if your son is no longer there, then she can't be. So who knows what those words mean, but those two fleeting brow change and that mouth are really big deviations from baseline. So I want to dig in and understand why. Chase, what do you got? Yeah. Overall in this video, there's something missing. So we'll go back to this. In every single video that we do, I'm asking one question first. So when I sit down in the morning to look at these, I only look at them about one time. And I ask this one question above everything else, what's missing, concealed, or hidden in this clip? And in this clip and throughout the others, there's missing regret. Innocent people will almost always express regret, wishing that they could have done something differently. I wish I would have done that. And there's no regret that he didn't go down there. No wish to have the chance to do it again. So this uh, could have been avoided. Only just the communication of facts to support innocence here. And at the end of this clip, there's one of the hallmarks that I look for in every case. And this is called emotional dysregulation. So when he's saying uh, she should be as safe as she could be, I think that's it. We see anger appear on the face when he's trying to show sadness to the jury. And he even turns his face to the jury when he believes the emotion is finally showing up on his face. This happens when somebody's struggling to create an emotion to be persuasive. And a lot of times when this happens, the true emotion comes out instead of the one they're trying to convey. And this shows us the difference between displaying an emotion and feeling an emotion, which is a huge point right here. That's all I got. Mark? Uh, yeah, absolutely agree with that. Uh, let me take you through it from my point of view. It's an interesting battle that's going on here. You get the prosecutor at the start saying, let's keep going. There's a long pause and then a tired out breath. I think that's self-talk for him. I think he's saying, come on, keep going, keep going. I think he's getting tired throughout this because this is quite a battle. This is a, a tough character to get, get through to or get good answers out of as a prosecutor because he knows how to stick that pig in the black box or whatever wherever we're at with that Easy. one <laughs> with that one now put lipstick on the pig and stick it in a black box wherever we're at on that one now um and so and i think and so it, it, at the start of it i think wow the prosecutor is tired now he's on his back foot here however he does lean forward he does come back with with a good enough barrage of questions that i think you're right chase what the what the the defendant here decides to do is is drop logic or is his his try and try and defeat the logic drop that idea and go i'll show them an emotion and i think that's a baseline change for him. It's a baseline tactic change. I think you're absolutely right. He isn't able to conjure the emotion that he'd like to conjure. What comes forward is the true emotion, and that's anger for the prosecutor. So we get targeted eyes on the prosecutor. We get a top uh, lip very, very tight. We get the upper teeth showing. We get a heavy brow. The brow comes down and the head drops and we get some disgust in the nose as well. Enough information there for me to say he is 
angry and aggressive at the prosecutor. So at the start of this little battle, I think, ah, oh, prosecutor's on the back foot. Actually, it doesn't take him long to get the 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 um, the person on the stand there, uh, Murdoch, uh, on the back foot as well. So great to see that one. Scott, what do you got on this? I agree with you, Mark. And I think I think that happened at the beginning because he'd rehearsed this, this answer. I think in witness prep, he was ready for it. So I think that's what happened because it's so smooth there at the beginning. Everything's just going the way it should. Plenty of illustrators. That's, that lets us know that his, his stress levels drop. So he looks the way he should look. Everything looks fine. But again, let's start taking a look at that brow again because in the last 40 seconds of this clip, that brow is just as smooth as a baby's bottom. When you, when you look at it, nothing happening and look at the things he's talking about in there when he's doing that. Not, it shouldn't be that way. Also, when he says she's as, she, she was uh, as safe as she could be. Well, yeah, she was, as, I think he wanted to say she's as safe as she could be as if, you know, even if, like if I was there, well, we know how that turned out, but, but I agree with you. He got him, he got him uh, backed against the wall there at the very end. Like that, that was good. Well, let's keep going. You made those calls to Maggie in that four minute period. You had just seen them a few minutes ago when you say you went down there and came right back. Why didn't you just take that quick little left 1100 yards away and stop by? See why they didn't answer the call. You're obviously wanting to get in touch with them. Why didn't you go down to the kennels that were so close by. There was no reason to. I mean, Ma You're making multiple missed calls to Maggie, and she's so close. And there's a driveway right there. Why do you not just go down there and say, "Hey guys, I'm heading over there"? It, it wasn't important to do that. Me, me making those phone calls is simply me letting. I believe I called Maggie, and I believe call I called Paul, but. That, that, that's simply me just letting them know that I'm leaving for a minute, I'll be back. The fact that, that they don't answer is not unusual at all. Now, it is odd, it is unusual that they never call me back. Um, and, but, but at that moment, the fact that there's a missed call, when, when I know they're on the property, I mean, that doesn't even register at all. That's perfectly normal to try to call somebody who's on the property and not be able to get them. And, and as far as not going down there, uh, there, there was no sense of urgency. Maggie was with Paul. You know, she should be as safe as she could be. And she should so you're saying that you never called her and had a conversation that day asking her to come home specifically on the night of June 7th, 2021. Maggie and I had a couple of phone conversations that day. What I'm telling you did is you that before she question? left, no, no I, don't, I don't believe we had a phone call about that. We may have discussed it during the phone call, but I didn't make a phone call to her to ask her to come home. I had already told her I wanted her to come home. I always wanted her to come home. You heard Marion say that too, that I always wanted Maggie with me. Maggie thought enough of it to talk about it with Marion, didn't she? The fact that I wanted her to come home? Correct. Well, sure. I mean, that's what Marion said. So you're denying that you called Maggie and specifically asked her to come home that night? I didn't make a phone call to Maggie to ask her to come home that night. I asked Maggie to come home long before she ever left. And I probably asked her again each time I talked to her, but I didn't make the phone call specifically for that, as you're saying. <coughs> and to be clear, I'm certain that if Maggie was certain that she was spending the night Bubba would have been with her and probably Grady. All right, Chase, what do you got?
the, the question was about asking her to come over that night. And the bizarre response that we're seeing here is the result of fear. If you ask yourself what's missing or concealed, just that one question, you'll get the answer of clarity or honesty. Then you might wonder why someone who clearly and obviously asked Maggie to come over would be nervous or fearful about clearly and openly saying that this is what happened. What's truly missing is his ability to comfortably say he wanted her to come over. This is a gigantic issue here. The problem is with communicating intent, which would lead us to believe there's something that he's wanting to conceal about his intention to have her come over. It's clear, it's missing, it's concealed right here, and it's plain as day in something that should otherwise be innocent. There's no other explanation for this behavior, and his complete uh, lack of denial here just means that there's something extremely important being hidden about the intention to ask her to come to the house. Scott. All right. Now, uh, this, I'm going to talk about one thing here. First, let me define absolutist. An absolutist is someone who says every time somebody throws a quick shoulder shrug, then they're lying. Or every time they scratch their nose, that means they're lying. Or every time they do a specific thing, that means they're lying. There are no uh, true deception cues and somebody does so, it doesn't mean they're lying or telling the truth. Having said that, I'm going to say <laughs> most often, I think I found, a, I think I found something here. When we see that, that brow furrow like that, in that odd way, I think he's, I think that's when he's, he's being deceptive almost every time. I'm just going to talk about this one thing. Cause I'm horrified. I'm actually saying this is I did a whole TEDx talk on, on absolutism and how it's, it's, you know, how, why it bothers me. That's my soapbox. But when we're seeing this thing, almost every time he's being deceptive. And I say almost every time. So so make sure you pay attention to that part of it. But I think that's one of his cues of deception, because as he's trying to convince that eyebrow, go, the, the brow goes up like that in Greg's request for approval. But at the same time, he's trying to convey that emotion of sadness. And so we get this really weird look in his brow. That's what I think is going on. That's all I'll say about that. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, interesting. What you're seeing, I see as well. And the way I categorized it is this. Go back through this video yourself. Pay attention to when his brow furrows. When he's talking about his family, nothing, nothing, nothing. When an eyewitness comes up, all that stuff gets drawn. When you're being assaulted with a question, all that stuff gets drawn. But when he's talking about his wife, forehead's pretty smooth. We also know we have that study from British Columbia University that says that when people are being deceptive, often they'll try to show sadness in their forehead instead of it, it, or they'll try to show grief. And what will happen is that whole frontalis muscle will contract and give you a very different approach. So it could be that. But when I pay attention to it, I, I wonder why is there no contraction of that muscle except for when this guy is on him and bringing up this eyewitness. I think it's a confrontation between these two guys. I think part of it is because I'm a Murdoch. It, they started the entire thing. If I, When it first started coming out, I think he was on the stand for nine hours. But when I first watched the very first video, he said, aren't you from a legacy of? So he's establishing, this attorney established up front, you're somebody, and then he disrespects him. I think we're seeing that response to the disrespect, to the being pushed in a corner. I don't think it has anything to do with the people. I don't think it has anything to do with the case. I think it has to do with him. Just my opinion. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, a couple of things here that I really love about this. Number one is just how quickly things can change. Because in that last video, start of that, I thought the prosecutor was dead in the water. I thought, like, he's, go he's going nowhere with this. He's tired. He's out. And now he's really got this guy under, under pressure at this point. We're seeing lots of adaption on the microphone there. Again, doesn't need, there's nothing wrong with the sound. He's just trying to displace energy that's coming from the stress and pressure there. Um, we're seeing swaying from side to side. We're seeing lots of single shrugs as well. But let's look around that to see other elements that suggest something very, very different is happening here. Look at the foot of the guy that's behind the prosecutor. I don't know who this guy is. I don't know whose side that person is on, but I'm going to assume they have a good knowledge of what's going on in the court at the moment, simply because of where they're placed. I don't know who they're up, they are, what their job is, whose side they might be on or not, but I'm just assuming because of how upfront they are, they have some status there. 
and therefore some some knowledge, some intelligence of it. There is a point where the foot rises right up in the air. Now, a foot rising can mean a positive thing or a negative thing. Just as Scott says, there are no absolutes, but it's a massive change in that individual's baseline. Massive change. Go back, have a look at when that foot rises and what it's around and think to yourself, Why is that individual either very positive or very negative about what just happened? Because they know something has changed dramatically and there's an issue there which is either going to do well for somebody or badly for somebody. So you're saying that you never called her and had a conversation that day asking her to come home specifically on the night of June 7th, 2021? Maggie and I had a couple of phone conversations that day. What I'm telling you is that before she left, no, I I don't believe we had a phone call about that. We may have discussed it during the phone call, but I didn't make a phone call to her to ask her to come home. I had already told her I wanted her to come home. I always wanted her to come home. You heard Marion say that too, that I always wanted Maggie with me. Maggie thought enough of it to talk about it with Marion, didn't she? The fact that I wanted her to come home? Correct. Well, sure. I mean, that's what Marion said. So you're denying that you called Maggie and specifically asked her to come home that night? I didn't make a phone call to Maggie to ask her to come home that night. I asked Maggie to come home long before she ever left. And I probably asked her again each time I talked to her but I didn't make the phone call specifically for that, as you're saying. (coughs) And to be clear, I'm certain that if Maggie was certain that she was spending the night, Bubba would have been with her and probably Grady. And when you were asked by law enforcement how long you were at your mother's house. You said 45 minutes to an hour. Isn't that correct? I think I said a couple of different things, but I think at one time I did say that. But, you know, at, at, routinely through these things, I kept saying, you know, when you get this data, you'll see exactly. When you look at my phone, you'll see exactly. When you do, you know, so, you know, the, me giving the times was always given with the thought that, okay, that there's own star out there, there's whatever. But when you had a conversation with Miss Shelley after the fact, you actually asked her to say that you were there longer than 20 minutes. You know, I heard Shelley's testimony. I, I, I believe Shelley to be a good person. Uh, I wasn't trying to influence Shelly on any particular length of time because at, at the beginning of this, I believed that data would show what data would show. And for me to tell her to say something when my own star is gonna show something different just doesn't make any sense. So, you know, I, I can't answer that. What my recollection is, is that I told Shelly that, that law enforcement would be talking to her We may have discussed how long I was there. At that point in time, if I thought I was there 45 minutes, I may have said I was here 45 minutes, but, you know, I can't tell you. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is a really good example of what happens when a person has had a long time to deconflict and to be prepared to pitch and to defend that lie. Because what happens, and let's assume for a minute he's telling a lie. You know, we all have our opinions. But... And that's what all of this is, as Chase will often point out. But this guy is acting like his brain was operating just like it does today that night. Let's assume he did this. His brain would not be operating like it does because we have that switch in our brain that flips us into limbic thought or cat brain. And we're going to do something that seems natural. We're going to delete phone messages. We're going to say, hey, Chase, tell people I was here for 45 minutes. We're not thinking about on star. We're not thinking about that kind of stuff because our rational brain is not functioning our protective brain is functioning. So what you should know is that likely if he did this, he would not have thought of all those pieces, no matter how much he knows, because your rational brain is not engaged. I knew that. There's an interesting piece when he says, I knew that, 
and he starts to go into this stuff about um about OnStar and car data and that. Watch his blink rate. This is the first time he's had hard eye contact with the guy and blinked like crazy. That's a baseline deviation, which tells you something that he's keenly aware that that's not happening. And then he attacks the witness. I mean, those of you who aren't Southern might not understand when I said, I know she's a fine woman, but whether he said but or not, he just said but. That was passive aggressive language for I'm questioning whether or not she is being above board in that. I'll leave it at that and say, uh, Chase, what do you got? Yep, I agree with you. Uh, when innocent people are lied about, they get pissed off universally. And there's almost no exception to this. Guilty people have one major thing in common that's so predictable that it's almost a rule. They have a very hard time calling somebody a liar if that person is telling the truth. And innocent people will clearly, confidently, and comfortably call a lie a lie. His inability to say that's a lie should be scary here. And then he refers to the entire murder and the investigation as this thing, which I thought was extremely unusual. And I think what's interesting here is that we've seen no desire in every single clip for him to clear his name as fast as possible and move on so the perpetrator can be caught. No suggestion that the police should be looking elsewhere. And guilty people will very commonly fear telling the police to look elsewhere or find out who did this out of a fear of attracting attention, because that's a, an attention attractor to do that. And I'll just leave it at that. Scott? All right. At the beginning, he's showing lots of cues of discomfort because he's adjusting that microphone. He's moving around. He's doing his glasses. He's squirming around his seat. And he looks around, his brows furrowed again, and he starts using these stiff illustrators and he starts turtling at the same time. Something's up here. This real his his anger, of course, is growing again. He's getting stressed again, but there's something else going on in there. And with the second answer that he gives, he starts that swaying from side to side as he goes for that microphone again. Then we see him um, turn in a couple of those uh, short shoulder shrugs as well. So I think what's happening here is he's blending the truth with a lie, as you do in these situations, because some things we know happen and some things we don't know what happened, but he's putting those, blending those together as, as a, to, to make his story. And I think that's why we're seeing all this odd behavior and that we're seeing the truth and then deception butted up against each other. And I think that's fantastic seeing that and understanding what that is. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I think there's a real transition point here in terms of what he's now relying on for his tactic around this. Uh, again, I think the prosecutor has now really got him on a bit of a back foot here. I, it's really excellent the way it's gone, because I just wouldn't have seen it going this way. Um, now, why do I think this? Well, just as you say, Scott, the anger is building. Again, we're seeing those adaptions, we're seeing that swaying from side to side, everything that you mentioned uh, right there. But we also get him saying, look, the, the data will show what the data shows. Well, that's not via negative. He's now moved from the via negative of like, well, I don't remember and, and we don't know. And, you know, I'm going to tell you it's this to look look at the data and look at that what what that shows well we know that there's a bit of a lack of data around this so he's on a good foot there but simply from moving from negative to positive as a tactic i think that means he's being forced into a change not he's choosing to change here so i'm interested to see where this goes if the prosecution can keep up this pressure and get him somewhere and when you were asked by law enforcement how long you were at your mother's house. You said 45 minutes to an hour. Isn't that correct? I think I said a couple of different things, but I think at one time I did say that. But, you know, at, at, routinely through these things, I kept saying, you know, when you get this data, you'll see exactly. When you look at my phone, you'll see exactly. When you do, you know, so, you know, the, me giving the times was always given with the thought that, okay, that there's own star out there, there's whatever. But when you had a conversation with Miss Shelley after the fact, you actually asked her to say that you were there longer than 20 minutes. You know, I heard Shelley's testimony. I, 
I believe Shelley to be a good person. Uh, I wasn't trying to influence Shelley on any particular length of time because at, at the beginning of this, I believed that data would show what data would show. And for me to tell her to say something when my own star is going to show something different just doesn't make any sense. So, you know, I, I can't answer that. What my recollection is is that I told Shelley that, that law enforcement would be talking to her. We may have discussed how long I was there. At that point in time, if I thought I was there 45 minutes, I may have said I was here 45 minutes, but, you know, I can't tell you. That Blanca testified to that you talked to her about the clothes that you were wearing that made her uncomfortable, correct? Ask that question again. It's similar to your conversation with Blanca that she testified about when you talked to her about the clothes that you were supposedly wearing what, and what's, it made her feel uncomfortable. Do you remember that testimony, sir? What's similar to that? Well, that you're talking to both of these individuals about their testimony in a manner that's inconsistent with what they know. No, I, I don't. I don't think. I don't, I don't. I don't think your assertion is accurate. You have to understand this. On August the 11th, when I went to meet with David Owens, and in that, David Owens asked me about. He showed me that Snapchat and asked me about clothes that I had on, and. Um, Shortly after that, the next time I was with Blanca, I asked Blanca about those clothes because David Owens had asked me about them and was make, made an issue about it. And so I checked with Blanca to see what, what I specifically uh, asked Blanca, and it was an issue to me. So I got Blanca and I said, I need you to sit down and talk with me about this, this is important. Do you remember um, my clothes when you came to Moselle that day? And she remembered exactly what she testified to. She remembered that my pants were there. She wasn't sure if the shirt was there. At that time, I think she actually thought the shirt was there, but she was clear that she wasn't sure about that. Um, but, oh no, no, she wasn't unsure, but she didn't remember, um, but assumed that it was. So that was the conversation that, and why I was asking Blanca. Boy, again, you're very specific about your memories of that conversation. Is that correct, Mr. Murdoch? You're dang right, I'm, I, I'm, I'm consistent about that because a very short time before that, David Owens is asking me questions and telling me I'm a suspect in the murder of my wife and my child and asking me about my clothes, you're dang right it was important. It was important, right. And you're dang right I remember what, why I went to her and for what reason. Because the only thing you're concerned about is yourself. You're not concerned about giving accurate information to law enforcement, correct? What's the reason for that, Mr. Murdoch? Why don't you want to give accurate information to law enforcement? Why do you want to talk to these women who both are employed by you or your family and try to influence what they are going to say? Uh, I, I did want to give law enforcement accurate information. I told a lie about being down there and I got myself wed to that, but I wanted to give them as much. I knew that I hadn't done this and I wanted to give them as much accurate information as I could. But the reason I went to Blanca is specifically because David Owens talking to me on August the 11th. Okay. Greg, what do you got? All right. Exactly. So I, I got a ton of stuff on this one only because I, I just sitting watching it. He's bleeding everywhere you turn. First of all, outright pause is the guy asking him a question. He gets to, it's almost like he's saying this is a hard one. Then he starts to parse words and these are two lawyers going at it. But he's adapting when he's doing it. And he's turtling. He's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. He does clothes grooming. I'm not going to go in order. I'm just going to tell you everything I see. He grooms his clothing. He does all kinds of adapting. And we say grooming, clothing, and all that. 
we mean a person's releasing nervous energy in some way. And they get accustomed to doing that over the years and they become hab habitual for them often. So for example, a guy who's in front of an audience all the time may straighten his clothes, may do that kind of thing. When he gets to talking about David Owens, boom, 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 that blank rate goes up. This is when he was called in. And the first time they ask him out loud in a police interrogation room, did you kill your wife and son? So his blink rate goes up and he looks down into his right, which we associate with emotion. One of those few things that we see pretty consistently among all people. Now his cadence shift starts to go and he's navigating language as he tries to speak. And as he's attacked about asking this employee, you see his him then um, do the request for approval as he's talking, as he's telling you why he did it and all those kinds of things. We see that request for approval up. Uh, let's see. He does a lip compression and emotional control at one place when he says, you talk to her about what? And then, let's see if I can read my own handwriting. He goes back to that covering himself up in the fact that I've made myself into this martyr because I did lie. I'm wed to that lie. He's using powerful language about, I've told you I lied about that night. That's the only lie I've told. And there's a place at the very end where he actually adapts for one of the more powerful things as he touches his face for the first time as he's closing this out. Guys, we don't know what a person's thinking. What we can tell you is when we see all this deviation from what's normal, something else is going on in their head. So when he's telling, go all the way back to the beginning video, when he's telling and hopping along like a little rabbit, one thing's going on. But the minute his brain starts to stutter and he starts to change his speech pattern and we see adapters and we see him pulling back and wrapping himself in all of his good glory that he's done something good by telling you that he lied and he's telling you about all of his sins. What we're seeing here is a person now getting backed into the corner. And I think, Mark, you talked about it last time. This guy's got him back in the ropes. Two back-to-back -back eyewitnesses. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Just like three videos ago, I thought the prosecutor was dead in the water. I thought this guy's done. He may as well walk out now. He's he's now got this guy. This this defendant is now doing full improvisation, I think. I don't think he's rehearsed any elements of this certainly put together in this it's an absolute dog's dinner of a story going on here uh, uh absolutely right uh greg we got the we get the glasses coming off as well that's a a break from the baseline as well there's uh, the blink rate is going right up all the other things that you've mentioned there he's now using he would do the mic adaption there but he's now using that to break eye contact and look at the mic so he's using that as more of a barrier a shield so he can have a break from it i think it's fascinating uh what's what's happening here and i'm fascinated to see where it goes because i'm kind of hopeful uh ab about it scott what do you got on this one all right uh at that first question we see him lean back a little bit and this can indicate a couple of things it can indicate he doesn't understand what's happening or he feels like it's aggressive and it's kind of hitting him weird but he did he or, but i think he doesn't understand the question i think it's it's a combination of both. i think he doesn't understand it and it sort of takes him aback a little bit as it hits him then we're seeing cues of aggression as his head comes forward and his eyes lock on the prosecutor. So I think you're, I think you're right about that, Mark. He's, he's getting a little bit worried at this point. Then he grabs the mic and he pulls on, it, he starts fidgeting around a little bit. Then he takes his glasses off and his vocal tone gets a little bit louder and a little bit more harsh. So you nail all that stuff as well from what I'm seeing too. And then uh, as when, check this out, when he's talking uh, to the jury, he, he turns toward the jury as they're to his right. When he's being all emotional, when he's, when he's crying and stuff, he, he's cognizant enough in there to go, okay, I, I need to let the jury see me being emotional. See, that's another thing that bugs me about this guy. The only time he turns toward them hard is when he's being all emotional. But when he's being angry, he fully turns toward uh, the prosecutor. Now, watch when he's being emotional and deal with the prosecutor at the same time. He, he'll he he'll lock his head just, he'll just go back far enough just so they can still see his face. And he'll track him with his eyes like that predator look we saw earlier. And he'll track him like that the the prosecutor otherwise he's wanting the the jury to see his his emotion and how sad he is about everything which is i'm under the impression is is fake as well and then you're right greg he grabs that uh his face and scratches on that to get rid of some of that built up stress and tension i th i think he's he's stressed here he's worried because he's gotten back in the corner but at the same time he's trying to pay attention to what's happening uh emotionally uh that he's supposed to be showing the jury so i think 
let's start paying attention to where he's aiming when he's emotional because we're going to see that come into play again here in a few minutes. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, and in cases like this where there's limited emotional expression and there's minimal behavior cues, you can kind of just default to the analysis of what's missing, left out, or concealed. So with the questions uh, he's being asked, the attorney picks up very specific points. So which of these points is being concealed? Let's take a look. Number one, refusal to call somebody a liar or express that their testimony is inaccurate or false. Next is a refusal to discuss even having made these women uncomfortable, which was part of the question. Next is a refusal to discuss their testimony. And if it's false, it would take center stage, by the way. If their testimony was false, he would have made it center stage. Next is a refusal to discuss or even mention the attempt to influence these women's testimony. So these bits of concealment paint a gigantic red arrow in a certain direction. They come together to point collectively toward one, what I think is a scary potential conclusion here. In just this clip alone, you can see how if you're able to just go through a clip and only spot what's being concealed or left out, all of those items become a voice or an arrow that guide you precisely to what questions to ask or what happened in the situation in question. That Blanca testified to that you talked to her about the clothes that you were wearing that made her uncomfortable, correct? Ask that question again. It's similar to your conversation with Blanca that she testified about when you talked to her about the clothes that you were supposedly wearing what, and made her feel uncomfortable. Do you remember that testimony, sir? What's similar to that? Well, that you're talking to both of these individuals about their testimony in a manner that's inconsistent with what they know. No, I, I, don't, I, don't, think, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think your assertion is accurate. You have to understand this. On August the 11th, when I went to meet with David Owens and in that David Owens asked me about, he showed me that Snapchat and asked me about clothes that I had on. And um, shortly after that, the next time I was with Blanca, I asked Blanca about those clothes because David Owens had asked me about them and was make, made an issue about it. And so I checked with Blanca to see what, what I specifically uh, asked Blanca, and it was an issue to me. So I got Blanca and I said, I need you to sit down and talk with me about this. This is important. Do you remember um, my clothes when you came to Moselle that day? And she remembered exactly what she testified to. She remembered that my pants were there. She wasn't sure if the shirt was there. At that time, I think she actually thought the shirt was there, but she was clear that she wasn't sure about that. Um, but, oh no, no, she wasn't unsure, but she didn't remember, um, but assumed that it was. So that was the conversation that, and why I was asking Blanca. Again, you're very specific about your memories of that conversation. Is that correct, Mr. Murdoch? You're dang right. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm consistent about that because a very short time before that, David Owens is asking me questions and telling me I'm a suspect in the murder of my wife and my child and asking me about my clothes. You're dang right it was important. It was important, right. And you're dang right I remember what, why I went to her and for what reason. Because the only thing you're concerned about is yourself. You're not concerned about giving accurate information to law enforcement, correct? What's the reason for that, Mr. Murdoch? Why don't you want to give accurate information to law enforcement? Why do you want to talk to these women who both are employed by you or your family and try to influence what they are going to say? Uh, I, I did want to give law enforcement accurate information. I told a lie about being down there, and I got myself wed to that. But I wanted to give them as much. I knew that I hadn't done this, and I wanted to give them as much accurate information as I could. 
But the reason I went to Blanca is specifically because David Owens talking to me on August the 11th. Okay. You got out of the car, according to what you told law enforcement, repeatedly, and went and checked the bodies, correct? Before you called 911, is that correct? No, sir, that's not correct. You don't, you're saying you didn't say that to law enforcement? I don't know what I said to law enforcement, Mr. Waters, but I can tell you this. Mm -hmm. I pulled up and I saw Mags and Paul Paul. I jumped out of that car. I know that I went back to my car and I called 911 as quickly as I could. That point in time, when I got on the phone, then is when I went to them and did the things that I did. So, but you were what you're saying is not accurate. You're saying that you didn't say very specifically to law enforcement that you went to them prior to calling 911. When? After you got out of the car, you told law enforcement repeatedly that you went over and checked the bodies before you called 911. No, I don't. If I did say that, I, I don't believe that's accurate. Did I check Maggie and Paul before I called 911? Correct. No, sir. That's not, that's, not, I don't, that's not accurate. At least that's not what I remember. That's not what you remember saying, or that's not what you say now happened? No, that's not what. That's not what I believe happened. Okay, but you don't deny that's what you said. Did I said, did I check Maggie and Paul before I called 911? Correct. I don't believe that's what I said. <coughs> now I know I checked them but I don't believe I checked them before I called 911. Because I, I can pretty well remember vividly. When I checked Paul Paul, I was already on the phone with 911. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'll keep this one short. We see grief muscle for the first time, and he goes down the well. What I call down the well is when you pull up emotion to make you teary-eyed and that kind of thing. I can't tell for tears. I don't see any. Maybe it's just me. Um, I don't even see like a snotty nose. I see kind of a little bit of red in his nose, a little bit of that kind of stuff. When you ask, he starts then to push and corral the question in a way that he gets to answer what he wants to answer. And once he gets back to that topic where he's comfortable responding, you see all that tearing and all that stuff dry up. One of my best indicators of person's crying or trying to cry is people who cry <laughs> have interrupted breath. His respiration is up and not interrupted. I would be like, okay, let's just wait this one out because he's going to come right back to normal. And I don't see it as that. There's also no heavy swallowing. We associate with crying. Um, as we say, no snotty nose. I I'll just leave it at that and say, I think what this guy is doing is he's trying to prey on that emotional piece. This is all at the end of the day after establishing a shadow of a doubt. And if he is in grief and all of that, then people may have a shadow of a doubt. Look, this guy's told us all of his qualms, all the things he's done wrong, all of his weaknesses. I think we're still playing down that show. And I don't see what looks like real crime to me. Could be wrong. Scott, what do you got? I think this is interesting because he's trying to conjure up emotion, that emotion to grief. And that's what those mouth noises are about. And, and the, the mouth grooming, that's what that's all about. Then he calls his wife Mags and his son, Paul, Paul. Up to this point, I think he's called her Mags and called him Paul. These are these little endearing, endearing terms of affection that people use to make the jury feel sorry for him, feel more empathetic for that, for what they're going through. Because, oh, he called them these cute little sweet little names. That's what he's doing there, calling those names. And notice when he does call them that. It's always in this big emotional thing as he's facing the jury. So let's still keep an eye on when he's going back and forth uh, 
emotionally with the jury. Um, and then watch how, how fast that, that fake expression of emotion goes away, how, how fast it disappears. And then when that thing disappears, watch how fast he, he turns back to the, the uh, prosecutor and can track him better without having to worry about uh, showing emotion to the jury. That's all I'll say on that. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so look, let me put a little litmus test on whether this might be real crying or not real crying, and you do this for yourselves as well. So just so you know, in most personality tests, I will rank very, very low in, in empathy, very, very high in analysis, which means that I can somebody might be having an emotion and I'm not likely to feel that emotion. I'm likely to be able to go, look, I think this emotion is happening because here's what I see happening. That doesn't mean I'm not emotion, uh, I'm emotionless. Of course I have emotions. And so the thing is, is that if it's a real emotion and a big powerful emotion, usually that will affect me. And that's a good litmus test for me because I think, well, normally I'd be quite analytical about this, but I'm actually feeling a lot of empathy for this person. Chances are this is absolute real emotion. Why? Because real emotions that are strong are designed to get action out of other human beings immediately and so i'm a social human being so emotions work on me even though in personality tests i will rank pretty low here's how i come out of uh of this um display with this person i feel absolutely nothing absolutely nothing and i could go into the analysis of what's not right just as greg was saying there the breathing's not right you know the this the skin tone isn't right there's so much analytically isn't right but if that were a real strong emotion about seeing your your family dead, I would feel that and I rank super low on empathy, but I would have empathy for that. I got zero empathy. Probably means it's not it's not the real thing. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, you're saying that the mouth grooming is off the charts here. We tend to do this to improve our appearance and we do it, it's unconscious. And if it's done during deception, the brain does everything it can do to improve the appearance of the lie or the person during the lie. So mouth grooming, especially when you see a spike of mouth grooming behavior like this one, is one of the hallmarks that we tend to see, especially when it's isolated from all the other behaviors, meaning they don't do it all the time. So this mouth grooming is not in his baseline behavior at all. And he starts reorienting his body to the jury in a way that's almost like a, a prank TV show. Like there, somebody trained him, like every time you feel emotion, you have to turn to that jury. And he's probably been telling people to do this for a long time. I have no doubt that he's been doing that. And he thinks it works. And he shifts before the emotions begin. So before he thinks the emotions are ready for display, then he turns to the jury. And his eye contact to the prosecution after the during the question is now locked on while he's trying to display sadness at the same time. His blink rate drops to zero during this point, which is an extreme indicator of focus. So which if tears were in his eyes, this would be hard to do to drop your blink rate like this. This is an indicator of extreme focus and attention. The sadness somehow goes away for all the key parts of the story. Every key part, the entire expression and everything about sadness disappears. And he becomes just emotionless and sadness kind of goes away. And when somebody's being truthful uh, and can't remember something, they tend to say one thing almost every single time. If they're being truthful and can't remember, they say, I don't remember. He makes an attempt at saying, I don't remember. But the moment he's pressed on it, you'll see that he breaks down. He realizes that the strategy is not working. And when you press a truthful person, they will continue saying they don't know. You know why? Because they don't know. You got out of the car, according to what you told law enforcement, repeatedly and went and checked the bodies, correct? Before you called 911, is that correct? No, sir, that's not correct. You don't, you're don't. you saying you didn't say that to law enforcement? I don't know what I said to law enforcement, Mr. Waters, but I can tell you this. Mm -hmm. I pulled up, and I saw Mags and Paul Paul. I jumped out of that car. I noted I went back to my car, 
and I called 911 as quickly as I could. That point in time, when I got on the phone, then is when I went to them and did the things that I did. So, but you were what you're saying is not accurate. You're saying that you didn't say very specifically to law enforcement that you went to them prior to calling 911. When? After you got out of the car, you told law enforcement repeatedly that you went over and checked the bodies before you called 911. No, I don't. If I did say that, I, I, I don't believe that's accurate. Did I check Maggie and Paul before I called 911? Correct. No, sir. That's not, that's, not, I don't, that's not accurate. At least that's not what I remember. That's not what you remember saying, or that's not what you say now happened? No, that's not what... That's not what I believe happened. Okay, but you don't deny that's what you said. Did I said, did I check Maggie and Paul before I called 911? Correct. I don't believe that's what I said. <coughs> now I know I checked them but I don't believe I checked them before I called 911. Because I, I can pretty well remember vividly. When I checked Paul Paul, I was already on the phone with 911. I saw them, and I know I jumped out of my car. Um, but I believe that before I checked them, in fact, I'm almost certain, that then I went back and I got my, that's when I went and got my phone and I called 911. Okay. And then, after I called 911, they, they, I mean, there was a little while where there wasn't, I don't, I don't think there was anything going on. And I believe that that is the time period that I went and checked on them. I don't want to belabor this point, but that what you're saying here today, now that we have this data, that's not exactly how you expressed it to law enforcement in your prior statements. Is that correct? No, sir. I disagree with that. Okay. I totally disagree with that, Mr. Waters. Will you point to what you're talking about? All right, Chase, what do you got? Don't believe. These are two words we do not use to describe facts, like ever. And you hear it all the time in here. I don't believe I made a decision to lie. Such a great line. I want to get that on a bumper sticker somewhere. I don't believe that I was lying at that point. That's a direct quote here. I don't believe that I was lying at that point. And he says, I don't believe it was a lie. So, and he said, uh, later in this video, he says, my dear friend, Chief Alexander, gave him some piece of advice to do something. This is borrowing credibility, borrowing authority from, from another person. And his eyebrows are constantly raised. And I think this is his innocence behavior. And he's learned to display this to appear innocent. You can even see it in the body cam footage when he's communicating to the officer and he wants to appear innocent and blameless. And this nodding that he's doing at the end, we saw in the first video he did when he was in the police car. We saw it many times throughout the trial. We saw it twice on the body cam footage. He does this every time that he's uncertain and wants to appear comfortable. 
And he does it precisely at these moments that he's offering up something that's not very credible and wants people to accept it, which is so far as I've seen, in my opinion. Uh, Mark, there you go. Yeah, so another reason for me, it feels like this is not true feeling that he's um, creating here or, or, or emoting here and that it's conjured up and conjured up badly. Uh, is in my experience of helping performers all over the world at some incredibly high levels deliver emotions is when they're real, when they get them for real, they come so fast and powerful that the actor forgets to hide themselves. And what happens when emotions come and they're not quite right, they're not good enough, the actor feels disappointed in them, that it's not really true, it's not quite right, and they'll put their head into shade, as you're seeing there with his head. They'll hide their eyes because they don't want to show you. Like, this is not really top quality gold emotion. Don't don't watch the whole of my face. You'll see how false this is. There's not a, um, it's not that there's not a pride in it. It's just when real emotion comes, it happens so fast that you don't have a moment to socially hide yourself. Later on in the emotion, when you might feel embarrassed about that motion or emotion or worried about it, or it's stressful for you or the other people, later on, you might start some hiding behaviors. But right early on, in my experience, people don't. He hides his feelings right from the start. And that's because I think he knows that they're not good enough. It's not a good performance. It isn't the gold that he's hoping to deliver to the jury at this point. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, just a handful of things, but all powerful. Um, one is you hear that, that blowout, that breath. I learned a new term from our friend Rodney Smith this week. Maybe you guys all know it from Polygraph. I didn't descending staircase breathing. I always just said controlled breathing, but Rodney's an investigator for North Carolina, and he explained, he's a polygrapher, and he explained that to me as one of the things they look for. I always just said, catch up breathing. You know, I've been sitting there controlling my breathing, people exasperated, or they're trying to catch up, they blow out air. I didn't see, when he starts down this whole thing, he blows that out, and the grief muscle disappears. Now, we're still talking about finding your child, but now we're talking about something else. We're talking about whether I said that or not. He gets really polite, he gets a good eye lock, and he follows the guy across the room as the guy walks away. Powerful, you can't miss it. And, and Chase, I am dead on with you. I don't believe. We should have a t-shirt that says, I don't believe I committed a lie. We could do something like that. I ran construction for years, and I always tell my people, ch church words like hope, feel, and believe are church words. They're not thinking words. They're not, I did not do this. I think this. I evaluated and. But we get, he does that. The other thing that we notice here is he is getting smaller and smaller, and he doesn't just turtle. He puts the top of his skull toward this prosecutor more than one time. If that's not feeling defeat, if you don't see something creeping in that we know that he's starting to feel the, the pressure of two eyewitnesses and you lied to the police in the thing that you told us you didn't and you're getting caught in words, I don't know what it takes. Mark, uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. Uh, mine's going to be super short. He, he uh, grabs the mic again and he, tur he turns toward the jury again and he shows all this, he's doing all that weird mouth grooming stuff at the top and he's just getting, it's just getting weird, but there are no tears. And there's like you're saying, Greg, there's no snot. So it's, this is all just fake. And then w once he gets that done and delivers all that, you see that emotion almost completely disappear. There's, again, there's no snipping. There's no Kleenex. He was, remember he was, had that Kleenex before and he was goofing around with it, but he never really used it. In the court, some of the court things he did use it, but he just kept rubbing his nose with it. And that's why his nose is all red at some points because he just kept sticking this Kleenex up his nose and pushing it around, but nothing, but it was the same one the whole time. He never changed. It was gross. If it had been real, it would have been really gross, but it, I think it was fake. So it was just, ugh. I saw them. And I know I jumped out of my car. Um, but I believe that before I checked them, in fact, I'm almost certain, that then I went back and I got my, that's when I went and got my phone and I called 911. Okay. And then after I called 911, they, I mean, there was a little while where there wasn't, I don't, I don't think there was anything going on. 
And I believe that that is the time period that I went and checked on them. I don't want to belabor this point, but that what you're saying here today, now that we have this data, that's not exactly how you expressed it to law enforcement in your prior statements. Is that correct? No, sir. I disagree with that. Okay. I totally disagree with that, Mr. Waters. Will you point to what you're talking about? At least on this one, at some point during this interview, when you were able to plan your lie about this event, and you made that decision, uh, it, but it wasn't what we just played. It wasn't yet. It was some point after that. I don't think that's a lie right there. Is is the reason why I don't think that it's occurred before this? Because what I'm saying there. I believe to be truthful, and I know, know I know this. I know for a fact that when David Owens asked me about my relationship with my wife and my child, I know that that played a role in that. Mm -hmm. And I believe that, and I may be wrong, but I believe that this was before that. You ever heard the expression, not telling the whole truth is the same as telling the lie? Sure I have. That's something you understood? as a lawyer and a, and a prosecutor? Yes. <clears throat> All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, just one thing. I just love that idea. I don't think that's a lie. I think that's fan fantastic. Uh, that That is a... It, Put in in the in the notes down below. Put in the discussion down below if you really do fancy a T-shirt on that or or anything else. I I will mock it up for you. I'll put it up there. Um, we'll make it as cheap as possibly we can. If if you want that or any other, stick that in the notes uh, below and uh, and let's get it done. I don't think that was a lie. Chase, what do you got on this one? Let's do one more. Uh, what I'm saying there, I believe to be truthful. <laughs> That's a good one. Beautiful. And this is just more lawyer speak, and truthful people just don't do this. And right as he's speaking about the question about his relationship with the victims, he pulls his jacket closed, which we call barrier creation. And as he's doing that, uh, Zoom's trying to give me a thumbs up emoji right now on my screen. It did it earlier for you. It did it earlier. It actually got one up there for some reason. I don't know how. All right. And then there's a confirmation glance. Uh, and a pause. So we call it a confirmation glance and a pause to ensure that he's being listened to. And Scott, I'm going to go along with this. And I'm glad you brought this up first because I had this in my notes. I'd like okay. to present a case for absolutes, but only one, a, a short one. And I'll use you as an example, Scott. Okay. If I ask Scott if anybody in his neighborhood is making drugs in their house and he says, not to the best of my knowledge, or I don't believe so, those answers could be factual and truthful. But if I ask Scott if he is making drugs in his house and his answer is not to the best of my knowledge, or I don't believe so, those answers are absolutely ridiculous. So the responses are the same, but the context is different. And I think this is why a checklist is only as good as the person's ability to determine contextual relevance. That's all I've got. Greg? Yeah, so a few things. He's adapting like all hell. I mean, everything is coming up to adapt now. You're right. It, I think the barrier, but it's also a, a, a grooming appearance thing. So he's trying to look better as he's talking. Listen to his words. I don't think that's a lie. I believe. But he knows for a fact one thing. He goes, I don't believe that's a lie. I, I don't think that's a lie. I believe. I believe. I know for a fact that when he asked me the question about my relationship with Paul and Maggie is when I decided to lie. Well, guess who else knows for a fact that we knew that for a fact, go back and watch the first video. We all red flagged on him about that. I in fact said, this is my favorite clip of all time because you get to see real baseline between wonderful and wonderful. 
So go back and watch it because all those red flags we saw through those video in the car are showing up now that he's actually telling you with his own mouth that that's when he decided to lie. Now, is he telling the truth? Hard to tell with this guy. I lied. I lied. I lied. Please believe me. I lied. Scott. What do you got? Yeah, and I think he's doing that I lied, I lied, I lied thing because he's trying to show that now he's stopped all the lying. He's being honest. I think he's trying that that big reverse on everybody. I don't think it's going to, hopefully it won't take. I don't think it'll take. Uh, but this is the, uh, up to this point, this is the loudest and most animated he's been. You're right, Greg. He's all over the place. So far, this is, he's almost like a cartoon. His blink rates through the roof. His, he's editing and arranging everything. He's just looking around, thinking and talking. And all this is on the fly, like Mark was saying earlier, where he's just he's just going for it, man, in some of these things. And again, like Joe Navarro says, you can have a poker face, but you can't have a poker body. And as hard as he tries to keep all that in and, and look like he's telling the truth, it's not working at all, not even a little bit, in my opinion. I just want to be clear, though. At least on this one, at some point during this interview when you were able to plan your lie about this event and you made that decision uh, but it wasn't what we just played it wasn't yet it was some point after that i don't think that's a lie right there is, is the reason why i don't think that it's occurred before this because what i'm saying there I believe to be truthful, and I know have? I know this. I know for a fact that when David Owens asked me about my relationship with my wife and my child, I know that that played a role in that, and I believe that. And I may be wrong, but I believe that this was before that. You ever heard the expression "not telling the whole truth is the same as telling a lie"? Sure, I have. That's something you understood as a lawyer and a, and a prosecutor? Yes. <clears throat> All right, well, Mark, so far, what do you think we've been seeing here? What do you, what, what do you got? So far, this is a great lesson for me in it's not over until it's over. I thought that prosecutor was done halfway through this. He's back. He's doing a great job on a really hard candidate here. So just fantastic to see somebody on the ropes. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. I just wish he would have nailed him down on the non-answer questions a little bit more. But this video is a masterclass in determining deception in trained deposition experts. It's full of all the hallmarks that you would look for in depo experts. Hesitancy, psychological distancing, severity softening, non-answers, uh, chronology, pronoun absence, ambiguity, politeness, mini confessions, exclusions, qualifiers, chronological discrepancies. If you wanted a checklist of what to look for when a politician's being questioned, that's it. You're welcome. I'll do a, a Zoom <laughs> thing. Greg? <laughs> yeah, it's been trying to give you one of those all day, Chase, so you should get it. So I'm going to add to the list that Chase had. I'm just going to say, look, this guy is prepped. This guy has prepared himself. It doesn't matter how much you prepare yourself. You can de-conflict your story as much as you want to. And when you get right up to someone else who has thought of other details you haven't, then you're going to bleed information to you. You can't have a poker body. What happens is I've got this perfect story until you start poking. And oh, and then Bobby and Susie said this. Oh, well, now I got to deal with that. So we're seeing him dealing with that de-conflict on the fly instead of having time to go back, sit in his hotel room, make up new details and come. That creates a really different autonomic response in the body. And the reason we say this is because stress is what we're looking for. And clusters of stressful behavior that deviate from the baseline mean that we're seeing something going on in the person's head. Can't read his mind, but it's not looking good. Scott, what are you seeing to this point? So far, I think we've seen everything that we always talk about pretty much. We've seen everything from loping to editing to you name it. And there we, we've pretty much seen it. If you go through this again, you'll learn so much. If you go to the very beginning and watch the, through the whole video, because we cover everything in this one. So I think it's a great study to see um, all the things we talk about. And the people and the panelists who've been watching this long are going to be able to go through and just knock these out as they watch it the first time. And then, of course, watch it again so you can uh, get that locked in your brain as we go through. All right, fellas, I think this was another good one, and we'll see you next time.
So what do you got? Today we're going to talk about Alex Murdoch. And Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? Yeah, so these videos are from right after the police showed up to the murder of his wife and son. So, um, just start the to top, take your time. Um, like when I came back here, mm -hmm. I mean, I pulled up and I could see him and, you know, I knew something was bad. I ran out. I knew it was really bad. <laughs> my, my boy over there, I could see. It was. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <clears throat> and I could see it. <laughs> <clears throat> and I ran over to Maggie and uh, actually I think I tried to turn Paul over first um uh you know I tried to turn him over and uh I don't know I figured it out um uh, his cell phone popped out of his pocket I started to try to do something with it thinking maybe but then I put it back down really quickly um, then I went to my wife and I uh, I mean I could see mm -hmm. <laughs> did you touch Maggie at all I did I touched them both okay. I tried to take I, I mean I tried to do it as limited as possible mm -hmm. but I, I tried to take their pulse on both of them <laughs> mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, Chase, what do you got? Immediately, as this clip starts, he's apparently just found his family who'd been killed. Instead of grief or sadness or even confusion, we're seeing full body fear. And all I'm going to do is break down the first 18 seconds of this video. It's, a, it's I think it's a minute and a half, two minutes long. That's all I'm going to do here. So let's go over what the fear does to the body just really quick. The first thing is these muscles right here, the sternocleidomastoid muscles, they jump out in front of the carotid artery. And you'll see it when somebody has that expression. You go watch a compilation on YouTube of people getting the crap scared out of them. You'll see that. Then the shoulders come up. Then the humerus bones come in toward the body. And there's a natural tendency to protect the wrists and other joints by bringing them either closer together or closer towards the the body facing away as much as possible from a potential predator many times the lower limbs will move toward the groin so like the arms in men and covering the uterus area in women although i think there's some difference here in the genital protection it's more likely to be during three key moments when you see genital protection in your future it's when someone is feeling vulnerable, threatened, or insecure. Those are the typical three times that you'll see genital protection. The rib cage lowers down slightly. So you see his posture go down. We don't have bones protecting the soft organs in our belly. So this forward crunch is almost a way to bring those bones in front of those soft organs. Then the muscles in the body during fear become more rigid. It makes the overall human being more hard to attack. And keep in mind, this is an analysis of the first 1.5 seconds of the video. Right after this, he says, my boy over there, I could see, I could see, I saw. Keep in mind, as you go through all these clips, the difference in someone telling you versus selling you. So what's the difference between I could see my ball on the ground and my boy was on the ground? One of them is an experience, and one of them, someone is telling you a story. So as you watch these, keep in mind that someone who has done something potentially like this will often just show feelings of regret or shame or loss or sadness. So being the killer does not make you immune to sadness or crying or anything like that. And finally, when 
a dramatic event happens and somebody asks what happened, people who are innocent almost never default to chronologically telling you step by step the details of precisely what happens. And their internal motivation to make decisions is never explained. I did this because of this and because of that. This is the most red flags I've seen in one video in a long time. And I promise I won't go this long on the rest of them. Scott, what do you got? All right. Well, go as long as you want, dude. That's, that's good stuff. Uh, I want to pay attention to three things as we're going through these videos. Number one, let's pay attention to like what uh, Chase was talking about, the growing protection. Number two, his blink rate. And number three, that Kleenex he's got. Because, he, well, we'll get into that in a few minutes, but let's pay attention to those things. The first time we see his, his cry face kick in, it disappears instantly. And the second time, time it kicks in, it lasts a little bit longer, but it, 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 it goes away not really fast, but fairly fast. And there are no tears. Now, when something like this has happened, when somebody's just seen their wife and one of their children dead, they're going to be crying. There's going to be a whole lot going on. But he, he wipes his face like he's wiping tears. We don't see the head shakes. No, as quite often when someone has seen something like that, or they've been even told something like that, that horrible, that horrible has happened. They'll sit there and they'll rock back and forth a little bit and they'll be doing this. They'll, they'll be shaking their head. No, because they don't understand why this happened. We see no grief in the grief muscle up here. We see no knitting of the brow. So many things are, are, are missing from that. His voice after this initial engagement where it looks like he's laughing, but he's crying, goes back to normal. His cadence goes back to normal. His voice tone and volume go back to normal. His diction is spot on. Everything goes back to just like, he, just like you would if, if everything was just fine. Then he straightens out his Kleenex, but he doesn't use it. And that's this is going to be part of his show as he goes through. Part of the one that uses it as an adapter a couple of times, but he just goofs around with it. So he gets a little bit loud as that with that performance of of the with the Kleenex, and then it starts going away. It starts getting quieter. And quite often, when a person has experienced something like this uh, that's so horrible, their eyes will be fairly wide. His aren't really wide. His mouth, their mouths will be open. Their eyes are going to be red, and their hands are going to be together, and they're going to be like rubbing them or clasping them, you know, wringing their hands because they, they don't understand why something horrible is happening and, and their brain is just like, hey, man, let's not freak out here. So they'll, they'll be rubbing their hands together. We don't see any of that, nothing. And um, I'll, I'll leave it there. there. There's so much there I could go on for two years. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we could talk for an hour on just this one alone. It, it's it's bonkers. Um, so I'm just going to tell you one thing: a, a, a gesture that really stood out to me, which I don't, I rarely see anywhere else than in uh, a Michelin-starred kitchen, uh, and and that is the the gesture of finishing salt when you when you put finishing salt over something. When he cry, when he cries, here's something I've never seen anybody crying do: to put their hands up here and then rub their fingers together to see if they've got tears or not, to see if there's any wet. Go back, take a look, his hand goes up, and then you see him do this. It's bizarre. That alone, that alone, because it's an outlier in anything that I've ever seen anywhere in the world. So that alone causes me, well, other than, you know, at a really nice restaurant, you know? Um, and sometimes they'll do it from a height as well if they want to be really fancy about it yeah exactly yeah. like so um yeah so that alone for me causes me to go okay there's something going on here because i've never seen that gesture anywhere before and certainly why do you need to check if you've got tears or not somebody who's re somebody who's you know loved ones have died are not checking to see if they have tears or not greg what do you got on this one yeah, so this is a rare one for me because right out of the gate, my BS meter is just wide open. I could just stop right here and we could be done with this video. I, if you stole my bicycle, I would probably be more upset than this guy appears to be at the beginning of this video. And I haven't ridden a bicycle since 2003. So just to give you an idea, this guy doesn't show any animation, no sense of urgency. Can we get to the facts? Can you help me? None of that. He's just waiting to tell his story. That That's an odd start. The other one is... Think about the last time you went to a funeral where people know the person is dead. They see the body and you see them an hour later. Their eyes are bloodshot. Their nose is kicked. Nothing, nothing. 
that's a red flag for me as well. This is right after, right after he found his wife and son. That's a big deal. There's also in the beginning, Chase, you're talking about his anger but or his fear, but I also see him rocking. Is he listening to Ozzy Osbourne in his head or doing something as he's getting ready for what's to come? What you don't know because you didn't clip this video is just before this, there's just who are you getting names and all that straight. Then the rocking starts and that's preparation for what's about to come. And then he goes, um, as it leads into it, why? Why um? Why um? Don't have to have an answer. We just have to know there's something going on. You know, look, I, with a sword thing, when I fight, I ramp up by doing something too. I might rock my body and do that kind of thing. A lot of people who fight do that. Martial arts folks do it. But we don't usually associate it with telling a story. It's not usually how we go. I also said remorse doesn't mean you didn't do it. And look, if you killed your child and didn't expect to do horrific things to that child, the things he describes, you might still show it. Now, there's also a study from 2012 at the University of British Columbia that shows that the best way to tell when somebody is truthful or not about things like this is that that grief muscle we all talk about that we say Darwin and Duchesne originally called it that for ease of discussion. It's that little arch that we see up here. That isn't ever present in folks who are lying. It rare, it rare in folks who aren't lying, who are lying. What you see instead is this whole frontalis, this whole set of muscles here draw down. Does that look familiar? And uh, if I remember the muscles here, the zygomatic major, I think they're referred to as the ones that tie off from your cheeks to make you smile, a containment of that so that it can almost look like a smile. Hmm. That sounds awfully familiar to what he's doing. Go look at that study. What they don't see is all this engagement in the forehead. They see that down and this engagement of these muscles at the side. He goes down the well. You guys know I always say when a person's trying to cry, they go down the well. They find a reason. They make it <laughs> as horrible as they can, and they can find a reason to cry. But no tears come up, Mark, to your point. He tries to find it. The interesting piece is the people sitting behind him feel it and feel bad for him and go to it. Interesting. Then he says... I figured out that he was dead. Well, I, look, it, we're going to bleep a few words in this thing, but go listen to the real words. There's no doubt the guy's dead. You wouldn't even have to figure it out. And then he's got a damn straight face all the time for what he's talking about. And there's that side. It looks like he's almost choking back a smile. He goes, I tried to take there and he pauses a few beats and then says pulse. There's so much in here. Forget the fear. Forget all the stuff that we're seeing. Forget the wind up Ozzy Osbourne. Everything else here is just not compatible with a person who just found. And I'll leave it at this. People react differently, but not all these different ways and clusters that we're all seeing. So you, you might be interested enough that this might be all you want to watch, but there's a lot more. Hang on. The eyewitness is you. So, um, just start the to top, take your time. Um, like when I came back here, mm -hmm. I mean, I pulled up and I could see him and, you know, I knew something was bad. I ran out. I knew it was really bad. <laughs> my, my boy over there, I could see it was. I could see. <laughs> and I ran over to Maggie. And uh, actually, I think I tried to turn Paul over first. Um, uh, you know, I tried to turn him over, and uh, I don't know. I figured it out. Um, uh, his cell phone popped out of his pocket. I started to try to do something with it, thinking maybe, but then I put it back down really quickly. Um, then I went to my wife, and I, uh, I mean, I could see. Mm -hmm. mm, Did you touch Maggie at all? I did. I touched them both. Okay. I tried to take, I mean, I tried to do it as limited as possible, mm -hmm. but I, I tried to take their pulse on both of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And, um, uh, you know, I called 911 um, pretty much right away. And she was very good. Um, <clears throat> I talked to her. Um, I told her I was going to get off the phone to call some family members. <coughs> I did that. Um, and, um, family members did you call him? I called my brother Randy and I called my brother John and I tried to call a little boy real good friend that's right around the corner from here but I didn't get him okay. <clears throat> all right Mark what do you got uh yeah so uh you know I called 911 pretty much right away uh, yeah, I don't think that happened at all. I don't think he called 911 straight away at all. Simply from, you know, then then uh, pretty much. Uh, don't like those around, around I called 911. Just, I called 911 immediately. That's a, that's a good way to say it. Uh, he praises them, the law enforcement. There's, there's no need. His, his son and, you know, wife are dead. Like, who cares how good the law enforcement were at that point? You don't care how good, how good they were. You're not out to, you're not giving out medals at that point. And, and look, and he's totally taken control of his breathing. You know, what, what you, what you saw at the start where he's, where I think you're right, Chase, there's, there's fear there. And I think there's probably a little bit of panic as well, but quickly taken control of it. I think maybe those officers in the back give him a bit of, you know, bolster his confidence. A little bit about this is working we can keep see his eyes kind of you know heading off to the side to check out is this, is this working is it working and uh oh god it's 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 a fun it's it's fun stuff i'm gonna keep it at that because there's there's plenty more plenty more to come uh chase what do you got on this one all right in in this clip there's a continuation of what you saw in the first one the groin protection has become more pronounced the emotion is gone the chronology, the exact precise chronology of detail continues here. And the emotional impact of these phone calls is missed. There's no emotional impact when talking about these phone calls because A, they're potentially fake. The story is fake. And B, the stress from having to fake this is causing that emotion not to be there. I think it's unusual that he felt the need to provide a customer review for the 911 operator. Uh, this might be something in his behavior profile, though, that's starting to reveal itself. But let's see if there's any other evidence that pops up before my hunch on this uh, dies. And I'll dive into that. And Greg, what do you got? Yeah, again, we call that a fig leaf for obvious reasons. When a person crosses their groin, when a male crosses their groin to protect their testicles, primary sex organs, this guy's doing what I would call a modified fig leaf. He puts his hand in his lap and you'll see him moving his hand fairly often. But here again, look, if I have the opportunity to tell you a story or say, hey, somebody killed my family and they're still lying right there. They're probably close by. Can we do something to help find them? Not and um uh, yeah and after that and he's storytelling now and we see it because he says haltingly pretty much right away Mark to your point exactly pretty much right away not right away not right after that pretty much and then he mouth grooms which we only see a couple of times in this entire thing and we say mouth grooms our mouths get dry when we're feeling stress. And lying creates stress in most of us, except for those who are talented at it. And if I'm trying to hide something, I don't want you to find it. I'm going to go and have that opportunity to groom my mouth. You'll see it happen a couple of times in this one. And he does a long vowel and, and then he goes into chase. You were calling it something earlier. I'll call it clearing, not steering. He's going to give you reasons why he was busy and why you didn't, you know, all that kind of thing. There's still no sense of urgency. I, I wrote in my notes, I hung up the phone, I scratched my backside, and um, and he's just giving you useless details that I would not give a cop if I were trying to find somebody. He's navigating out of what to, his way through what to say as he goes, she was a good 911 operator. The only good thing in this entire thing is he is not feeling stressed, Mark, to your point. It's a great thing because it gives us some matter-of-fact stuff I call my brother. So we can look at what matter-of-fact stuff is 
because this guy's not stupid. He's not going to say, I called my brother. And then you pull his phone records and he didn't guarantee you. He called his brother, did all those pieces. So this gives us a way to pay attention to him as he moves forward. And we're going to see it in a couple of other places. Scott, what do you got? I agree with you. We're not seeing those things that let us know that there's stress there. We're not seeing very many adapters that should theoretically be there from the stress he's supposed to be feeling or going through it, uh, at, during this. We don't see any of that. Still, no no valid signs of grief whatsoever uh, from a body language perspective anyway. His blink rate's still really low. He's still covering his groin like you were saying. And uh, he's still goofing around that Kleenex, still hasn't used that yet. And he never asks why this happened. He doesn't try to connect with that with that police officer. And, you know, like you, like they'll do, they'll sit there, they'll look at you and go, what, you know, out of confusion, they'll look at you and go, what's, you know, why? What? He never says why. He doesn't do any of that. This should be so horrific that it should blow his mind that that because he shouldn't be able to understand that. But he doesn't have a problem understanding that because I'm under the impression he's the one that did it. So it doesn't bother him at all. He doesn't need to do that. The most horrible thing that ever happened to him, he's not trying to connect with anybody, not trying to go, you know, dude, what's going on? What what the hell? Nothing like that at all. Um, his head is is in the space it should be for what he's trying to do. So he's thinking about all the things. He's making sure his story is tight. So he's he's relaxing now because he thinks these people believe him. You hear that guy in the back coughing like he's got Zika or something, but that doesn't throw him either, you know, because he's like clearing his throat and doing all that stuff as well. But his head is right where it should be for someone who is who's who is is confident with having fooled everyone that they that their their story is being believed. I think so. That's what I got. The eyewitness is you. <clears throat> and um, uh, you know, I called nine one one um pretty much right away, and she was very good. Um. <clears throat> I talked to her. Um, I told her I was going to get off the phone to call some family members. <coughs> I did that. Um, and um, How many family members did you call? Even? I called my brother Randy. And I called my brother John. And I tried to call a little boy real good friend that's right around the corner from here but i didn't get him okay. <clears throat> what all was around um paul when you walked up blood any any other anything else i mean there were some body mm -hmm. things yes sir i mean like any other evidence i know you said the phone fell out the pocket um but did you see anything else that didn't belong or shouldn't belong or that wasn't part of Paul? No, sir. Not, no, not. The, no, sir. How about Maggie? No, sir. You didn't see anything around them? All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, everything we talk about in everything is about baseline. So we start from whatever is normal for the person in the situation. Again, it's not normal for you to sit around in your you know, on your couch eating Cheetos. That that baseline. We're talking about the baseline you're dealing with when you're asking non-pertinent questions. So we see some of that. We see him starting off with more of that same factual baseline. And he's fairly normal until, until he's asked about Maggie. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But there's no grimace or distaste or any negative emotion about blood or body stuff around his son. Anybody find that odd? I mean, all kinds of people deal with things different ways. If you found a dog who had been shot, you would probably have a grimace around that, not your child. And I will say this, we say sudden politeness matters, but this is low country, South Carolina. That sudden politeness is just politeness. In the part of Georgia I live in, there are people who refuse to call me by my first name because I'm older. And so it's just part of the culture, just to point that out. And there could be a reason, but I, I don't think it is. Um, it's out of character that he retracts the side of his mouth and does some odd thing, odd thing with his mouth. He grimaces when he's asked, is there anything around Maggie? He does that. He absolutely does not answer the question, nods his head a little, shakes his head a little, and makes eye contact for the first time in the entire video. We talk about baseline. We talk about deviations from baseline. Ding, ding, ding. I would say, hold on, hold on a minute. 
why did you suddenly do something different? Or I'd make a mental note and come back and poke and prod it again and again and again. Uh, Chase, what do you got? This guy's a prosecutor, who, which I learned from Greg as we were kind of ramping up yep. for this episode on Zoom. And he's probably tried a bunch of cases. This is proof that no matter how many cases you do, you don't get inoculated to not displaying the perfect behaviors. The, all four of us, uh, you can go back and watch us through these videos. We get stressed out. Our blink rate goes up. We have the same human responses that anyone else does. It doesn't give you some hall pass to never display these behaviors again when you learn them. And that's what we're seeing here. A prosecutor who probably thought that he was inoculated against all of this stuff. He knew what to say. He didn't know how to say it. And that's the big difference. And Greg, I'm just going to say this, this politeness that we are seeing here is a spike. And it's not really present anywhere else here. And I'm, you know, I'm from Arkansas. My family's all from Arkansas. I see a lot of that, but the moment it's just it spikes up higher than it ever does in the conversation so i'm just going to look at it as a one data point not some big thing that reveals anything right about the specifics concerning the crime scene and he's gone from no emotion and minimal responsiveness to more responsive more eye contact and suddenly using the word sir i would just say this this is a little spike here that's concerning to me but notice also when he's being asked to think back and go through the crime scene, there's no emotion and zero eye accessing. We move our eyes around in our, our head to access all kinds of details. There is none of that here. This is another huge red flag for me. Scott. All right. I want to talk about one thing. When, Like you were just saying, Chase, when somebody goes back through that and you ask them a question about what they saw or what happened, and they're reliving that because they're there in their brain seeing it, they go into this blank stare almost as they start telling you about it. We don't see that at all. This guy isn't doing anything that normal humans would do, or that in my experience so far, things that I've seen, where a person explaining what happened or describing a scene or what was going on there doesn't do anything they normally do, or that I'm under the impression they normally do. There's there's nothing. And you're right, Greg, when he, he, he connects with them, it's, but it's not that connection of what the hell. There's no, there's nothing. I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. There's nothing happening here that 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 says um, I'm worried about this. I can't believe it. This has got me stressed. It's just, it it should just be freaking him out, and it isn't. Except for that, he tried to pull it off the top with that uh, that fake cry, which we all during the thing we got the giggles all of us because it looked like he was laughing. If you go back and watch that, you'll see what I'm talking about. But man, that, this doesn't show anything it should be showing for someone who's gone through something so horrific. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with hey, all can of I, that. Can I correct one thing, Mark, before you start? Yeah, go for it. I just double-checked. He apparently did volunteer work in the solicitor's office. So he was a full-time prosecutor, just for your knowledge. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just too calm, just too calm, just too still. And it's and it's not the stillness of shock because the, the tension would be in his body. You'd see him stuck there. You'd see some kind of catatonic state. He's too soft. It's too cool. Uh, it's too much like he's on, you know, he's sitting on the couch eating Cheetos. It, it, it's just that kind of softness and, and rhythm. Uh, I totally agree. He's not seeing the scene in his head. We don't see any eye accessing. I don't care where his eyes go. I need his eyes to go somewhere, somewhere to search for information because he would know he's being asked information because there could be a clue. There could be a clue that could lead to the perpetrator right now. He doesn't even bother to go and look for that information. Why? Because he knows there's no information there. He knows there's nothing there that would help them find the perpetrator because they found the perpetrator. He's sitting in the car next to them. Uh, I mean, just no shock, no looking to the scene. Uh, so nonchalant. It's extraordinary and so different from what he, his tactic at the start. I think he stopped that tactic because, again, he got such a good response from the officers that, you know, he thinks it's it's done now and he doesn't need to go back to that tactic. There, that's all I got now. 
Greg, what were you telling us earlier? We talked. We, we were going through some things earlier about the backstory on this. What el what else has this guy been into? What else has been going on? Yeah, with? hold on one second. Yeah, this family is really prominent. So his, I think it's his father was the last prosecutor. But from 1920 to 2006, they held the office of prosecutor for that county. So really big legacy of legal family. Um, he's got some ghosts in his past. If you go look, he's got some things around like a housekeeper who died that they had some life insurance policy on. He's got some other stuff. There's a ch uh, kid who his son went to school with who ended up dying. And there was rumor that his son was involved. And there was the case was closed, but has been reopened by the district attorney as a result of evidence they found during this case. He was estranged from his wife at the time of the murder. And if you go read the headlines, they say she was lured out to there. Apparently, he asked her to visit his terminally ill father. And she said, no, she wanted to be in public because he was acting fishy. I mean, there's a ton of stuff in here. Just go out and look for yourself. There's more than one weapon involved. There's a ton of stuff in this case. There's just a lot for you to go look at. We could spend an entire hour just refuting and figuring out what's on the list of rumors and checklists. As Chase often says, we're not the forensics panel. We're telling you what we see in this video. And there's plenty. So this is good enough. So, uh, Greg, note to self, always get life insurance for domestic help. It's not odd. Not yeah, odd for sure. For sure. Not yeah. Odd. Yeah. I've never heard of that before. Has I've heard never of heard of it before. before. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. Why wouldn't you? I mean. <laughs> wow. I don't. Just in case, you know. I mean, I, I don't know how they make a bit of money out of your domestic help just in case they die. Yeah. There's so much information out here on these guys. I think there's even a lot more like he's got financial crimes that if he were to get off these charges, he's still got financial crimes to face. There's a ton of stuff that they've allowed into evidence. Just go watch. I, look, I don't want to be the guy who misquotes something. I probably have misquoted some of that, but just go read. There's so much out there on this guy. You could spend all day trying to figure out all the craziness going on in this case. So the eyewitness is you. What all was around, um, Paul, when you walked up? Blood. Any, any other, anything else? I mean, there was some body mm -hmm. things, yes, sir. I mean, like any other evidence. I know you said the phone fell out the pocket, um, but did you see anything else that didn't belong or shouldn't belong or that wasn't part of Paul? Mm, no, sir. Not, no, not the... <laughs> No, sir. How about Maggie? No, sir. You didn't see anything around them? What made you come out here tonight? Um, I went to my mom's a late stage Alzheimer's patient. My dad's in the hospital. Um, my mom gets anxious when she does. I went to check on them and Maggie. Maggie's a dog lover and okay. she fools with the dogs and I knew she'd gone to the kennel. I was at the house. I left the house and went to my mom's <clears throat> for just a little while. Tried to call her when I left. <coughs> Texted her, no response. Um, when I got back to the house, the house was, obviously nobody was in there. So I figured they're still up here fooling around. Paul was um, gonna be getting set up to plant. Our sunflower seeds got sprayed and died and he was refiguring to do, to plant the sunflower seeds. Okay. So I came back up here and I drove up and saw <clears throat> and called. <clears throat> A, an ID. Yeah, it's, I, okay. I don't know. I thought I, was, I, thought I read this, that was his friend. Hang on a second. Up to this point, we're, right now we're talking about how we thought the guy in the back seat was was a police officer, but it was just odd. And Greg, what did you say about I, that? I think guy? it's his friend. I think it's his friend. I think right. it's his friend. I, I don't remember, but I think it's his friend. I'll he's got his that. shirt open like he's Robert Wagner. The only thing he's missing is those little scarves that go there, or, or an ask. <laughs> what do you call that thing? An ascot? Is that what's uh, what's the yes, scarf they put cravat. on? Mark cravat. Oh, I call it cravat. <laughs> That's all he's yeah. missing. Plus, they need to get him some kind of COVID, you know, something on him. This guy, man, he's back there. <laughs> Sounds like something's up with him. Sounds like this may be some of his last days. Oof. Uh, okay.
Sorry about that. I should cut all that. Maybe out. it's code for shut up. You sound stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. And, it, and so I'm going to say this about him too. A little while his knee comes out. Look how shiny his knee is. It's almost like a mirror. It looks, it looks like it's so weird, man. It looks like, it looks like a polished piece of wood when it comes out his, his knee. You'll see it in a few minutes. Okay. I thought he was a cop. I don't even say anything about it, but man, I hope he's not, but geez, he's really got his thing together, man. All right. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is the first time we see him touch his face, touches his nose. Look, we, you'll hear people say if a person touches their nose or lying. No, we, we're not those folks. What we're saying is look for a deviation in baseline and ask yourself why. It's a pertinent question and a hard question. Why did you come out here tonight? Well, that's a good question. And he uses his left hand, touches his face. Suddenly, he does one of the most powerful male adapters that exist. I call it butterfly thighs. And if you ever want to see men will flip their legs, their thighs in and out that way, younger men do it a lot. It also includes your genitals when you start moving your legs and it has a lot of impact. So that's a big comforting move for a guy to do. You'll see it a lot in younger sports players when they're being interviewed, when you watch them on night shows and that kind of thing. All an adapter is, is a way for you to release nervous energy. And if we do them enough, they become habitual. So if you don't know what yours are, the way you release nervous energy, ask someone next to you. Ask someone who knows you well, because they know what you do when you're releasing nervous energy. Maybe you pick your nails, flip your hair, do something like that. Then he starts to tell a long story that has no pertinence to anything we're talking about. And that is, I went to see my mama. My mama's sick. She's got dementia. And he goes on and 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 on. And he gives you the cookbook. We call that chaff and redirect because an aircraft drops chaff to hope a missile will follow it rather than the story. That's what he's doing. He's dropping lots of details, hoping you'll follow that. And that's odd usually. But again, my wife and son are lying 100 yards away dead. Somebody murdered them. And I'm going to tell you about my mom's jello she had for lunch. Come on. And he's adapting like all hell with that issue, with his hands and with the other. He goes to that dog lover. She fools with a dog. Boom. One shoulder rises. We hadn't seen that yet. We see a single shoulder. We often associate that with discomfort or not comfortable in the information they're sharing. He does a pause. He does a down left, looks down left, which we associate with internal voice. And he does a head scratch. We associate all of those things with thinking, with giving yourself time to think. He doesn't say what he saw, what he saw over with her, either with words or with body language or with tone. None of that. And I think the female law enforcement officer in the back senses it because watch her cross her abdomen in discomfort as he's telling that story. I bet if you went and talked to them, it'd say this guy, day one, we thought he whacked her. We thought he killed his wife. That's exactly what I think you'd see. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, there's a cascade of negative statements, victim statements, really. The parents are ill and anxious. Uh, Maggie's a dog lover, doesn't love him, loves the dogs. Uh, she falls with the dogs. That's negative. Rather than going, she looks after those dogs so well. It's she falling with the dogs. Um, and he's texted her and there's no response. So she's not attentive to him. And then Paul uh, is associated with sunflowers dying. So again, not being able to, I mean, that will, more of this story will come out and maybe he's laying down this story early, but essentially everybody is inept. <laughs> Ultimately, parents are non-functioning, uh, wife loves uh, animals and messes around and doesn't answer the phone and Paul can't look after sunflowers. So really casting uh, um, a bad light on the victims there and and him being around people who can't look after themselves or the things that are important or him. This is very different from um, uh, a video that we looked at earlier uh, this week around the, um, the, the boyfriend of Nicola Bully who uh, went missing, um, maybe is still missing, who knows at this point. Um, but in that particular film, he didn't create any negative attitude about this missing person. No negative attitude about the victim. No, you know, she goes for silly walks with the dog and probably messed up somewhere. And so it's so different here. Again, that alone uh, is a loud, <laughs> a loud flag. You can't have a loud flag, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's a loud flag. It's a loud, loud flag. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? No? Chase? Yep. I'll go. Thank you. 
<laughs> uh, this is detail overload. There's a few things I want you to notice as you go through the video again in just a second. Number one, the detail and the, just the chronology of everything is loaded and piled high. But none of the details are about finding out who did this. There is no request to investigate the scene or talk about the word murder. It's the last word in the world that he wants to come out of his mouth at a moment like this. And the confirmation glances back and forth where he's checking that detective with every detail in this clip, especially just to make sure it, he's buying it are just a classic hallmark of deception. It's one of the things we look for when we see a lot of other behaviors and they're outside of baseline, like we're seeing here. And when he says, obviously, nobody was in there, I think he's telling us, potentially, this is my opinion, as this entire video is just an opinion, I think he's telling us it was obvious to him that nobody was going to be in that house. Then finally, we have something called severity softening and lack of detail. There's tons of minute, perfect little details about the intricate process he's going through with these sunflower seeds. Then what's the detail on the crime scene? Here's the detail on the crime scene in this video. Word for word, I came up and saw and called. That's the difference between sunflower seeds versus dead family members here. Scott? You know what, Greg, when you, when, when you, now that you've told us this guy in the back isn't a cop, this makes so much sense the way she's acting. And do you know what's making it? I, this is what I think. Here I go off my rants. But you know what makes me think she knows something's up? Think about it for a minute. You guys think about this for a second. What's he wearing? A white t-shirt. Where's he come from? He's come from two people who have, who have been killed in a, it's a bloody crime scene that he's put his hands on, that he's been messing with. There's no blood on this guy. Nowhere. Right. And he's not using that Kleenex. He's not looking at his hands to make sure there's no blood. He's washed his hands. That's what's happened. He's changed clothes. Yeah. Well, yep. He's yeah, he'll tell you he went back to the house afterward. Yep, yep. Yep, that's what that's what's happened. I don't know if that if that's if he he doesn't talk about it in here anyway. That's what's bothering her. No. That's what I bet that because she can't see him, so it's something that happened beforehand that's got her thinking something's up with this guy. That's what I th that's what I think is, is happening there. I just thought about that a second ago. That yeah. So anyway, that that's what I think is going on there. But back to the body language part of it. Um, after the question, you're right, Greg, he touches the middle part of his head there, the, the middle of his brow there. I haven't seen that yet, this, other than, than rubbing his whole face. And then he does this really quick re request for approval. That's another one of Greg's things where your eyebrows go up as you're look, looking to get something okay, or you're asking a question, you need some information. His, his eyebrows go up and he starts adapting, I guess, what you call that butterfly thing, Greg. And then he starts using his Kleenex as an adapter, which we talked about what happened earlier. Uh, earlier, we talked about that was gonna happen. A whole lot of movement in comparison to the baseline we've seen up at this point, up to this point, because he's been fairly still up till now. This is where it makes me think something would be up with this. Then he starts going down this list of stuff, and his voice is, uh -huh, and then this, uh -huh. it's, just, it's, just, it's just a list. He's rehearsed this. He knew what he was going to say when he came into this. When this question came up, he's, he's got his list of things that happened and things that he was going to talk about. We see a couple of those little shoulder shrugs, a single shoulder shrug here and a single one there and then a full one there. But the thing is with shoulder shrugs, and you'll hear a lot of things about them, but here's what we are under the impression or, or understand that shoulder shrugs indicate is when one shoulder goes up really quickly, that, that says, I don't, I'm not sure about this answer. I'm not sure what I'm saying. If it goes up and stays, like it will sometimes, it stays for about a second or second half. Same with a double shoulder shrug. It stays up for a second. If not, it just comes up and down really quickly. That indicates the person isn't sure about their answer. Not that they're being deceptive, but it just says they're not sure about what that answer is. And I think he's afraid. He's, he's trying to make sure he's covering every base as he's thinking about that. I guess he, in his brain, maybe he's thinking, okay, I've got that covered. Let me see what else. Yeah, I got that. I think as he goes down this list, that's why we're seeing those things. Um, but throughout this, he still hasn't used that Kleenex for what you use them for. 
And I think he's, I think, I think he changed clothes. I think he washed up and changed clothes. That's what I, that's what I think on that one. Let's see what happens. All right, we good? Mm-hmm. The eyewitness is you. What made you come out here tonight? Um, I went to my mom's a late stage Alzheimer's patient. My dad's in the hospital. Um, my mom gets anxious when she does. I went to check on them and Maggie. Maggie's a dog lover. Okay. She fools with the dogs. And I knew she'd gone to the kennel. I was at the house. I left the house and went to my mom's <clears throat> for just a little while. Tried to call her when I left. <coughs> Texted her, no response. Um, when I got back to the house, the house was obviously nobody was in there. So I figured they're still up here fooling around. Paul was. Um, going to be getting set up to plant our sunflower seeds got sprayed and died and he was refiguring to do to plant the sunflower seeds okay. so i came back up here and i drove up and saw <clears throat> and called Had Maggie and Paul been arguing over anything? No. What was their relationship like? Wonderful. Wonderful. How about yours and Maggie's? Wonderful. I mean, I'm sure we had little things here and there, but we had a wonderful marriage, mm -hmm. wonderful relationship. And yours and Paul's relationship? As good as it could be. How old was Paul? 22. Okay. You know his date of birth? I do. April 11th, 96 is his brother's. April 14th, 99 is Paul's. And how about, what's Maggie's full name? Margaret Branstetter Murdoch. And her date of birth, sir? September 15th, 1968. Have y'all been having any problems out here? Trespassers, none people I, breaking in? None that I know of. The only thing that what comes to my mind is my son Paul was in a boat wreck uh, a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. And there's been a, you know, he was charged with being uh, arrested for being the driver. There's been a lot of negative publicity about that. And there's been a lot of people online just really vile stuff, but when Paul's out and about, I mean, people routinely, I don't think I know the full story, um, so I don't think they give it to me, but I mean, he's been punched and hit and just attacked a lot, so, you know, but I mean, nothing like this. Yeah. <laughs> this is a mistake, John. <laughs> I just, I tell you, there's blood out there. I think it might have been two guns. I don't know. Mm -hmm. You just gonna have to trust me on that one. Mm -hmm. Cut that out. I shouldn't have said whack, but sorry. Yeah, what are you gonna do? All right, Chase, late. what do you got? There's some strange head movement here. There's shaking and nodding mixed together, which you do not see in this culture. And I think this is confused on his part, of which behavior to display. And you can confirm this confusion by the fact that he starts doing what I call intent checking. He's glancing repeatedly at the detective here in this instance to determine what kind of intent the detective has and the angle that he's taking with some of these questions. And when he offers this, uh, the brother's birthday, this is a miniature resume statement here. And he's offering the details that suggest that he's a caring and good father. See, I know both of their birthdays. And I think he's doing that mostly unconsciously. And when there's a question about the trespassers, the response to the question is an insertion of ambiguity into the case. Think about it. If I asked you if strangers come into your house often, 
your answer would be no, probably not. So I would say this is maybe uh, going on Mark's uh, scale, maybe a dark, medium, medium light or a uh, weight flag. Did you say heavy flag earlier? <laughs> no, it was the sound of it, but I like uh, the yeah. of it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so this like is that. maybe a volume nine or a 8.5 on the 10 scale flag. And I don't know how big this property is, which is one of the reasons here. We can call this maybe a, a medium flag here. There's an in inability to identify a perpetrator. There is no concern to find out who did this at all. He wants to keep the net cast as wide as possible for here for what might have happened. And he still won't say murder. He skips over the murder every single possible time that it comes up every time here. Mark. Uh, yeah, so I love this one where he, where his his leg starts getting excited. It starts going up and down. Bit of the in and out as well there, Greg as well. But it, it's it's even more joyous around this idea of introducing the boat story because I think you know he's now laying down some some ideas of of you know potential uh, trouble that may lead to a perpetrator. And I think he looks off to his side there, not only to check intent, but to work out how's my story landing on this one. Is this one, is this one I should go a little bit further down that my, you know, my son may well have an enemy uh, out there. Oh, we also, this is off baseline as well. We also start to see uh, his hand uh, nearest to the driver, to the, to the officer, um, just becomes more active. And I hadn't seen his hand that active and that descriptive. So I think he's becoming quite excited and buoyant around how this story might work out from, for him. This is off uh, baseline for me. Uh, Scott, what you got on this one? All right. Here's where he alludes to the, alludes to the murders being be, due to that boat accident. That's cold. When you're you're trying to blame something on something your son did, that's that that says a lot about this guy, his personality type. And when he asks about the when he's asked about the relationship with his son, his head shakes and it turns no, and then it starts turning like Chase was saying into like a little bobblehead doll. So there's a lot going on there at that point as well. And that's probably true. The the relationship is as is as good as it could be you know as it could possibly be and that's because i don't they probably didn't get along very well so it was as good as it could possibly be because maybe the the child didn't like him maybe the wife didn't like him because he says the same thing about her as well as good as it could possibly be and he's telling the truth i think there and it was as good as it could possibly be apparently she's moved out and lives where'd you say she was greg living in the what in their beach house i read she was estranged and living in their beach house yeah, doesn't bring that up at all. So there's a, th there's a lot going on there that he's not bringing up. So I, I'm sure it was as good as it could possibly be. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I couldn't pay a person to illustrate baseline better than this guy does. He's asked two questions about his relationship with his son and about his relationship with his wife. And in both instances, he says, wonderful. But go back, watch his body language when he says wonderful. When he says wonderful about his son, it's pretty straight body language. When he says wonderful about his wife, now we know that they're estranged. He breaks eye contact, moves away to the side. His face changes, and he Com is entirely different when he's saying that. Then he dr he's drawing away as he says it. Then he qualifies it. I forget what he says exactly. Well, we had our moments, and, and, and. And then he gets back into those facts and deliberate language. And the minute he gets back into those facts and deliberate language, then he's okay. He's answering factual questions. His baseline comes back. When he gets down to the mechanics and he starts to tell that boat story, his thighs start moving. As Mark said, he starts to march in place with that one foot and his blink rate increases. He does a left shoulder shrug again when he says nothing like this. Well, of course, nothing like this. Yeah, they hit him. They said bad things to him and never came out and killed him. So all this we see a pattern. We see his baseline when he's comfortable. We see a deviation. And we get a chance to see two very different answers using the same English. If if you think that body language is hokum, watch that. Tell me it's hokum. Tell me you can't see something that's going on. Two different messages, same words. That's all I got. That's a tie. Beautiful. And you take both. Beautiful. <clears throat> Olympics. <laughs> You're taking it so serious. <laughs> the eyewitness is you. Had Maggie and Paul been arguing over anything? No. 
what was their relationship like? Wonderful. Wonderful. How about yours and Maggie's? Wonderful. I mean, I'm sure we had little things here and there, but we had a wonderful marriage, mm-hmm. wonderful relationship. In yours and Paul's relationship? As good as it could be. How old was Paul? 22. Okay. You know his date of birth? I do. April 11th, 96 is his brother's. April 14th, 99 is Paul's. How about, what's Maggie's full name? Margaret Brandstetter Murdoch. And her date of birth, sir? September 15, 1968. <clears throat> Have y'all been having any problems out here? Trespassers, none people that, breaking in. None that I know of. The only thing that what comes to my mind is my son Paul was in a boat wreck uh, a couple years ago, mm-hmm. and there's been a, you know, he was charged with being uh, arrested for being the driver. There's been a lot of negative publicity about that, and there's been a lot of people online just really vile stuff, but. When Paul's out and about, I mean, people routinely, I don't think I know the full story, um, so I don't think they give it to me, but, I mean, he's been punched and hit and just attacked a lot, so, you know, but, I mean, nothing like this. Yeah. Uh, So is there anybody that you can think of that we need to talk to tonight? Is there a name that comes to mind? I mean, I can't tell you anybody that I'm overly suspicious of <coughs> off the top of my head. Okay. You know? Um, I mean, this is such a stupid thing. I'm even embarrassed to say it. But it just didn't make any sense. I just hired a guy out here. Mm-hmm. And... He really he wasn't cutting the mustard, but I hadn't told him this yet. Paul's been working with him a lot. He killed the sunflower seeds in our dove field just recently, which is why Paul was here doing this. He told Paul a story the other day about how when he was in high school, he got in a fight with some black guys. And the FBI undercover team observed him fighting those guys and put him on an undercover team with three Navy SEALs and that their job was to kill radical Black Panthers and they did that from Myrtle Beach to Savannah. Now, I really don't think this guy, you know, Mm -hmm. is probably the person, but that's just so friggin'. Yeah, that's kind of far-fetched story. It's weird, but he was off today. Okay. He took his daddy to the doctor. What's his name? C.B. Rowe. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Right at the beginning of this clip, you can see him try to adjust himself to look more comfortable and more relaxed. The moment he does this, you're going to see his body completely disagree with him. It's going to move his hand back almost just without his consent to protect the groin and the femoral artery here. And do you know what other emotion that would be coming up here that's missing is anger. Anger would be present here. And he's got a huge problem identifying a perpetrator here who did this. And he wants to keep the ambiguity as high as possible. And I don't think there's any desire whatsoever for them to find for him to get them to find the person that did this. And just pay close attention to what is not being said here. And I think, in my opinion, you might hear a murderer talking if you just listen to what's not being said and what's being ignored. Greg? Yeah, there's no anger. There's no rush. There's no urgency. None of that. As a matter of fact, listen to the cadence of his storytelling slow down. Slow down. This is... What has it been, 30 minutes of him sitting in a car? I would be looking for help. 
he gives into you know. There's a new word, a new phrase he's injecting that indicates he's comfortable and thinking and talking, and that's his filler words starting to come out. He doesn't. It's not scram. It's not scrambled. It's not compressed. None of that's going on. There's more concern in the cop's brow and in the guy in the back seat than there isn't his. This is his family. There's that zygomatic muscle again that we said makes your face want to smile. It sure looks like he's almost smiling when he's telling that story. Well, we know that earlier. What the study said was if your frontalis muscle was down in, in sadness and that, that was probably an indicator. He also starts to turtle, chase after he goes back and he gets forced into that position. Then he shrinks a bit. And we say turtling, your head and your torso shrink and make your target smaller. This cadence is unlike anything else we've heard. I think it's because he has already been rehearsing this story and he knows what he's going to say. This guy who told me this story and... Well, if, you, if you're trying to figure out who to point somebody to, then you'd have a lot of details. When I would just say, hey, there's a guy who works for me. He's a little shady. Maybe you want to go check him, if that were the case. I don't think that's the case. And this is the first time, the single first time, he's used his right hand to illustrate anything when he's talking about this guy. Uh, it's been at his groin, as I call it, protecting the precious this entire time. That's another red flag. Scott, what do you got? All right. Now he's trying to put the suspicion on somebody else. He brings in this other guy that, that worked for him, that he just hired, that isn't working out. And again, we're not seeing, like you were saying, Greg, we're not seeing things we should be seeing in here. We're not seeing the emotions someone goes through as they relive this experience of what just happened, the most horrible things ever happened to him. We don't see that uncontro uncontrollable sobbing, no wailing and crying, nothing. We don't even see one tear. And he has, and, and I've been looking nothing we don't see he doesn't tear up there's nothing in there there's no tears at all we don't see that detachment you'll see from when someone goes through something that bad why uh, no why did this happen going back to that and talking about how good they were he's not talking about the things oh oh he loved this or she loved he she talked about the dogs earlier but he didn't really focus on that he'd be talking about how the, the things that he thought of her and what they reminded what this reminded him of her she liked to do this and he loved to do that that's what he would talk about a lot especially with this amount of time going by in an interview like this right and here's where that usually happens especially when you're the first you got him in the car and you're the first ones talking to him that's what you see in here. There's none of that. None of that. None of that's happening. He should be distraught. <laughs> this guy's not distraught. He sounds like he's talking about some things that, you know, like when we tell stories, it sounds like he's talking about something that happened last week. Guess what happened last week? This. And then going through it, he just gives this list of, of things and never tears up. Doesn't use his, his Kleenex either. Nothing's looking the way it should look. I keep going back to that, but that's I think that's the most important thing here. Nothing looks as it should look up to now. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, this is a beautiful scene. You can't even write this stuff. It's, it's, it's genius. The, uh, the officer says, look, is there anybody that we should be looking at? And while he says that, he covers his mouth because he knows, I think, that he's looking at the perpetrator right now. So he's even blocking himself to the to the lie of the question that he's asking there. This guy comes up with an amazing story. It's, it's a brilliant story. I, I don't know whether he's making it up completely on his on his own or this, this guy who had took the day off uh, today, um, had actually told him this story, but it's a brilliant idea for a story whereby you got a kid high school kid, you know, gets in a fight, uh, FBI see him, They've got a whole bunch of Navy SEALs and they go after the Black Panthers together all the way. And I love this line. They did that from Myrtle Beach to Savannah. It's just a great, I can, you know, I can just picture it in my head. The Navy SEALs and this high school kid, Myrtle Beach. <laughs> Myrtle Beach is fantastic. I just, all that rough stuff happening in Myrtle Beach. And then all the way down, I think they have to go through, through Charlotte or something like that, or Charleston or something. I don't know. I, I can't remember. Charleston. But yeah, yeah, but I'm I'm just picturing the scene there as well. The awful carnage. Hilton Head. Hilton Head. <laughs> yeah. Awful carnage up and down the, the coast that's going on. So I mean what a what an amazing, amazing story. And and the cop again, like, does a double take on it. Just does it like, what the hell's what the hell's going on here? Uh, and 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 he does say, look, I'm embarrassed to say this. I'm embarrassed to even put this idea forward. But then he goes. Um, yeah, I, I felt that story was a bit off, but he did take the day off today. 
Like, what a brilliant <laughs> equation. It's a nutty story. Obviously, it's utter nuts, but he did take the day off. So I think you should be looking at him. Just brilliant, brilliant, brilliant logic. Love it. Let's have another. You don't know about the FBI Navy SEAL High School recruiter killer teams? No. No, it's British no. Shores Club. It's everybody, Shores everybody Club. knows that story in the US. That's like a classic, all the way yeah. from uh, from oh, yeah. Myrtle Beach to. Uh, I, no, because well, last time I was in Myrtle Beach, nobody boarded up. So uh, well, they, they have British. to sell cookies. I you think can't to talk about or something. You know? We don't talk <laughs> no. about. Them. Oh, you're too British. Oh, that's. I'm sorry. That was a Girl Scouts. Somebody sells cookies. <laughs> right. I was in it, but they kicked me out for crying. The eyewitness is you. <laughs> <laughs> So is there anybody that you can think of that we need to talk to tonight? Is there a name that comes to mind? I mean, I can't tell you anybody that I'm overly suspicious of off the top of my head. Okay. You know? Um, I mean, this is such a stupid thing. I'm even embarrassed to say it. But it just didn't make any sense i just hired a guy out here mm -hmm. and he really he wasn't cutting the mustard but i hadn't told him this yet paul's been working with him a lot he killed the sunflower seeds in our dove field just recently which is why paul was here doing this he told paul a story the other day about how when he was in high school he got in a fight with some black guys and the FBI undercover team observed him fighting those guys and put him on an undercover team with three Navy SEALs. And that their job was to kill radical Black Panthers. And they did that from Myrtle Beach to Savannah. Now, I really don't think this guy, you know, mm -hmm. is probably the person, but that's just so friggin yeah that's kind of far-fetched story it's weird but he was off today okay he took his daddy to the doctor what's his name cb Rowe. do y'all store any weapons out here um we don't store them but they're you know they're frequently out here mm -hmm. i need to find out if there were any out here because i know there was a shotgun there was a 12 gauge shotgun out here uh, I'll have to find out exactly when that was. I think it got put up, but I'm not positive. What did that shotgun look like? Uh, it was a camouflage. Oh, uh, I, I want to say it was a Benelli or maybe a Beretta. I can't remember which brand it is. But I don't think it was out here okay. recently. But I'm not positive. And the, the shotgun that you had when deputies pulled up, where did that gun come from? I went to the house and I got a gun, probably overreacting, but... And was that when you pulled up and saw them? Was, no, I, I mean, I came out and I mean, I called 911 first. Mm -hmm. Talked to them for a little while, and then I told her. You told her that I was that I was going to go to the house. Okay. And that I would let authorities know when they got here that I had a gun. Okay. <laughs> All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, uh, just one thing, which is which is he's really screwed himself now because now he's bringing up the murder weapon. How easy was that? How easy was that? Gunny guns out here? Yeah. And he's mentioned a shotgun. And I'm going to assume from what I heard before as to the condition of certainly one of the bodies that a shotgun was was used. And so, uh, yeah, he's already bringing up the murder weapon and what it might look at look like and could be, you know, certain brand. Um, I, you know, I can't believe that he's he's not been clever throughout any of this so i don't know why i'm getting why i was even going to say there that he's been so clever and now he's being so dumb because ultimately he's been so dumb throughout it yeah that's all i got on that one greg what you got 
Yeah, and for those of you who don't know weapons, a shotgun is harder to trace as a murder weapon because it doesn't rifle whatever you're using. You can have rifle slugs, but likely not what was used. And those rifles, on the other hand, like that blackout that they were using, does create patterning on the bullet. So if you have the weapon and the bullet, you can figure out which weapon was used. That's part of the reason why that might be an issue. This cop is even looking a little frustrated. Look at the, at the brow. And suddenly this guy talks like a lawyer. Do you have weapons? Do you store weapons there? Well, not stored. Hmm. Well, you know the intent of the question, but you're answering it that way. His hands have moved now to where he's got kind of a little gentle hug going on. And he's chaffing when he talks about weapons. When he starts to talk about weapons, his blink rate rises and he starts to adapt as they're talking about this weapon specifically, this shotgun. You see his foot starting to tap and hop. His hand is adapting, meaning releasing nervous energy at his stomach. And after he's asked specifically about, did you have a shotgun? Watch that right leg. It is going crazy. His breathing becomes more rapid and pronounced, and he even loses fluency as he's running out of words at what he told her. His blink rate's higher. This is a hot spot. This, and back to why did you come here, and a couple of others are real hot spots at this point. You got to pay attention when something jumps off the plate. This is a loud red flag, Mark, to use yours. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I've got a couple loud flags here, too. <laughs> There's more ambiguity being injected here about the shotgun. Ambiguity about the weapon, not certainty. So and a desire to help the case means that you would specifically state the facts without ambiguity. And then he's saying, I got a gun. It was probably overreacting. He's explaining motive again to perform an action. Innocent people don't feel the need to stop the story and explain motive to every action that they take. And grabbing a gun after finding family members that are murdered is not an overreaction in this culture that we're seeing here in this video. I think he went back to get a different gun uh, that was from the house so he could be holding one uh, when the police showed up, in my opinion. Definitely not a fact. Scott? All right, you guys covered everything I was going to cover. Keep it from being boring. Let's move on. <laughs> the eyewitness is you. Do y'all store any weapons out here? Um, We don't store them, but they're, you know, they're frequently out here. Mm -hmm. I need to find out if there were any out here because I know there was a shotgun. There was a 12-gauge shotgun out here. Uh, I'll have to find out exactly when that was. I think it got put up, but I'm not positive. What did that shotgun look like? Uh, it was a camouflage. Um, I, I want to say it was a Benelli or maybe a Beretta. I can't remember which brand it is. But I don't think it was out here okay. recently. But I'm not positive. And the, the shotgun that you had when deputies pulled up, where did that come, come from? I went to the house and I got a gun, probably overreacting, but... And was that when you pulled up and saw them? Was, no, I, I mean, I came out and, I mean, I called 911 first. Mm -hmm. Talked to them for a little while, and then I told her. You told her that I was that I was going to go to the house. Okay. And that I would let authorities know when they got here that I had a gun. Okay. <laughs> what did you do today? Were you at the office or? Nope, I was home. I came home. Paul and I messed around. I, I, uh, I was up at the house. I, Laid down, took a nap on the couch, probably, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes. I got up, I called Maggie, didn't get an answer, and I left to go to my mom's. She had said she might ride with me, but she normally doesn't when I go over there. Um, and I think I texted her. 
and she's very good about answering the phone so that was odd or calling me back mm -hmm. so that was odd but it wasn't that big a deal now what time was that what, what time was what that you sent her a text message I checked, texted her at 9.08, going to check on M, be right back. And then I texted her at 9.47, that must be when I started to come back. I think I called her before that, but let me make sure. Uh, pretty sure that I called her 9.45, and then I tried Paul. And then, no, I think that was riding. I think that might have been riding over there. Ten o three. I mean, my calls are right here. Yeah. So, um, obviously, this is when. This is when I, at Yes, sir. Ah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Take a Anybody else want some gum? No, sir. You don't have any water, do you, Danny? Sure. I'm sorry. I don't need it. If you, behind Danny's head, is a case of water. It's not a big deal. Yeah, I got some. The trial's going on right now? Yes. Yep. It's live on that Law and Crime Network thing. Oh, really? Yeah, and Court TV cool. and just about everywhere. Yeah. That's cool. Law and Crime lets use their stuff. That's We should give them a shout out. And, yeah. Uh, our stuff below. So. Yep, for sure. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm going to keep this one pretty short. He's adapting all the way up until he gets to the point they give him a freebie. The minute he gets to where he gets to now go back to baseline, things that are matters of the phone record, this is a guy who's smart enough. He's been in the business long enough. He knows that's a matter of fact. He's just going to run through it. And Chase, I'll use one of your favorites. You can tell when he relaxes because he goes to abdominal breathing. It's pronounced. And they've let him now off the hook. His brain is relaxed. There's no emotion whatsoever. I, I Still, what is missing is a, hey, can we just hurry? Can we get back to this instead of talking about all my phone records? They're a matter of record here. Boom. That's it. <clears throat> Scott, what do you got? All right, I think we're seeing a very subtle change in his baseline up to, uh, to what we've seen so far. His cadence is sped up, his voice tone's a little bit higher. He's the most relaxed he's been so far. Still no use of that Kleenex. Still garden is growing, still doing the same things we talked about at the top. His blink rate is, is still low. Everything we talked about at the top is still going on at this point. And I think it's because, like you were saying, Greg, this is what he envisioned happening. He, he's done now. He's gone through his list of stuff that he's supposed to talk about, you know, and while he begins, starts answering, you see him lean back and that head goes back and rests up against the headrest back there. He, he's, he's relaxing, but I think at the same time, he's sort of bracing himself against the back of that headrest and his legs start moving back and forth. And I think this indicates the stress of this, of this specific situation because almost everything changes up to this point. And again, they're, they're very subtle. But those are the things we're looking for and listening for. And after that, he asked him for gum and water. You know, I think that's a, it's almost like a reward for himself. He's 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 crossed the finish line. He's reached his goal. He said everything he's supposed to that he's thought about saying on his list, the things he's rehearsed, his story. We've heard him walk through. And like you were saying, Chase, too many details, man. Way too many details for what for what had happened from as we look at, at this as a whole. 
So I think he feels like he's crossed the finish line. And he's like, yeah, instead of dunking water on himself, he's asking for water and he's chewing gum. Yeah. And, which makes sense because I'm sure his, his mouth got dry during all that, during the nervous parts of it. But I think he's relaxed now. So that's why he's, he's, his brain is letting him do things outside the situ- of that situation. No sobbing. No, uh, you know, what happened. No hand wringing. Nothing we should be seeing in here that, that is, we're seeing here, I guess you'd say. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so lots of upward inflection. Paul and I messed around, probably, and and odd. So I think he's unsure around the story he's trying to project at this point, not quite sure if it's going to stick. Then the female officer in the back says, asks him something about time. Then we get a down inflection. What time was what? So I think he now knows that he's now going to be nailed down to some times. I think some of those times, some of the phone information is working for him. And I think some of it can't be reconciled. If I remember rightly, I think he he turns and opens the door and kind of spits out the door or maybe even vomits a bit. I'm not not quite sure. But there's some kind of opening of the door, I think. And um, so I think there's a he can't reconcile some of the he sees some information that he can reconcile on there and there's some stuff that isn't going to work for him and there may be some panic there so either he has to lean out to block that and have a think about it then comes back looks off to reconcile like how am i gonna how am i gonna deal with this and then the phone goes away uh chase what do you got on this one i agree with you guys y'all covered a lot of it uh there's more ambiguity insertion here but the way that he points to the call log directly and then mentions it, that's interesting to me. I'm betting that we find out something is off about this call log. The trial's going on right now, so I don't think he's been on the stand yet. But I'm willing to bet that we find something is interesting about this call log. And he calls it out as if it's an offering, much like he did with the camouflage shotgun. It's an offering. Well, there's something here that you can look at. Those two things, call log and shotgun, were the two things that really stood out to where he kind of offered something up to assist the police. That is a heavy flag for me. Is that everybody? I think so. Greg won that one. Stole it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, man. The hell is that? The eyewitness is you. And what did you do today? Were you at the office or? No, nope, I was home. I came home. Paul and I messed around. I, I, uh, I was up at the house. I laid down, took a nap on the couch. Probably, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes. I got up. I called Maggie. Didn't get an answer. And I left to go to my mom's. She had said she might ride with me, but she normally doesn't when I go over there. Um, And I think I texted her. And she's very good about answering the phone, so that was odd, or calling me back. Mm -hmm. So that was odd, but it wasn't that big a deal. Now, what time was that? What time was what? That you sent her a text message. All right. Um, I checked, texted her at 908, going to check on M, be right back. And then I texted her at 947. That must be when I started to come back i think i called her before that but let me make sure Uh, pretty sure that i called her 9 45 and then i tried paul and then no i think that was riding I think that might have been riding over there. Ten o three. 
I mean, my calls are right here. Yeah. So, um, obviously, this is when, this is when I, at 10.06, Yes, sir. Ah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. Take the call. Anybody else want some gum? <sighs> you don't have any water, do you, Danny? Sure. I'm sorry. I don't need it. If you, behind Danny's head, is a oh. case of water. It's not a big deal. Yeah, I got some. Um, this one's hard. But when you first saw Paul, you said you tried to flip him over. Was he laying on his back or on his stomach? Just like he, he just, just like he is. So you weren't able to move him. Okay. No, oh, ma'am. Okay. And did he help Maggie a lot out here with the animals? He helped everybody with everything. Okay, so it was kind of routine for him to be out here as well. In this the evening. this place is his absolute passion. Okay. I tried to turn him and then I tried to, then I checked him and I I mean I, I, I think I already knew but I checked him <coughs> and when you pulled first pulled into the property did you come from this direction where all our police cars are or which way did you come in I went to the house okay and then I came from the house this way straight here yes ma'am okay I mean where my vehicle was mm -hmm. parked is Probably is where it was. Okay. M well, no, maybe not mm -hmm. exactly, but it was pretty close because okay. I came back the same route. That's right, because you went back to get your shotgun when I came okay. back. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, just a few things. Again, no grief, not in this forehead, not in the sides of the mouth. Look, there's lots of ways to show grief. You know, there's all kinds of ways that people show grief. We associate that with grief muscle. There's a ton of stuff you can do with your face to show you're sad, that you're disappointed. Something. I mean, we know he can because we've seen him use those parts of his face. So he's not Botoxed out of existence, although maybe that's part of it. But there's not even concern in his brow. None. None. When she's talking about rolling over your dead child, none, none. This is within moments. And I'll say you can be shocked. People behave differently, but very few people in life chase combat. A guy you don't know you find dead like that, that has an impact. It has an impact on people. There's no renewed emotion, no help me. He could be talking about a car accident, the way he's responding to this. And then I came out, my taillight was busted out. It's about what I hear. There's no shock at how horrific this is, because if I did it, I desensitize after I've seen it. I probably didn't expect it. Look, my opinion, this guy's just talked himself into a hole. And and he thinks he's at the end of it because he goes back into Aussie mode. He starts doing the yeah, yeah, yeah thing, the head banging thing again. I think he feels like he's at two post at the end of this thing. Just my opinion, just what I see. Chase, what do you got? So this this Ozzy thing you're talking about, this head nodding at the end here is something I really want to talk about. So first, we're seeing a repetitive gesture. Second, we're seeing nodding. Third, we're seeing gum chewing, another repetitive gesture. If we go off of what the, the Godfather says, Joe Navarro, repetitive gestures are self-soothing. And... He's experiencing a lot of discomfort during this period of, of silence, and I think unconsciously he's nodding to both self-soothe and to reassure himself that his story is correct and that there's some form of agreement here in the call with him. But I had to call the big guns this morning 
And I wanted to get Joe Navarro's opinion on this. So I sent this video to Joe this morning. And this is from Joe. So, the head nodding is unusual. I suppose one could argue that he is going over in his mind what he just said, and it's almost as though he's in agreement or satisfied with what he just uttered. But that's pure conjecture. One of the things you can look at is the increase in the speed of chewing. If you speed it up, you'll see what I mean. Now, that's not indicative of deception, but it is indicative of trying to relieve the stress that follows what he just said. And I think it couldn't have been said better than uh, than Joe said it. And that's all I got. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, lovely. Um Okay, I, what I see is his hands leaving frame or almost leaving frame, which is a bigger gesture than we've norm normally seen him do. Uh, the cop next to him now, I think, is is literally revolted by him. There's some uh, nausea going on uh, with him. When his hand comes over, he looks away, he shifts away. Um, the shotgun comes up again. Uh, I think clearly that the journey to the house is important. The shotgun is important. The 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 nodding. I would I would agree. You know whether it means anything. I would agree with Joe <laughs> that, that there's uh, a self soothe and uh, a self soothe around. Is my story working? Is this good for me? Is this going to work out right yeah. for me? Because I think he's got an officer next to him who he can see is revolted. We see uh, the perpetrator here, or potential perpetrator, uh, um, uh, show disgust when they look over and see the, the officer revolted. So they know it's going badly for them uh, at this point. Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. Uh, when she asked him the way about his son, the way his son's uh, laying, Again, like Greg was saying, no emotion. He still hasn't teared up and still not using that Kleenex. And then after the second questions, question, there's so much space before anybody says anything, that's when he starts talking and starts using or adding qualifiers and trying to tighten the story up, trying to, trying to make it sound more believable and make it sound stronger. And then when she asked him which way it came in, his illustrators get huge. This is the biggest he's used so far. The other ones were, were okay, but he hasn't used a lot of illustrations, but they get really big, maybe because he's thinking about her back there, and that's why he's doing that, to, to illustrate for her. But they've been extremely limited up to this point. His, his voice volume is more relaxed. It gets quieter. He looks and sounds more relaxed because I think he feels like everything's going well because he, he's under the impression those officers believe him. And that guy sitting next to him, that police officer sitting next to him, he starts pushing on his mouth, he's goofing around with his lip, and he's uncomfortable. So he knows this isn't right. He knows something's not right about this, but he's playing it as cool as he can possibly do it. But his body, his body language tells on him, like Joe Navarro says, you can have a poker face, but you can't have a poker body. And that's what we're seeing there. He's doing all these little things that this guy, if he if he'd know what to look for, like you do now, then he would say, "Whoops, I got to start adding some more qualifiers to my answer." So I I think they know pretty much. And and again, if you'll if you'll keep an eye on that that um, the the woman in the back, that pl that police officer in the back, watch her throughout this. Now that I know this other guy isn't a cop, or I'm under the impression that he isn't. Boy, she just really starts going against this guy. She starts scooching away. I want to look at her from the beginning then to the end to see how far away she scooched away now that we know that. But I think she's uncomfortable uh, with him. Not horribly uncomfortable, but he keeps eyeing her notes and seeing what she's writing down. But he probably believes this guy. You know, he probably believes Alex. So anyway, that's all I got. We good? Yeah. The eyewitness is you. Um, this one's hard. But when you first saw Paul, you said you tried to flip him over. Was he laying on his back or on his stomach? Just like he, he is. Just like he is. So you weren't his... able to move him. Okay. No, oh, ma'am. Okay. And did he help Maggie a lot out here with the animals? He helped everybody with everything. Okay. So it was kind of routine for him to be out here as well in this, the evening? This place is his absolute passion. Okay.
I try to turn him, and then I try to, and then I checked him, and I, I mean, I, I, I think I already knew, but I checked him. <coughs> and when you pulled first pulled into the property, did you come from this direction where all our police cars are, or which way did you come in? I went to the house. Okay. And then I came from the house. This way. Straight here, yes, ma'am. Okay. I mean, where my vehicle was mm -hmm. parked is probably is, is where it was okay m well no maybe not mm -hmm. exactly but it was pretty close because okay. i came back the same route that's right because you went back to get your shotgun when i came okay. back so up to this point mark what do you think we've been seeing yeah, I've never seen anybody so cool in this situation. I think, I don't know where we are in the, in the case right now on this in court, but I I'm going to assume that something is going to come up around the journey to the house. Uh, the shotgun is clearly important within this. Uh, I'm, I'm going to research a little bit more on this extraordinary situation of the high school kid and the uh, Navy SEALs and the uh, Black Panthers. Uh, it's exciting, exciting story. Uh, Chase. <laughs> well, this so far is a video I know for a fact that I'm going to be using for training. And I'm no expert on the case or forensics or any of the facts of the case, but I'm a behavior expert. And I think that we're going to see this play out in court much like it did here in the car with the officers. It's going to be a very similar thing where the tells are going to be very similar. The baseline is going to be very similar. And I think the tells are going to repeat themselves in court. I don't think he's been on the stand yet. I'm not, I don't know much about the case. Greg has given me most of my education about this case, which is very little. Yeah, but it seems like maybe some stress in his life caused some sort of psychotic break of some sort that made this happen. But I don't know. Greg? Yeah, I don't know what's causing it. I don't know any of that. Let me tell you, when we talk about baseline, we're talking about normal at the moment. You need only to watch these videos to see great examples. The one, if you go back, where he says, wonderful, two different ways, is a great indicator of why body language matters. But more importantly, if you listen to everything he says throughout this, you'll hear him with a lot, a lot, a lot of detail about insignificant events and nothing when it matters. When you ask him what he did today, boom, he goes to the phone. He's trying to make a record and prove what he's done. However, if you ask him a question about what's on sale at the Dollar General, guarantee you he knows. He'll give you all the details about that. That is disturbing alone. So too much detail when it doesn't matter, not enough when it does. And massive loud flags, red flags, every flag you can imagine when it comes to why did you come out here today? Did you have a shotgun? Are there guns out here? All those pertinent areas, we see massive shifts in body language. We see that butterflying. We see tapping feet. We see touching face. We see shrinking. You name it. We This is almost like we have a glossary and we're saying, hey, would you do this for us? And he's a trained chimp. Scott, what do you got? What right. did you say I think so this, is a, this is a great example so far of seeing – of not seeing things we're trying to show you what to look for but at the same time this is a great example of the things that we're not seeing that you should be seeing so she, in other words you're looking for things you're not you're not seeing and so we're not seeing the emotion we should be seeing we're not seeing the the proper rocking we should be seeing with the hands ringing and the crying and things those things are missing all right fellas i think this is another good one and we'll see you next time the behavior panel I don't think so. <laughs> Call him first. Jason, what do you got? <laughs> Man, I'm beginning of this clip. <laughs> you sound a little him. bit like him, Chase. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's starting to look like him, too. Ah, oh, that's funny. It's all right, we can wait. Just take your time. I'll edit all of this out. Nobody will ever see this. <laughs> Man, those bars are really dense. It's like chewing a whole bag yeah. of gummy bears. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
We'll wait. Yeah, take time. For anyone watching, I just want you to make note of Scott's condescending eyebrow raise. <laughs> <laughs> Baseline. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. <laughs> Go ahead. Are you ready? Sure, if you're ready. All right. Right here in the beginning of the... <laughs> I'll take it out. <laughs>